everyone, and welcome to the Trade for Sustainable Development Forum. It's great to have you with us. Our latest numbers show that 860 people from across the world have registered for this event. And that's representing business, government, institutions, international organizations, and more. If you're joining us online, we invite you to drop a note in the chat sharing which city you're joining us from. From here in Geneva, my name is Susanna Pak, and I have the great pleasure of being your MC today. The Trade for Sustainable Development, or T4SD Forum, is our annual sustainability event here at the International Trade Center. The theme this year is sustainable trade, the heart of the post-COVID global economy. We have a great program for you. Our panels will paint a picture of how a grassroots effort to make supply chains more environmentally friendly and socially responsible evolved into sustainability standards. And they continue to evolve, helping to create a common language to measure the quality of trade. And now they're serving as a tool for businesses to become more resilient to external shocks, such as COVID-19. We'll learn the role of sustainability standards in trade policy as well, and explore if and how the world's largest free trade area, Africa, will approach sustainable development. And do stay with us throughout the day because we have an award-winning, world-famous chef who will be joining us this afternoon to prepare a dish featuring an ancient West African grain that supports farmers while catering to conscious consumers. So as you follow the conversations, we do encourage you to tweet. Please tag at ITC News and use hashtag T4SD Forum. Now we have the great pleasure to invite our Executive Director of the International Trade Center, Ms. Pamela Coke Hamilton, to the stage to deliver her welcome remarks. Thank you so much, Susanna. Um, it's lovely actually to be here in person. Um, I, I think this is the first time actually seeing people um, <laughs> since I took over. Uh, Friday will be one year, so it's actually quite a lovely feeling. Um, it looks kind of like a classroom and everybody looks suitably six feet apart. So, you know, you can relax a little more and <laughs> <laughs> hopefully we'll get through this and we'll be okay. Um, Your Excellency Andres Valenciano, Minister of Foreign Trade of Costa Rica. Your Excellency Gloria Abraham Peralta, Ambassador Permanent Mission of the Republic of Costa Rica. Your Excellency Sumbu Antas, Ambassador Permanent Mission of the Republic of Vanuatu. Mr. Marcel Vurnish, Minister Plenipotentiary, Deputy Permanent Representative of WTO and Head of Economic and Development Division, WTO. Mr. Henry Puna, Secretary General, Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat. Mr. Jerry Spooner, Director, Vanuatu Department of Tourism. Representatives of permanent missions, partners, speakers, fellow colleagues, and our online participants. Welcome to the ITC Trade for Sustainable Development Forum. This marks the seventh year that ITC has hosted this event, aimed at driving awareness and collaboration around trade and sustainability. Yet I feel like each year, the need for such a forum has only grown. If you're like me, you're probably very overwhelmed by the events of the last year and a half. The COVID pandemic has brought about an unprecedented health and economic crisis. Meanwhile, the threat of climate change and environmental disasters continue unabated. These issues affect everyone, although vulnerable populations and small businesses in developing countries are particularly impacted. I can say this is true for the country I'm from and the region I'm from. This, the tourism sector is decimated, and we all know the fallout from that. In the face of the concurrent pressures, it is easy to resign ourselves to cynicism and pessimism, looking backwards to dwell on what could have been. However, that is not how we will achieve progress. We must learn from the past, both our mistakes and our successes in order to implement solutions to build forward better. As reflected in the theme of this year's forum, we must put sustainability, and for our part, sustainable trade, at the heart of the post-COVID global economy. So how do we do this? How do we learn from the past to chart our way towards a more sustainable future? At the International Trade Center, we're doing our part to improve the sustainability and resilience of MSMEs. This is not only so that they can improve their prospects for selling into new markets, but also so that they can contribute to economic growth, environmental sustainability, and decent working conditions in their domestic context. 
According to the SME Competitiveness Outlook, um, called SMECO here, I mean, I'm still getting used to the various acronyms. You know, there's an acronym for everything, the bathroom, everything else. So I'm just learning the acronym. So SMECO, the SMECO Report 2021, small firms make up roughly 50% of employment and greenhouse gas emissions. Small firms in developing countries are also most vulnerable to the shocks related to the pandemic and climate change. Consequently, supporting their sustainable growth is an approach that lifts all boats. In driving sustainable trade and MSME development, voluntary standards are one of the key tools that have stood the test of time. They apply to many sectors and countries while containing relevant criteria and frameworks for extensive uptake. These standards can address the combined demands of economic resilience and environmental and social sustainability. One could argue that the topic of standards is not the most interesting or compelling. However, they should not be overlooked. Rather, as you will see throughout the forum, they are a key resource in the sustainability arsenal. As a self-professed trade geek, I can assure you these technical details steer the day-to-day -day activities that drive our global economy. Therefore, at ITC, we're quite excited about voluntary standards. And again, bucking conventional wisdom we do not believe they're boring. And I think Joe put that in a second time just to make sure you all realize that it's not boring, okay? <laughs> Quite the opposite, in fact. Back in 2011, with the support of the German and Swiss governments, ITC invested resources in the niche field of certified trade, providing expertise and online tools for MSMEs and other stakeholders to understand voluntary standards. Today, the picture is dramatically different as sustainability in trade has gone from niche to mainstream. Today, we also celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Standards Map Portal, which you just saw, now with information on over 300 standards, codes of conduct, and sustainability frameworks just a few clicks away. Governments are increasingly integrating sustainability standards and requirements into their trade policy such as those in the African continental free trade area, Europe, and in small island nations. Businesses are aligning their strategies with the sustainable development goals and creating pre-competitive consortia to support their suppliers in meeting environmental and social targets. Across the board, we are working with our partners to adapt and improve these measures to meet the pressing needs of small firms. In sum, I will leave you with this thought. In the trade field, the key COVID-inspired lesson is one we must heed. International value chains are more fragile than we thought. These fragilities will only become more exposed as climate change persists. We need to strengthen these value chains and the small businesses that sustain them. We need to make them more resilient and inclusive as we build forward. Sustainability standards in concert with government and private sector initiatives have a role to play. Throughout this forum, we will hear from an extraordinary group of change makers who will discuss these issues, from government officials to CEOs and academics to a great chef, and I'm sorry I won't be here to taste some of whatever he's doing, but will somebody save some for me, um, who's driven by his love for sustainable food. We will also hear a, ser a series of keynote addresses from representatives from the Pacific Island and Caribbean states many of whom are on the front lines of the current climate, health, and economic crisis. With that, I am happy to turn over the floor to His Excellency Andres Valenciano, the Minister of Foreign Trade from Costa Rica, who will deliver an important statement to inaugurate this T4SD forum. Thank you. Greetings, everyone. I would like to thank the International Trade Center for this invitation to share Costa Rica's experience with voluntary sustainability standards and for all the support the ITC has given us as we create more opportunities for our green goods and services to access international markets. As you know, Costa Rica is a small country with great ambition for achieving green growth. Our aim is to boost economic growth through decarbonizing our economy and investing in sustainable use of our natural resources. One of our main challenges in the quest for green growth has been showing that the collective effort to keep high environmental standards and decarbonizing the economy also promote economic welfare. We need to make sure that everyone understands 
this virtuous cycle must be the driver of development moving forward. But this is not only a matter of aspirations, it's also about action. In the late 1990s, Costa Rica became the first country to launch a program of payments for environmental services. Thanks to this financial support, Costa Rica has more than doubled its forest coverage in the last 30 years. Also, in the tourism industry, which is one of Costa Rica's main economic activities in the services sector, it relies heavily on the national system of conservation areas. In order to support sustainable tourism, the Costa Rican Tourism Board created the Certification for Sustainable Tourism, which is a voluntary sustainability certification granted at no cost to the beneficiaries. The certification guarantees that its operations comply with corporate, social, cultural, economic, and environmental standards. And moving towards a trade policy perspective, the, ta the challenge is to create conditions for mutual supportiveness of trade and environmental policies. Our goal is boosting exports of those products and services that meet our high environmental standards, thus contributing to our green growth objectives. At the same time, we also look for setting non-discriminatory and fair conditions for imports of green products and services to our country. In that sense, Voluntary sustainability standards have a great potential to provide information and transparency required for consumers to prefer green goods and increase our competitiveness in global markets. As policymakers, we must set the conditions for boosting those standards that promote fair market access opportunities for small and medium companies and set guidelines to protect consumers from greenwashing. In this sense, Costa Rica's experience identifies three key elements for striking that balance. First, we must align trade and environmental policies and regulations at both domestic and international levels. Second, we need to establish transparent and clear legal and institutional frameworks. And finally, we need to support our producers and services providers to use voluntary sustainability standards as tools to differentiate themselves in the global market. Considering these three elements, we are carrying out successful initiatives in this area that I would like to share. First of all, Costa Rica's Green Growth Platform. This is a program of our trade promotion agency, which was awarded the best initiative for inclusive and sustainable trade by the ITC in 2020. The platform provides seed capital to SMEs to promote environmental certifications and innovation in areas such as energy efficiency, carbon emissions reduction, and waste management. This program already benefits 10% of Costa Rican export sector, and these companies have already improved their productivity, increased their exports up to 30%, and have reduced their CO2 emissions. We're also promoting guidelines um, and product practices for eco-labeling. As part of the negotiation process of our Agreement on Climate Change, Trade and Sustainability, Costa Rica, along with other like-minded countries, are drawing on our experience to jointly develop a principles-based guideline and practical institutional mechanisms to support eco-labeling schemes and prevent greenwashing. I would also like to share our experience with Esencial Costa Rica, which is our national brand crafted to showcase our country's essence at the international level. The country brand includes sustainability, social progress, excellence, and innovation as key values of Costa Rica's DNA. Licensee companies undergo a very strict evaluation protocol to ensure that they uphold the sustainability values promoted by the brand by lowering their ecological footprint and making decarbonization efforts. Finally, from our perspective, trade policy is critical for the green transition, but we must recognize countries face different development challenges and are moving at different speeds. This recognition is vital for us to be able to work together to promote a green recovery from this global crisis and deliver on the Paris Agreement. At Costa Rica, we look forward to working with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Valenciano, for your keynote address. Now we welcome a message from Mr. Henry Puna, Secretary General of the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat in Fiji.
His Excellency Andres Valenciano, Minister of Foreign Trade, Costa Rica. Ms. Pamela Koch Hamilton, Executive Director of the International Trade Center. Mr. Jerry Spooner, Director, Department of Tourism, Vanuatu. Ladies and gentlemen, Kiorana Bulavinaka and warm Pacific greetings from Fiji. It is a great pleasure and privilege to join you in offering a few remarks for the 2021 Trade for Sustainable Development Forum. The theme of this year's forum sparks an important discussion on how sustainable trade will contribute to and support our post-COVID-19 world. For the Pacific, regional cooperation, coordination and integration through trade has always been vital to how we address and resolve our economic and broader development challenges. This has only become more significant with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, intensifying our enduring risks like climate change and natural disasters. In 2019, our Pacific leaders endorsed the development of a long-term vision for our region. The 2050 strategy, currently being framed through wide stakeholder engagement, is premised on the important role of sustainable trade in the thematic cluster of resources and economic development. Our collective ambition in this space is that by 2050, our region will achieve a model of development that balances sustainability, investment and trade across our region. Since this decision, the global COVID-19 pandemic has had deep and significant economic impacts in our Pacific with regard to international and regional trade. In this context, discussions around the sustainability of trade is an issue that must be addressed and considered as a means to achieve the sustainable development goals within the Pacific region and our collective ambitions under the 2050 strategy. One of the most traded products from our region are our fisheries products. As we rebuild and recover our economies from the devastating impacts of COVID-19, our vast ocean and its resources hold the solutions. Sustainable use of our oceans will contribute to sustainable trade. And I'm proud to say that our ocean with our sustainable management practices is the only ocean in the world with sustainable tuna stocks. Quality infrastructure, a key priority under our Pacific Aid for Trade strategy, are vital for the effective operation of domestic markets through the harmonization and mutual recognition of standards, technical regulations, and conformity assessment procedures. This in turn enhances the competitiveness of enterprises and when internationally recognized, enables access to foreign markets through sustainable trade. By establishing a regional framework for standards, measurement and conformity assessment, the Pacific will gain an entire spectrum of measures that will contribute to mitigating the impact of COVID-19 and supporting recovery. Some examples for these measures include, one, the development and application of standards for the management, security, and resilience of companies to ensure business continuity and recovery. Two, access to conformity assessment, ensuring the reliability of medical equipment through quality control, product testing, certification, and inspection. And three, the certification of adherence to COVID-19 related standards for Pacific businesses and products, thus creating the conditions to stimulate demand for crucial sectors like tourism. Establishing a proper quality infrastructure mechanism in line with international guidelines and best practices improves the readiness of an economy to trade as well as respond and recover from health crises and other shocks. Looking ahead, 
voluntary sustainability standards on products and processes signals the global shift towards cleaner, sustainable production and trade. This is a welcome step. However, the future competitiveness of Pacific businesses will depend on their ability to greed their exports and meet these voluntary sustainability standards demanded by their target markets. The Blue Pacific calls for the greening of aid for trade support. We also call on international partners such as the International Trade Center and the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development to intensify their capacity building assistance towards developing countries, including small island developing states. Our cooperation continues to grow. And I thank the ITC for your ongoing partnership. I look forward to your support for the Pacific Aid for Trade strategy and further trade liberalization by supporting businesses, particularly our Pacific micro, small and medium enterprises, MSMEs, to adopt and strengthen sustainable trade practices. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for the invitation and wish you well in your deliberations today. Metagimata, Vinaka Vakalevu, and thank you very much. And thank you to the Secretary General for that message. We'll now hear a message from Mr. Jerry Spooner, who is the Director of the Vanuatu Department of Tourism. Greetings to you all from Vanuatu. A big thank you to the organizing uh, team for involving us in this forum. And also, it is very encouraging to note that our efforts have been recognized and we do hope whatever we share with you today will be useful. So, voluntary sustainability standards its contribution to sustainability for climate vulnerable states. Challenges for Vanuatu in terms of our journey towards COVID recovery and sustainable uh, development. It's important to note that Vanuatu is listed as the seventh most dependent country in the world, uh, rated first on the World Risk Index, and that is due to our uh, high frequency of natural disasters. Having said that, though we are a vulnerable nation, we are also a resilient one, and COVID-19 has just uh, proven that our resilience is directly linked to uh, having access to our customary land, our communities and our traditional economy. Uh, also important to note too that a study conducted earlier this year uh, by the Massey University in uh, New Zealand has showed that while tourism dependent people in the Pacific were uh, financially impacted by COVID-19, the social, mental, cultural and physical well-being showed improvements. So that's, that's very interesting. So as far as our journey towards COVID-19 recovery and sustainable development is concerned, uh, for Vanuatu we are looking at not just recovery, but building back better and stronger. And that is key. And it's important that government has to drive this and support it. Hence, for Vanuatu we have uh, our sector-specific policy being the uh, tenure policy for, our, uh, for tourism. That is our sustainable tourism policy. And in order for us to implement it uh, successfully, uh, more effectively, we have a five-year sustainable tourism strategy. And within that, key programs that uh, to support uh, us in the um, implementation of our strategy, uh, properly designed, resourced, and supported. Huh? Well, in terms of actions, and what Vanuatu has, has done, uh, to move towards a uh, uh, higher value, low impact, diversified tourism model. Uh, first, we have developed our two key programs, that being our sustainable tourism program and our agritourism program. Our agritourism program for Vanuatu is mostly uh, referred to as our productive tourism program. Both the programs are used as a sustainable management and behavior behavioral change strategy to create and uh, enable more meaningful experiences for both our communities and our visitors. 
And after developing the two programs, we have uh, now, or we are now in the stages of uh, finalizing our sustainable uh, tourism and our agritourism voluntary standards. That is key. And ensuring also that it is context fitting, suited for our country. That, that's the only way in order for, for it to work. The idea of regional standards is okay. That can be used as a benchmark. Yeah? And any, any message for uh, the global trade and development community going forward is um, it's obvious that the world is never going to go back to uh, and pick up from where 2019 has left us. We need social change in order for us to create market change and for Vanuatu, we need market change that will support well-being. It wasn't the case before 20, uh, uh, COVID-19, rather. Therefore, in order for businesses to uh, diversify their business models, uh, industry needs support that will directly assist them meet the voluntary sustainable uh, sustainability standards. So we have our tourism business support program being the incentives program to encourage uh, industry to take on that pathway. So in incentives is key in order for those uh, voluntary standards to, to work. So remembering to, remembering to lastly, uh, to build back better, it needs to be driven by the needs of the destination uh, communities. Uh, in Vanuatu, communities are now being more involved uh, in the planning process and not like previously where it has always been about the visitors and businesses. We are now working with the Planet Happiness Index to measure the well-being of our communities. communities. Communities are now involved and they must always be going forward. This is Vanuatu's new approach to ensure the industry is more sustainable going forward. Thank you. Our thanks to the director for his message. Now we will head into our first panel, looking at how standards came to be and how they help businesses and consumers make choices that benefit both people and the environment. The session is called a kickoff dialogue on sustainability standards in retrospect, introspect, and prospect. This will be moderated by our very own Natalie Domeisen, head of corporate events and publishing here at ITC. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Susanna. A very warm welcome. We have here with us in the audience and online, as you know, ministers, businesses, government, and international experts to explore the role that standards like Rainforest Alliance and Fair Trade play in making our societies healthier, safer, and more inclusive. I'm joined here by Joe Wozniak, the head of the International <coughs> Trade Center's Trade for Sustainable Development Program, and Gabriela Alfares, co-founder of No Name Chocolate, a Colombian cooperative that supplies Starbucks, Ferrero, Nestle, and other major brands. And on the screen is Vera Thornstenson, who is joining us very, very early from Brazil. And she's an economics professor at the Getulio Vargas Foundation and the head of the Global Center for Trade and Investments in Brazil. There she is online. Good morning. Now, what unites all of us? I think it's that we support good trade. Trade where we grow, make, sell, and buy in a way that puts small businesses, smallholder farmers, average people at the heart of a post-pandemic recovery. 
that lowers carbon emissions, that allows farmers to protect the soil, that respects women, and enables children to go to school instead of work. In a nutshell, in a nutshell we care about sustainable trade, that triple trio that protects people, profit, and planet. And make no mistake, the standards that we talk about today are helping consumers to make good choices. They've clearly had success. We've had a few in the 1980s, and we have over 400 major standards today. We have multinationals who are using them with global supply chains, so third-party standards, as well as their own. We have investors increasingly turning to them. And we have governments who are now starting to use them to shape trade and investment and business practices. But for businesses to do the right thing, it's not easy. They face extra costs, they face audit fatigue, and they face competition from those who look primarily at profit. And that was true before the pandemic. Now we have audits suddenly conducted online. We have companies that have shifted their supply chains rapidly, and small businesses and smallholder farmers, farmers who are scrambling and struggling to cope. So where do we go in all of this? Who is responsible for what? And how far do standards go in addressing these challenges? To help us get clarity on these issues, we're going to turn first to Joe. Uh, we are proud to launch this publication. Those of you in the room will see it on your desk, and those of you online will find it throughout the day and onwards. It will be online this afternoon. It's called Sustainability Standards, a new deal to build forward better. We've had a whole team behind producing this, and it also features interviews with people um, around the world, some of whom are here in the room today. So, Joe, tell us your takeaways from this book, um, how the standards have evolved, where they're going. Well, thanks very much, Natalie, and good morning, everyone uh, here in ITC Geneva and also online. It's good to see some familiar faces in the room today and uh, happy to, uh, to be with you and also to kind of share some of our experiences uh, and reflections over these last 10 years uh, of T4SD that are, I would say, kind of um, crystallized in this report that, that Natalie uh, mentioned. So I would say one of the, one of the benefits of, of being in this program since the beginning is also we've had kind of a 35,000 view, foot view level of the entire kind of standards movement, right? So this includes obviously the upstream SME beneficiaries that we work with intensively at ITC, but also the downstream brands, the retailers, and indeed and even consumers, and all the different interactors or the, the actors in between, whether that's NGOs, the standard organizations themselves, governments, uh, and, and policymakers. And so from this very, very uh, rich, cross-sectoral viewpoint, we can really gain a lot of, let's say, understanding and, and un of what, what's happened in the last decade. And so I would say the, the main takeaways that we see from, from and, and what are also reported in this, in this book that we just published today, is really how these standards from the beginning, maybe 10, 12 years ago, while they were obviously quite, uh, quite known from, from a consumer perspective, they obviously were very niche, uh, and they weren't really, let's say, mainstreamed. Now, from, from a decade later, we see that major supply chains, companies have even developed their own codes of conduct, moving beyond, let's say, just the private on-label initiatives. But more and more, we see that the regulatory or the policy aspect has come into play. And I think this is echoed also from the comments earlier this morning from Minister Valenciano, where governments are now understanding the urgencies related to sustainability, environmental and social, and they are leveraging the knowledge that has been developed over the past decade and more when it comes to these types of standards, codes of conduct, and different approaches. So the, the interesting thing is that these standards, while they're not perfect and they're not a silver bullet or a panacea by any means for all of our developmental challenges, they do provide a very good roadmap, they provide a good context, they provide excellent criteria, both environmental, social, labor, quality, economic, and they provide a 
framework or context for implementation. And that is something, that body of knowledge, that experience, I think should not be underestimated or undervalued. Uh, and it can be leveraged then in the policy context, both from a national perspective, but also from a multilateral perspective. And so we see now due diligence and uh, legislation emerging in the European Union. We see other countries that are now trying to implement either national standards, such as uh, the Costa Ricans ha have, have discussed. And this is also in other countries beyond Costa Rica. So I think the, so that's one of the, I would say, takeaways. The other takeaway is this movement toward more harmonization or convergence. And these are kind of buzzwords, but they're important because when we start to look at how the regulatory environment is moving, we want to make sure that there is a way that we can drive more coherence uh, with these types of initiatives. So I think that you'll, you will be seeing as a trend. Uh, more of this, let's say, uh, benchmarking or alignment to uh, to standards and codes of conduct and, and, and what is in guidelines, if you will, and also following international frameworks such as the OECDs. And then last but not least, I would say there's a trend really on the finance side. So environmental and social governments, governance, in, in the sense that financial intermediaries, banks, trade finance, project finance, these, these individuals are using standards to, if you will, regulate upstream the type of investments that they are going to make. And this will obviously have an impact down the road in terms of where funds are allocated for private projects. So I think these are, I mean, I could go on, but I think these are some of the, let's say, takeaways that we have found uh, that will be shaping uh, the next several years. And obviously COVID is, is really the, 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 the center piece here in terms of where we will go in this, let's say, inflection point in our, in our current times. And I think COVID will also play a role in terms of technology, in terms of the way that these standards will be implemented in the future, given the fact that we've re relied on virtual means of, of communication and, and work for the past 18 months. That will surely have an impact, I think, going forward on the overall standards landscape. But in the interest of time, I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. Um, so if I catch you correctly, you're seeing standards becoming a centerpiece of trade as we move from niche to mainstream uh, to address a lot of the very biggest issues that we have out there in society today, that it's a really different landscape from 10 years ago. And I remember our first Trade for Sustainable Development Forum where so many people were talking about the proliferation of standards and they've kept growing, but now we're not really talking about that anymore. We're talking about alignment, and different ways of collaboration. And that's what we're seeing as we move into the government and the finance spheres, I think. Exactly, I mean, they're, they're, obviously there's still a lot of the stand, I mean, they're all, they're there, they're out there, right? So the proliferation has not necessarily ended. I mean, I think if you, in the report there's a, there's a chart where it shows it, it's a bit, I would say it's plateauing in terms of the growth mm -hmm. of new standards. And I think my own personal view is that with this new legislation coming down the road, there will be more of a need uh, you know, for some type of, of uh, consolidation or a, a bit of a, an alignment of these standards. Because in the past, when the, you did not have these regulatory uh, developments or, or these regulatory type frameworks, there was no legal, legal, legally binding or policy type imperative, right? So that, that level of kind of private market could, could be allowed to, to, to move. I think here, with, with this new trends showing, there will be, uh, from, from all the actors, whether it's the governments, whether it's the brands and retailers, there will be a pressure to, uh, to, to move toward more uh, convergence or consolidation. And also, from the, from the perspective of the SMEs that have to implement these, because uh, there, there, there will be, need to be accompanying measures to assist on a, on a gradual basis for adoption by these, exactly. these, uh, these marginalized producers. Exactly. As is, well, we'll hear about that throughout the day. Um, I'm going to turn, thank you again, Joe. I'm going to turn to Vera now uh, in Brazil. And I think we're going to keep the, the big view for the moment. Um, Vera, tell us about the multilateral context You've said that WTO is the house of trade and that sustainability standards should be addressed there. So where do you see us on this? Is that happening? Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. It is five o'clock in the morning, but uh, come on, you, you know how many, how, how I missed uh, to be in Geneva. Now, uh, it's true. Uh, I, I worked for so many years in, in, in WTO and I'm still working with it. Look, uh, when you have to talk, when you talk about, when we start talking about VSS in 
2005. And at that, at that time, you have problems with what is a government measure, what is a, a private measure. And so this evolved. And now VSS had a, a, a big success. And now you have to manage uh, this, the, to govern this kind of big success. Now, if you go to the VSS look, being uh, voluntary sustainability standards. The VSS, the voluntary standard. Look, uh, if you go now to the WHO and look to the, 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 the data, big database they made on environment, you are going to discover that in the WHO, in the house of the norms, the rules of the, the, the trade, you are going to find 13,000 13, measures related to environment. As you know, there is no agreement. Lot. Yes, look, they start to collect all these measures. They are related to trade and environment, but they could, in some sense, to categorize them. So you have TBT, that is technical barriers to trade, SPS, the sanitary food sanitary, you have subsidies. They uh, try to categorize them in the specific instruments of trade regulated by WTO. And now what Joe is saying that uh, VSS are really uh, uh, improving, you have around 300 standards, use it, recognize it around the world, and my big point is how is how you are going to, to, to manage this kind of government related standards for environment and uh, private related standards uh, for trade. And the next point is how you are going to uh, uh, manage the conflict when the conflict dispute starts because a country is using a VSS that is a private standard, but is discriminating trade. How you are going to solve this, this conflict? Remember, there is no agreement on environment inside the WTO under the House of Trade. And the question will be, and who is going to solve the conflict? So this, I think, is the next, next step for the ITC, because uh, you have to organize yourselves being a private standard to see how you're going to, it's okay, it's a code of conduct, due diligence, everything is nice and important. And without this, you are going to lose your credibility. So the point is how you are going to manage the measures that came from government and the measures related to trade and environment that came from private sector. This I think for me is a big challenge, but I have to confess that at the beginning I was quite skeptical about VSS, and I now I have to recognize that you you really uh, did a big a big uh, a big uh, uh, task, and you are quite successful, right? Okay, thank, thank you, very, you much. very much. So that you're clearly saying there's a big big road ahead of us in terms of harmonizing a lot of things that are out there in the world of trade, and I think we could maybe hear a bit from Gabriela from the producer's perspective. Uh, how do you see all of this coming together? You've said that standards have the right intentions, that they've moved the needle. Is it enough what we've seen and knowing, what, hearing where we're at today and where we're going? Thank you very much. Is it working? Yes. As a way of mini introduction, so I'm Gabriela, I'm from Argentina. Um, and I'm in the sustainability world for many years. <laughs> but 10 years ago, about, I jumped as an entrepreneur in Colombia um, to see if we could make real and on the ground and how it works. So um, working in cocoa and in coffee. And then as we were trying to work with, uh, with farmers on creating uh, supply chains that would create prosperity, we said we also need to become a farmer, so we started a farm. So now I'm a farmer, <laughs> and I'm also a trader, and I also work here. So that's the perspective where I come, I guess. And what would I say? I'd say first the recognition in this world of what... Um, of what voluntary standards have done. They have moved the needle. And where it's really relevant is the awareness. I don't think 20 years ago people were talking about this. And just that they are there and that this started the conversation and there's poverty on the, what's like, I don't know if you remember that campaign, but it's what's inside your coffee. And there was this thing about like poverty is behind your coffee and this is what's happening and this is what's doing with, to the planet. 
that awareness and that bringing the reality to consumers and bringing a means to do something was hugely, hugely important. I'm not sure we realize now how much a difference that made. Mm -hmm. But now on the second part, is that enough? <laughs> is that, did that change a lot of things? And that's the frustration. We still have, in Colombia, 37%, and this was before COVID, 37% under the poverty line. That is unacceptable. We should not be creating value to the planet uh, through poverty. I mean, that's like we just, that cannot be. Um, uh, on the environment, we have in our farm, um, we did a soil analysis. We could not find a single worm. A worm is a big thing for the soil. <laughs> We've done all the practices as they should have done. We are eating our natural capital. Our soil is 40%, 50% depleted by doing all the things we should have been doing. Um, so we are eating our capital uh, right now. Um, so uh, risk, risk is this thing that we don't have it. It's kind of somewhere it got lost, but uh, the gentleman from Vanuatu was talking. It's like a flood, a drought, that makes the world between uh, sending my kids to school and eating <laughs> or not. Mm -hmm. So if someone is an incentive of 5%, it's great, nice, thank you. If I have no crop, that 5% goes nowhere. Um, if the price next year is 40% lower, 5% is still nice, but it's not enough. So I think rethinking a bit more radical where we want to be. And then what are the instruments? And uh, I know we'll be talking a bit more about how, but the big thing now is, yes, there are the right intentions. A lot of things are happening. I very much welcome how the governments are starting to get involved on the consuming countries. I think there's a lot to do as well on the producing countries. Um, the civil society as a force of nature is huge and all the social media, there's a lot more we can do with that. So I know we'll be talking about that in a bit, um, so. Yes, um, so you've been saying maybe things need to change and standards are helping, but it's not enough. That producers are maybe just as poor as they were 10 years ago. Yeah. And you've also talked to me before we met about, you said you have five or six standards uh, that you're complying with. How much of your budget is that? A lot, <laughs> a lot. We have a lot of full-time people running around doing the pre-audits, the pre-pre-pre-audits, the mini-pre sort of uh, audit, um, and then doing the pre-pre for the other one and the other one. So, um, so that is a, that's a huge transaction cost. Technology can help us. I think there's a lot of things we can do in just thinking what we want to do and how do we verify, but that the funds the resources, go to what we want to do, know how we check it. There's a lot more things we can do on that. Yes, you've talked to me beforehand about changing that mentality where everything is about measuring. You said maybe blockchain. Do you see blockchain in considering the yes. digital gaps sometimes? Do you see that being a solution for everyone that will make things easier? It's not blockchain as uh, everyone like, oh, now we're all blockchain, so it's <laughs> great. Garbage in, garbage out with blockchain as with many things. So, but it is an instrument that just spreads the information uh, and everyone can have access to it and, and verify it. And that is relevant. So again, uh, satellite imaging for reforestation. Mm -hmm. We don't need to send 20 people counting trees. We can do it from the sky. There's a lot of things that we can think about how we save cost. How do we change the system, the business model system that was created and was very useful, but now we need a different one. And you've also mentioned that standards, you've, you mentioned a report, standards work best when the enabling condition, conditions are there, like education, like having a decent income already. How do you, so how do you see standards working in your environment considering all this of that? This was an ITC research <laughs> some time ago about when and where do standards work best. And what we found out, I don't remember the exact percentage, but they work best when there's basic education, when there's basic infrastructure, when standards do the role that uh, private sector can do. Um, so you do need, they seem to be working best when people had literacy, when people had schooling, when people had the basic infrastructure. So the context conditions are so key. Um, and so we may end up certifying 
producers that are already uh, good, but like someone said, where's the, the bottom 20% that create 80% of the issues and where the context conditions are not there? And that's what we need to move. How do we ad adapt things to move that? And that's where the role of public sector, of government, of regulation, of public sector in, in, in developing countries plays a huge role and where a lot of us as civil society, we can play a much more pressuring role um, we can have a bigger voice in making those things move and make accountable uh, what needs to happen for the, for the private sector, for the rural world to actually make the, the jump. And I think this sensitization is slowly happening that we need to have more attention at the base of the pyramid. The question is whether we're going to get there quickly enough. Um, I'm looking to see, do we have questions coming in from the audience? Or in the meantime, perhaps we could have some reactions from our panelists? So, I mean, sure. I, think, I think in terms of what, what Gabby was saying, I mean, it's important that, uh, and this is also goes into this, this regulatory or this new policy, let's say, context, because indeed, you know, when we, we look at uh, emerging due diligence requirements in, in Europe and other countries, uh, those will be targeting obviously those SMEs that are already that are already exporting, right? And, and it will be even a struggle for them to probably start to up their game when it comes to these regulations. But how do we then engage the real upstream, uh, marginalized, micro and small and medium-sized enterprises? That I think is is where the 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 gap or the bottleneck has been for for many years. And I think that if we if governments start to develop their own national context or national policies and frameworks for environmental and social sustainability or development, then that will eventually start to work to, to change the context in those countries. Because I think the idea here is that, and I think the standards have been very uh, helpful as well as a market access uh, tool, as a mechanism. And we see, we've seen that from our own ITC work in the field where there's a lot of demand for compliance to these voluntary initiatives because buyers are demanding it. And it's a way that, that these producers can become, uh, let's say, more competitive on these markets, but for those that are that are locked out of that, uh, that 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 trade relationship, where do they go, right? And it's not just about market access; it's also about the environmental sustainability of the country, of the context, moving as well uh, to improving the conditions. And so, looking at it, it's it's to be looked at as kind of a two sides of the same coin. You have the market access potential, but also if you're implementing these types of policies, you're improving the environmental sustainability of your of your country of your of your national uh, environment and that's important uh, and and I think these policies when we start to work with these countries such as Costa Rica such as the Pacific Island nations that that are in, that are implementing these types of domestic standards whether it's for key sectors like fisheries or tourism it helps to bring a national, uh, raise the national conscience of, about this. And that also plays into down the road more, uh, more let's say, integration regionally. And so this afternoon we'll, uh, we'll be hearing about that uh, in terms of how, how this can play a role, for example, even in an African context or other contexts from a regional perspective. So I think th this, is, this is, again, the, 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 uh, the evolution or, let's say, the development of how these standards kind of be before a bit, a bit disparate, but also raising consumer context uh, and, and consumer conscience have really evolved into more of a uh, national or international framework for moving the needle forward on sustainable development. Indeed, going back to that question of collaboration and putting together an yeah. awful lot of disparate um, pieces against, uh, I would say, a ticking clock of environmental and social issues. One of the things I thought that was interesting this morning that we heard from Costa Rica um, was that by investing in a green growth platform, some of their companies are seeing um, growth of 30%. So it can be done even for small exporters. Uh, and we do need a government uh, business uh, working hand in hand to make that happen. Um, I have not seen the questions come in yet. There might be a technical glitch. So I would just like to turn back to Gabriella just for a second. And you've done some thinking about what you think would help most. You've talked about changing audit compliance to checking uh, as you go. Thank you. Um, from 
checking all the, all the compliance things to checking as you go. You've talked about blockchain. You've talked about satellite imagery. What else would you say? Um, is it about mindsets, risk management? If you had to pick another one, what would you say? Moonshot. Pardon? Moonshot. Moonshot. <laughs> what is moonshot? <laughs> you know, moonshot goal, uh, whatever. Kennedy, in the, some time ago, uh, said we're going to go to the moon. Still don't know how. And I'm seeing in the corporate sector a lot of uh, the net zero uh, goals. And we are going to be there. Uh, we still don't know how, but by 2030, we'll be zero. And I'm saying uh, sustainable development goals type, we need to eliminate uh, rural poverty. If we create value for the planet, we should not have rural poverty. Boom. Now, how do we figure that out? So there's a lot of things that we need to do, but the business model, I mean, if you think about even for those in finance, the discount rate, we believe the future is less, <laughs> less valuable than the present. Um, we believe that the farmer needs to create value by promoting biodiversity, but at his cost or her cost. Um, we don't have what we would call true value, uh, true cost and over time. So how do we think different and recreate in a way the, the arrangements? We have the power balances in the chain. They're obviously tilted to the few buyers in, and not the many farmers. But that does not help us in 20 years. We need a recruiting wage. What we call, some, who's going to uh, farm the land in 20 years? We need, uh, we need to, the true value of the planet and the true cost to be integrated. So a lot of things that I think can be done, and what I'm very excited about is there seems there's a community and voluntary standards that have gotten us very far into this. They have a huge role to play. These organizations that, that can see, that are in touch, but we need to, to, to evolve. Is we there do. more pre-competitive? Is becoming governments, civil society, but not incremental. We need to look at where we want to get and then think back. What are the things we're doing? What are the things that are missing? How do we make it cheaper? How do we de-risk uh, this? How do we prepare for another COVID? Unfortunately, this may be on the cards. Right. How do we prepare for the future? So, And if we that's... have... Challenges I, due to the pandemic. Can I now. jump in? Can I jump I in? was just going to say yes, Vera, because we have questions from the audience for you as well uh, that have just look, come in. Let me introduce, let me introduce another important point. <laughs> I'm working hard on another issue related to VSS that are the, the, the standards that, uh, that are being put on the table by the corporate governance, the ESG uh, objectives. Look, and this is a big issue for Joe to study in ITC. Environmental, ITC's. social, and governance. That's These it. are the three letters I've heard most from the panelists in preparing yes, for the session. It. It's flooding. You, 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 you open the newspapers, everybody now is green, is perfect, and there is a lot of greenwashing. There's a lot of denunciation already that this is a marketing issue. It's not real. My question to Joe is, look, how ITC is go, going to put order in this scenario? What are the objectives of VSS? Uh -huh. And what the, the taxonomy? Come on, the European Union is putting a taxonomy for, e, for, for uh, corporate governance. How you are going to put this co coherence on these two issues? I, I think that this is a big point for ITC to study because people are becoming to are becoming to be completely confused what kind of standards they are going to use uh, to talk about <coughs> corporate responsibility or following the standards and rules for um, uh, VSS. Okay. Now, coherence, convergence. Joe, this is for you. <laughs> Thanks, thanks, Vera. Look, in the interest, because I know that we have some, some questions from participants online, I will answer your question, I promise. Uh, we have, I'm looking at the timer right here. We have about 12 minutes left. So I do want to make sure that the audience, their questions uh, are, are, are raised, yes. at least heard. So uh, I'll turn this over to Natalie, and then I will for sure, Vera, answer your question before we end. But, but uh, in the interest of our, of our, uh, our audience, we'll, we'll, we'll go for, the, uh, for those questions first. 
So we know we have lots of questions for Joe. Um, we have a question from Funke Bolujoko in Nigeria. He said, we've seen herbal, herbal infusion production SME, want to obtain fair trade. How do we go about it? I hope someone's going to help him. And uh, we have a question from Francesca Nunez, who wants to know about blockchains. Um, could they somehow replace sustainability standards at lower cost? Um, we have questions to Joe and Vera on how could due diligence boost, boost trade practically. Um, let's see. We have, we had someone who wanted to know um, the interlinkage, more about the interlinkage between WTO and IT um, and VSS. Let me see where that is. Um, more questions for Joe. How do ITC and other groups uh, take uh, steps to ensure things don't get lost as these VSSs are very complex? Um, and we have some questions regarding the um, European Commission, but I think we'll take those a little bit later in the day. Um, and here's the question from Rogerio de Oliveira Correa to Joe and Vera. How due diligence could boost trade practically in the context of trade agreements, which we're also going to hear about today? Okay, wow. So a lot of questions, I'll, I'll, sorry. I'll, yeah, I'll try, to, I'll try to take these on kind of in, in, holistically in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in one go. Um, so, in, I mean, in terms of Vera's first question, in terms of ITC, what we're doing, uh, first I can say it's not, I mean, ITC, we're contributing where, where we can and, and where our comparative advantage lies. And so one of the biggest areas, obviously, is with our standards map website uh, and database, which we're launching 4.0 today. So there, I mean, we have over 300 standards now, and I think the, the work that we've done over the past decade uh, on the tool has provided a, a level of transparency that was just not available before. So uh, it is a lot of data. It's 1,600 data points, which is super, super complex, I know. But those users uh, and, and the new tool that we're launching today is simplified in the sense that we're providing more guidance to users. So it isn't as, let's say, um, uh, what's the word? It, it, it's not as, uh, let's say, uh, inhibiting as it was before. Uh, and so, what, what, what the idea is that when you look at when you look at the data, you can see the different criteria. When those criteria are required, uh, what are the governance mechanisms of standards to to get really into a very fine level of detail? And we were having a conversation on this detail a few weeks ago with some some of our our partners, and, and even a criteria like safety at work. Uh, the, the, uh, you know, the, the, the criteria covers different, different uh, points about safety at work in a factory, whether it's uh, fire extinguishers, whether it's safety, uh, safety kits, whether it's uh, different types of, of, of signs on doors. The, 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 the database gets to a granular level of detail where you, where you actually enumerate the different types of, of attributes of each criteria. So it allows users to really tease out what is a credible or, or let's say, non-credible standard from their perspective. So I think we do our, our role very well in that, in that sense. But there are other players that have to you know, take on the role as well. Now, what, what does that mean? Well, in terms of the trade aspect, due diligence, for sure I think it has the potential to, if you will, increase the level of sustainable trade that's, 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 that's coming from developing countries and by that, by that uh, mechanism, improving environmental and social practices in developing countries in, the, in emerging markets. But that will have to come with accompanying measures. So technical assistance provided by different ITC programs and other, and other programs uh, across the board to, to raise all those boats, as we say. Yep. Joe, I, my question yep. is actually to Vera. Um, is what you're outlining in her mind, is that enough? I mean, we have to, okay, so we have to, we have to start Vera, taking... Vera, please interrupt me if I haven't come. Yeah, but I mean, properly. we need to start taking steps mm -hmm. somewhere, right? And I think that, you know, in terms of this, this due diligence legislation, it's not yet active, it's not yet, you know, in, in force, but we have time to prepare. Uh, and I think, Vera, you know, I'd love to hear your, your views on this as well in terms of where, because you, you mentioned the WTO, and so we have a panel tomorrow at the public forum at 3 p.m. Uh, Geneva time where these, these discussions actually, or, or these, these types of topics will also be, uh, be discussed, right? So I do think that the WTO has a role, but I do think also in terms of the greenwashing question, it's important that we look toward aligning these private initiatives, these standards, with international guidelines and frameworks, whether they be those from the OECD or others. So we start to bring more, let's say, coherency and consistency 
of what we're talking about. So we allow for a, a kind of a private market, if you will, where there is diversity, which reflects different stakeholders' views or the, the perspectives or the hotspots, depending on the sector or the country of, of production or processing. But we all follow, if you will, a larger, more, um, more aligned way of looking at these. And that, I think, would, would reduce the, 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 um, the, the greenwashing effect. And also, when you bring this into a more public uh, or regulatory type framework, where there are, uh, there are uh, consequences, civil consequences, if you will, from, from the, the legislation point of view for noncompliance, the, ten the temptation to greenwash, I think, will, will also be reduced down the road. Uh, Vera, comments? Perfect, Joe. I think you are, uh, you are right. Uh, uh, but again, all these conflicts, and this is going to create big, big, uh, big issues. The, 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 the volume of, uh, of exports involved can be great. And certainly, this is going to end in a, in a kind of panel. As you know, the WHO is in crisis. There is no panel at all. There's a panel and a secondary kind of uh, arbitration on resolution on it. But the question is, uh, come on, business wants to solve this conflict quite, uh, quite rapidly. And the, the big question is, who is going to do to do this? At, the, at this point, I think it's a good uh, one for the people that uh, loves to, to work with VSS to, to do. How can you solve this? Can you create a kind of arbitration quite very, very uh, expeditious, very uh, efficient to solve this issue? Because look, I, I, I told you, uh, the European Union is creating a taxonomy for ESGs and they are going to conflict with VSS. And this is the government. So this is the, can be uh, discussed inside the WHO. You are going to live in a very complicated uh, world for people. And, and the most important thing is, okay, let's be green. Let's do things in a green way, but and not to, to spend too much time and money uh, solving this kind of conflict. So I think that the, the society and the, the, the private sectors, they have a big, big, big role to play and that they can to solve this. Who is going to take, who is going, who is taking care of the, the coherence of these uh, instruments, right? Uh, ISO, any kind, who is going to establish the standards for the standards? This, this things helps, right? Uh, don't go to the WHO because this takes too much time to solve the conflict. No. And what's important is to, no, to export and be clean. Yeah, just, just maybe one final point on that coherence that Vera mentioned, which is very key, is that, and this is a, another role that, that obviously we can play uh, at the ITC, is, and we are, we are engaging in this, is this, and it's very, I mean, it sounds a bit wonky and, and, and very technical in terms of the, the term benchmarking or alignment uh, assessment. So we are actually working, uh, and we, we, we hope to work with the European Commission as well, to leverage the, the power of the database uh, to make that alignment between, and to, and to move that, that convergence needle forward between these voluntary or private measures and those the, and the upcoming legislation uh, that will be uh, handed down by the by the EC, as well as the, on the other side, the OECD guidelines. So we have a, a neutral role to play uh, as a, as a, as an organization, ITC, and I think that will that's part of our fundamental strategy going forward. So putting putting this kind of coherence. Uh, framework in place. That will be something that we will be working on. So, but I don't want to make it sound like it's a it's a, a simple task. I mean, it's quite complicated. There are a lot of players involved. Getting everyone around the table, uh, especially the private industry, you know, to, to align that takes time. That takes uh, a lot of a lot of uh, consultation. I mean, we've had very good, let's say, uh, examples going forward in, in certain sectors such as cocoa and soy with the team. And we look to, to move that, that, that into the future in terms of those discussions. It is a process, but I do think that, let's say compared to years ago, we have, we have the context, we have the tools, we have the, uh, the reputation to take that forward. Uh, and so I would say the idea is to stay tuned with us as, this re as, as the legislation moves down the road and as we start to engage in these types of consultations with our, with our partners. If I may add, the the 13,000 measures that Vera mentioned, uh, the multiplicity of voluntary standards and so forth, it's a reflection of society. We can't pin all of these things at the top, of course. It's 
how we make a difference, each one of us, and this is something I've heard from panelists all the way through. We want to get the word out about the good things that each one of us can do to change a mind shift so that it's not just about benchmarking, uh, auditing compliance, but really looking at how we're going to address these things. And that's why the, the collaborative measures that we've been talking about, they're not easy to capture. And that's what we want to emphasize going forward so that we don't end up with lots of dispute resolution and things like this. And all of these institutions have their role in society. The whole question is how we're going to work together. Um, last words, we have about a minute left. Um, Gabriela, did you want to talk about these things in any way? Did you want to touch on blockchain? There was a question on that. Um, or talk about the collaboration. Yeah, blockchain has a lot of potential, as I said, but it doesn't replace, it's, a, it's an instrument. But there are things like verifying premium payments that you can do. Thank my farmer, we have a program where you, you can tip your farmer all the way for a, t a cup of coffee, all that enabled by blockchain, checking deforestation, all those things, uh, blockchain can play a part. But it's an instrument just like many. I think the big, big uh, thing is uh, if we can move from good intentions and good practices to results and impact. And if that impact, we really put it in ambitious, in no rural poverty. The true value of agriculture um, is paid for and the true costs to the planet are uh, accounted for. Now, how do we do that? And that's the, the, the beautiful thing that I think we're starting to see is the private sector, is the voluntary standards, is the public sector, and it's civil society, and it's obviously uh, the people at the farm. And that I think I'm, I'm hopeful, but again, it's very much putting the eye on the prize. <laughs> and then how do we organize for that? Uh, I'd like to thank my panelists, Joe, Vera, Gabriela, for uh, tackling a very complex subject. And this is the end of our first session. Please stay tuned. The next session will be about business. And we will be showing for those who are online uh, our new publication on sustainability standards, as well as the sneak preview of our new publication, an e-publication on the state of sustainable markets. That's. Uh, cotton, cocoa, coffee, and so forth, uh, forestry, and how much land they're continuing to, um, to have that's dedicated to standards, which is plateauing, but it's still moving upwards. So that report's going to tell us who's up and down.
I believe we're online with our participants. Welcome back to all of the participants tuning in from around the world. We're here with our second session to bring you insights on standards and sustainability from businesses and investors, as I've said. Now, we've heard that certifying goods and services that are ethically produced has its challenges. And we've also seen that the pandemic's been a powerful force for everyone to rethink their operations. Um, and consumers have actually heard for the first time about things like supply chains that underpin trade. They hadn't thought before, oh gosh, if there's a sugar shortage or anything like that, or hand sanitizer shortage. And the next crisis is already upon us, and we're seeing disruptions from that as well with the water tables dropping, the air pollution sadly continuing to rise, and the oceans changing, those extreme events happening more and more, and those disrupt the supply chains too. Now, the business people we have here with us today are thinking hard about these issues, and they're trying to be a model for others while and inspire others while keeping their own businesses moving. They've all got stories to tell about what keeps them awake at night and where we should improve. Um, I'll just briefly introduce our panelists. Um, who we have three online this time, and we have Daniel with us uh, from Germany. Daniel Hopp has a family business which manufactures socks in China and sells them to buyers for supermarket discount chains mostly in Germany, also in Turkey uh, as well. And he's certified for the German government's Green Button Initiatives. That's new. It encourages sustainable textiles. He's also certified to the Business Social Compliance Initiative, which monitors workplace conditions across supply chains. Now, and he's telling me he wants to do that right thing and sleep at night, but it's not easy because he has to also do business. We also have online Salma, Salma Abdullahi from Ghana. She's a Ghanaian agricultural economist. She's founded an award-winning company that processes and markets Fonio. I don't know if you know Fonio. It's a superfood grain, and it's trending in health food stores. Her business, Amati, has grown from 10 women farmers to 3,000 in 10 years. Her Fonio is certified organic. And she managed to do that during the pan pandemic, and just this June, shipped 19 tons of it to a European buyer. We also have online Sarah Negro from Hong Kong, the Global Public Affairs Senior Manager at the well-known multinational H&M. She's a diplomat turned businesswoman who believes that the garment industry has a big role in addressing human rights, labor rights, and climate change. She'll be sharing her insights on where we should head to accelerate that good trade we were talking about earlier and who should do what. And finally, we have Denise with us. Hello, Denise, online from, I believe, London. And she's an executive director and head of sustainable finance for Standard Chartered. Um, sure, you all know that's a, one of the world's big international banks. Now, Denise is doing lots um, in terms of female leadership initiatives and algorithm-based platform. She's also a Cordon Bleu chef, but today she's going to be sharing her insights on what multinationals are thinking and what they're, where they want to go in terms of doing business across borders, whether certification is helping them, and where to tap into uh, resources to make improvements, especially carbon efficient ones. Now, we'll start first with Daniel. Uh, my first questions are to you, since you're right here with me. And you've told me that your buyers rate you 100% for compliance in terms of all of the social and environmental criteria, but it's coming at a price. What does it take for you to comply with these requirements? Does it make you more or less competitive? Okay, maybe first I would like to um, maybe elaborate a little bit on what does it mean 100%. So we, um, of course, we are not always perfect. This is one caveat I want to say, but we are very proud that we get ratings from our clients that show that our setup of uh, 
of it, within the supply chain is rated by their KPI with 100%. Of course, this is very target-based, so we go for this 100% and we know what the KPIs are. At least we have a basic understanding. Also, there are the challenges. It's not always very transparent how clients put up the KPI and how they rate things, but we have clients that go very systematic and they give us a good background. So. Um, the point is, it comes at a cost. Mm -hmm. We have to do a lot of things, and first of all, it's time investment. So I'm in business since 1998, and I was just coming from my apprenticeship, so uh, I was uh, still, so to say, going to school one day, and next day I was flying into China. So, and uh, we kept, uh, always kept the habit, and this is probably the, the thing how f uh, businesses on a family basis are doing it, so know your partners. So we were always going directly into the factory to know who they really are. Tell us, how many factories, how many visits in a year? So, how many yeah, visits over this time? Is the last, since 1998, on average, three times a year only for China. So, and, uh, and also you, say, you mentioned uh, we are also purchasing from Turkey. So uh, we, with the kind of clients that we have, we ship to, let's say, any, uh, any country our customer tell us to because they're multi multinationals. So that means we get an inquiry from them and then we try to make everything perfect there. So, but that of course costs a lot of money. We focus on the Chinese market. We have a team of three people there and this amounts, we, we have a turnover of less than 20 million and this is, amounts to at least 150,000 euros per year because we have to pay the salaries and all kind of testings, all kind of things that really makes us compliant. And we have certain levels. Uh, we are, as you said, um, green button certified. So this takes a lot of work, this kind of auditing to go into this detail and the nitty gritty of each KPI. Again, there we are measured against another set of KPIs, which is more sustainability related. And we go into each one and really try to tackle them with our team on the factory. Okay, but my question to you then is, are you doing this because it's the right thing or does it give you better market access because does the, the final consumer does not necessarily see that your socks are um, filling all of these requirements. One of the things I had asked you beforehand was, well, why don't you, because I'm from communications world, why don't you write um, up a beautiful tag and talk about the story and the efforts and so forth, and you're saying that's not really what's going to make the big, di big difference. You've talked about buyers. Yeah, um, so the, the key point here is on one hand, we are on the way to becoming a brand. So we are not a recognized brand in the market and our most business is, is private label. So that means the decision makers on how to label things are actually the buyers of these lar large enterprises. So if, if, for example, within the textile alliance, we have to make a roadmap. So I always say it, it, sound, it feels a little bit futile to do that because if the buyer decides to place the orders with another product and change from one year to the other, my roadmap is totally uh, different <coughs> or my, my performance is totally different than I projected originally. So for me, it's really, really tough. Um, do you to have a message for the buyers? Yeah, the message for the buyers is, uh, here I am, I can do the job for you, I can take all the risk of your table, I can certify in, on any label, if, um, on any certification scheme. However, the key point here is the buyer, on one hand, must understand what my performance is. This is a real, real great challenge, because if I do more than they put in their policy, for example, they can hardly measure how my performance really is compared to the competition. So why should they buy something more expensive? If and the competition may not have a label. Or will uh, they the increasingly competition have could to be have anything. labels? Could be anything. It mm -hmm. could be someone who's, uh, who's uh, simply having, let's say, a larger footprint to make a better pricing scheme on general. But this could also mean that they um, um, do anything to get an order. So we are competing against an invisible opponent there. That means we are actually bidding to get an order from our customers. So this is a challenge where we think the, the buyer has also a challenge rating us. 
This is a very important thing which everyone must understand that it, for the buyers, they, they, they also are in a competition so they, that they could um, uh, outperform, let's say, the great other competitor in the market mm -hmm. and make, make a good margin and a better price than they do. But um, the, the thing where it's tough for us as a business is how can we then display our performance, our level of performance that we are, of course, I think of myself very highly, I'm better than my competitor. So, <laughs> but how to prove that? So, um, and of course, I, I, I try to live up to the stakes, so the self-claimed self stakes. Okay, we've left some things out there for buyers in the firms that are making a difference. Um, meantime, let's turn to a different type of entrepreneur from Ghana, Salma. Let's turn to you, hello, from afar. Um, you represent one of the stories, if anyone would like to read more about Salma. She is in this book that we've launched today. And you're producing that super grain Fonio, which I have tasted. It is good. Um, now, you've just sold a lot of Fonio in Europe. Tell me, why did you certify organic? And did the getting certified to a standard help you? Um, yes, um, it, it helped a lot, especially during the pandemic. Um, at the particular time that we were, we wanted to communicate to our customers that um, we got their back. Um, what exactly the time that we got the organic certification? Um, because at that particular moment, people were so worried of what they eat. And we wanted to tell them that we are producing this under sustainable standards and we are mindful of the environment so that we could repose some confidence in our customers. And, you know, Trust. actually, when we got the organic certification at that particular time, that was a direct communication we, we sent to them. So it, it, it really helped somebody to be able to maintain most of the customers and, you know, open up new opportunities. So... It, it was great. And, you know, in the process, it, it helped us to um, build back resiliently from COVID. Okay. And has it come at a cost? How, how's it been for you during the yes. pandemic? Um, I think for the first um, three months, it hit Ghana. Um, we actually ran down by 80% revenue. Um, which was a big hit to Amati. At that particular moment, we were trying to re-strategize our market and, you know, um, get online um, e-commerce because it was difficult to send products out. Um, but in, in, in all, I think that, you know, uh, building back with uh, getting premium pricing on Fonio with organic certification has really helped us to, um, you, know, uh, you know, get into the, uh, the, the, the level that we know we can we, we can sustainable build back after uh, the, the, the COVID-19. Um, I'll come back to that in a moment, but um, you were getting certified. You were getting certified. I know ITC was one of the, the partners that helped you with this. Um, and you'll have to keep monitoring and so forth. What do you see as the big challenges moving forward in this process? Um, I, I think that the, the, the basic challenge is, one, the people to uh, build their capacities, you know, we need to learn how these sustainable standards are doing. And um, most SMEs like us do not usually get um, um, in contact with these companies that are, you know, doing that, that are, that are increasing our awareness or... On, on how this certification should go. So you're saying and, they need um, continue training? Also, yes, yes, continue training. Very important because that is what SME needs. That is exactly what ITC gave Amati. Um, you know, that was able to help us to um, get this certification. And I'm asking you I to say this, Salma, I'm just yeah? interrupting and asking you to say this because we do have the head of the Ghana Export Promotion Agency with us here in the room. So... Um, she's listening okay. along with uh, <laughs> lots of other people who are here today. So, yes. Okay. So, what you need is training. Continue training. Yes. You need connections, we information. We need training, what is it that you need? Of course. Of course. Um, I, I think we need, we need training. Very important because you need to build our capacity to the level where we can actually practice the sustainable standards 
um, sustainably. And also we need, you know, connection to the market uh, because that is what will open the new opportunities and give you the premium pricing that you want. Um, and also I think there should be flexible payment terms for um, people who are going to do organic certification because it comes with a cost and most people are running away because of the cost. But I think we need to ask um, to, to get flexible payment so that we can have this certification because okay. um, the green economy is the future. Yeah. Thank you, Sama. We also have um, maybe an expert who can talk to you afterwards, since we have Denise with us, about flexible payment. And I did take note that during the pandemic, you took that opportunity to do other things as your business was dropping, like getting the, the certification really up and going, getting the website going, um, because that certification is actually giving that label of trust that is allowing you to ac access new buyers and markets in, in, a, in a great way. And I applaud that investment because I believe that this is the way the world is going. So thank you, um, Daniel, to Salma, uh, in terms of what you're doing. And I'd like to turn now to, um, to Sarah. And we'll have Denise come afterwards because she's got the magic pot of gold and the advice of how to use it. But we'll turn also to Sarah first because let's face it, H&M has an awful lot of power around the world. There are a lot of people who are buying your clothes. And um, let's hear what you have to say. Yeah, I mean, uh, we do. Uh, so our production, of course, is, is pretty extensive. Uh, we have more than a thousand suppliers all around the world, uh, spanning from China to Ethiopia, Turkey, Indonesia, and so on. And this is the results of a long-term strategy that we have put in place. When we began, actually, this business... Did you say suppliers started... in 30 countries? Is that what I heard you say? In the more than 10 countries, the oh, 10 countries are the most uh, important ones where mm -hmm. we operate. And we began many years ago with small operations in China. And then we found out that we needed to expand and we progressively touched upon other markets. So we do deal with a level of complexity that is actually uh, quite big. And I totally understand our a fellow a speaker before when he was talking about the cost of compliance because even for a big corporate for us it is actually complex to keep track of all of the different layers of compliance that we need to secure. Yes. I mean, compliance is just the very first level, of course, uh, but we feel that that is absolutely necessary in terms of brand responsibility for, for human rights, after all, because this is what we're striving, to really uphold the human rights uh, according to all of the guidelines provided by uh, the United Nations, but also, of course, the OECD, which has cre created a fantastic uh, guidance for human rights, specifically for, for the garment industry. And um, how to do that, uh, right. it is our, uh, yeah, so um, that's our daily job, right, how to right, do but that. But it's not easy and, uh, for you either. It keep. is not easy also for us. Because you've got, you've said and, more uh, than it's 10 not countries. easy because, exactly, and a thousand suppliers, all at different stage in terms of uh, performance. So how to measure really where we are at. I think in this sense, it's very, it's very important to have the possibility to rely on industry tools. Uh, and so we are very grateful that also thanks to ITC, uh, we have now a new tool that has been created by SAC to really uh, measure compliance and performance in all of our suppliers. And this is called SLCP. It's a long questionnaire so uh, that the supplier- Can you spell out that acronym for us? Um, social labor compliance program right exactly that's it sorry for me it's now a technicality is a word of everyday uh, use so of course uh, I didn't even know anymore what it was exactly the long version of it thank you for reminding me of that um, so that's uh, really been a, a, a very important progress for us because now all of the brands, all of the different companies that are competitors on the market for consumers actually use the same tool to, uh, to see what is really happening on the ground. And how they say the knowledge is power, uh, it is indeed the very first step. 
uh, to really understand what is going on, to have what we call the materiality assessment, the evidence-based approach, to then create strategies to, in the best word, improve the situation. So in and, other words, we're picking up from that trend that we heard about that Joe was saying in the first session about um, collaboration and convergence and alignment um, with a program like this SLCP that we're talking about. And that should be helping you to lower your costs and maybe avoid, reduce the audit fatigue, I hope. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. Because uh, the uh, one of the issues in the industry, in the garment industry, for instance, it has been that for years, every brand was doing its own audit or its own assessment of how the situation was on the ground. And everyone had then different data. It was very difficult to come together to try to find the common solutions also to the problem. Now, with this methodology, the audit is done only once, and the data uh, derived from the from the audit are actually shared with all of the brands that are present in that supplier. This really is an increase in efficiency for us. So that's it doesn't nice. solve all of the problems. It doesn't. No, but, but it is a, a step in the right direction. Which is great. And another thing we've talked about is um, the role at a national level. And we do have some people representing governments here with us in the room and around the world. And in light of the pandemic, that's been especially important because, um, as we've been saying, those supply chains have been shifting. And I think how people are consuming clothes is also different than before. Not just So it's not just from the supplier end, it's also from the consumer end. And you've mentioned to me that you feel that there's a role for national legislation to protect social, on really the social side, the workers. We really feel that way. You know, some times ago, uh, the international brands, especially the big ones like H&M, were conceiving global strategies uh, to improve the situation. For instance, H&M is quite known for having taken uh, quite a progressive stance when it comes to the wages and how to increase the wages of our garment workers. But we feel that that is actually not the best way. We want to go towards country-specific strategies that are discussed, negotiated, presented, and really coming together with the local authorities. And by local authorities, I mean, of course, the local governments, but also the national actors that are playing a key role, like the employers' organizations, the trade unions, the NGOs that are active on, on the ground. We feel that we need to make those strategies a country-specific, and we really hope that we can rely also on a stronger legal enforcement. For instance, when it comes to minimum wage, uh, we're trying to play our role uh, every day, uh, but we really hope to see a better enforcement. I'm not saying this is easy, absolutely not. I understand also how much money it costs for a developing country to set up a good enforcement system. I'm well aware of that, but I'm really hoping that we can find solutions for this to to improve and work in the best possible way in the future. Thank you very much, Sarah. That for me is very interesting because it touches on how fast the world is changing for all of us. We have for a long time become specialists in our own area and we work each with our own things and you can see how important it is, you know, trade and investment being linked. Um, now you're hearing about how we need to work more closely with, um, with maybe a labor department, for example. It could be anything and it's got to be at all of these different levels and across all of different ways. And we do have uh, government bodies, chambers of commerce, all sorts of multipliers that are there to bring the voice of government and business together in a way that we keep scaling up these issues. Um, I'm turning to Denise now. Um, this is like a relay and we have passed the baton to someone actually very important because Denise is, she, her, she's got her heart in the right place about where we wanna go forward in terms of finance and investment. Um, but I'd like you to spend a moment to tell us about some of the really interesting findings that Standard Chartered has had about supply chains right now. Um, how is it changing? Yes, very happy to. Um, 
I mean, I, I believe we are at the moment um, witnessing uh, the biggest experiment on capitalism, which has been further triggered by the global pandemic. You know, many of the large companies, including banks, now must meet expect expectations of diversity, sustainability, ethical procurement practices, and so on. Uh, sustainability transparency is becoming a law in EU, as, as both H&M and our um, bank is going through at the moment. Denise, if I can just interrupt you right there. So you're saying transparency is an issue, but do um, those people who are managing the supply chains, are your surveys saying that they have the supply chain visibility that they need? Absolutely not. We're only scratching the surface at the moment, right? And in addition to Sarah, I'd like to bring the climate lens as well. Scope 3 of the Paris Agreement requires all large um, companies to know uh, the emissions of their value chains, including where they buy the products to uh, how it is being sold to the end consumers. And we know that at least two thirds of all the emissions come uh, from the supply chains uh, that now the multinationals are on the hook to solve for. So what does that mean? There will be a big knock-on effect on the supply chains to help uh, gather more data, uh, improve the performance, and then be on that transition to net zero journey that the multinationals are embarking on. And you're also talking about those SMEs that are deep, deep in the supply chains in developing countries around the world. And Absolutely. they're going to need to be ready. And what do they need to do? Uh, they, got, they have to be ready and they, and they need to have access to finance needed to make those investments into the technologies that will bring them or make them more climate friendly businesses, right? Exactly. So many large companies are discovering that we don't know our supply chains as well as we need to, to address this very complex and difficult uh, issue. As a result of this, two key priorities have emerged uh, over the past couple of years. One, transitioning into low carbon operating models, including in our uh, supply chains. And two, building more resilient supply chains, as we've all discovered through the pandemic, it's very fragile, right? And to achieve these two, we need to think about the digitally enabled ways of, of doing that, right? Now, this presents... So your keywords find... were carbon lower, 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 and okay. resilience for small firms. Absolutely, absolutely. And we are all on the hook for this at the moment. So because uh, this presents now what the financial services call a transition risk. So it's a new uh, phenomenon that we're all trying to um, uh, get our heads around. So what does it mean? Evolving cost of compliance, uh, particularly in the climate space and human rights, as Sarah mentioned. Disruptions caused by extreme weather events. I mean, even in Europe, we dealt with flooding and wildfires all summer, right? And how does that impact your logistics and um, availability of uh, raw material? Uh, plus all the, the regulatory costs that are uh, coming our way, right? So how large companies are uh, preparing to manage this transition risk and what is the financial negative financial impact of failure to do so is what's keeping the financial services industry uh, busy at the moment. Busy. And if, very busy. As, and as mentioned before, this is going to have a huge knock-on effect on the smaller suppliers in these value chains. You know, you talked about audit, audit fatigue. It's going to get worse. It's going to become even worse than know your client sort of checks uh, the banks have been doing on, on, on small businesses, well, right? I hope the pre-competitive uh, possibilities accelerate because I think what we've been hearing from yeah. people in the business is that audit fatigue cannot get much for, worse if we want them to be able to continue yeah. to supply in the in a good kind of way. Um, but it's like not only her news, right? So there's also positive, uh, this led to innovation and disruption and positive um, developments. One example, so large brands and companies are now coming together uh, to innovate solutions around how to establish visibility over the ecosystem with the purpose of unlocking funding, right? For particularly uh, climate uh, progress. Uh, one instance is um, something we've announced a couple of weeks ago uh, through our innovation business called SC Ventures. Uh, we announced a JV, a joint venture with Linklogis, which is a blockchain technology provider in China, uh, a platform called Olea, 
which is a fully digitized trade finance origination and distribution platform that aims to bring together institutional investors, so big money that sits in the West, in developed markets, and connects them with the smaller businesses, particularly in Asia, and in this case, uh, China, to allow them access to um, efficient, hassle-free working capital. And this is the only way in our view, or this is our uh, way of addressing the 1.5 trillion trade finance gap that Asian Development Bank uh, claims uh, that will be hindering our ability to meet the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So using innovative ways like um, blockchain uh, or you know, blended finance, uh, which brings um, donor capital or patient capital and mixes it with private sector uh, capital to help unlock financing for these right initiatives is very crucial um, in this pathway that we are on. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we, I have been signaled to turn to the questions, but I'd just like to add that Standard Charter also has, they're doing so much work on supporting decarbonization in terms of what they're offering. And they have a survey that says nearly 80% of multinationals are going to drop suppliers who uh, don't reduce the use of their fossil fuels by 2025. And at the same time, the ones that are already working with suppliers who are standard compliant, um, they're saying that they're offering preferential status to them, and there's even 30% who are offering preferential pricing. So uh, this is a message, this is a wake-up call. We really de do need to move forward in terms of that circular economy for the firms, but we also need to know that um, there is support there from many channels to help, and there's a huge green goods market for those who are sustainable. Would you say that I captured, or is there anything you want to add to that point? No, uh, you're absolutely right. And I hope you can share the report uh, with the audience today. And I'm always happy to, to uh, answer any questions. Are going up in the chat because there's some yeah. really wonderful reports by Standard Chartered about these kind of things. Thank you so much. I mean, I think the financial services sector has a critical role to play in all of this because we cannot um, expect a large brand to solve for it uh, across its value chain on its own. And we cannot obviously expect a supplier to advance on all of these topics and find the investment you know, it needs to become the sustainable or green company that um, is the hot commodity at the moment. It needs to be a collaboration uh, a coherence uh, and partnership across everybody involved in the um, uh, in the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. How this we financial services, yeah, how is the financial services innovating around this? We're creating products that support sustainable trade finance. Um, as um, you mentioned, we offer preferred uh, pricing to suppliers that are better in ESG performance according to the brand's uh, analysis. Uh, we also, as an emerging markets focused bank, have a huge SME banking business uh, in the developing world. And we're creating lending products that uh, directly uh, address this decarbonization uh, problem. For instance, we're providing uh, preferential rates to those companies uh, who are outperforming their country's uh, NDCs, uh, national uh, commitments uh, to achieve um, climate, uh, climate change. So incentives uh, so are there. Incentives are there, but being provided uh, by the financial services sector. So it needs to become a little bit more government plus uh, investment community initiative to make it sustainable and uh, scalable in the long run. Right. The dots are out there and we're working. We keep working to connect them. Um, let's take some questions from uh, our viewers online. Uh, how do producers decide which standards their uh, business should subscribe to? Are there instances of competing values backed by different standards? How do you choose? Um, that's one, and I'm going to start with Daniel Knapp. But while you're thinking about your answer, let's see a few more. Um, everyone wants to know um, recent regulations um, on human rights and due diligence, how it's going to affect supply chains. Does it change the role for sustainability standards? Um, we have a very specific question coming in for Denise that we'll come back to on aligning with other banks and financial players to measure carbon deep in the supply chain and how you get that certification. So let's just start with that. There's actually a whole lot more. Um, producers, standards, what do you 
which ones do you pick? Are some better than others? Um, ooh, do they have different values? These are tricky so, questions. Yes, of course, there is a qualitative difference between standards. Um, but how do you pick a standard if, um, now I want to really get it, sounds a bit cynical, but how do you want to pick up a standard if no one's paying for it? That means most factories would pick the standards that you're calling for. And in this context, um, I am I'm not 100% with the problem of the audit fatigue because I've seen factories that build entire departments in order to display for one day that they don't subcontract. So this means factories are ready if they follow such kind of, let's say, cheeky policies. Supply then chain they, visibility, they, boom, they would put like, on the PR they would, front. Yes, they would simply uh, do everything to get the audit right. So, and this is why we go so close to the factories. I did not mention this number, but with our eight focus factories, we went the last, uh, since August 2019, more than 800 times we visited them in order to monitor uh, activities, uh, see the, the, the stream within the factory, understand how they are working, where's the problem, where are the challenges. So we really go close um, because it happens that factories simply, they skip from one day to another, from one extreme to another extreme, from extreme, going for extreme sustainability ideas to doing nothing anymore because simply business is dropped, orders are cancelled or something but like that. But how this. do consumers know that your socks don't just check the box and that they're different than maybe someone else who's maybe picked an easier standard or a standard where they don't probe? Yeah, that's. I think that's that's the tough challenge, and uh, probably uh, the world um, is not perfect. I don't. Uh, have, we don't have all the answers here, but it, it, I'm sure it's I, a, a it, question in terms of competitiveness for you. I think also, like if we if we look at all these kind of certifications that are out there, and as I said, I'm I'm with the green button certification, and I'm I'm quite happy doing it because it it's really gives also the the ability to to put it on the label. However, um, how, I wonder how um, the, the, the consumer is not really valuing it and everyone must ask him, himself if you go for shopping, every, every, any product you take into your hand has the same problem. You cannot measure in the, in, the, in the split of a second where you decide to take this package or the other from the shelf, how do you distinguish that? And, and in some cases you even, there's a, a malice to the to the sustainable products because it does not always work. If you put a big sustainability logo on it, what's happening in the brains of where the buying decision is not always, oh, this one is better, but it depends on the circumstance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Sarah, you're also dealing with a lot, a lot of different standards. Do you have any comments on that? Uh, let me just say that I completely agree. Uh, I mean. We were hoping that audits and factory visits to check on the quality and on the performance were actually finished, but I agree that we keep on finding new problems and, uh, and new issues, and uh, I agree that there is uh, sometimes what we call double bookkeeping, so there is one reality that is presented on the occasion of the visit and a completely different reality in a day-by-day -day standards. But that's exactly why I think that if these phenomena have not yet been resolved after 20 years that we have been working with this method, maybe it's time for us to change method uh, and to really move towards something different. Um, I believe that we should empower our counterparts. Our counterparts are first of all the suppliers and also the workers' representatives in those suppliers because through that dialogue, I think we can have better evidence of what is actually going on on the ground. And this is why I am very happy that within the, the program and the tool I was referring to before, the SLCP, we have now the involvement of Better Work. 
Better Work is a flagship initiative of the uh, ILO, the International Labour Organization. It was born years ago exactly for the garment industry, and it is a third party, a neutral third party, but also a very reputable third party that can exactly intervene in that uh, situation. So when we finally have some data that both the suppliers and the workers can agree upon, I think we have better data already. We have uh, data that are closer to what the reality is, and we can then work from there with an improvement plans. So but again, talking, this is Sarah, you were talking before about um, collaboration between multinationals, let's say, and now you're talking maybe in terms of data about collaboration to some degree among suppliers in terms of compliance. Then didn't you raise that with me before as well? Um, if you had this dream world um, where we could make things a little bit easier, what would you see that could be shared? Yeah, um, I think... <sighs> The, we, we need an, a new kind of transparency, definitely. Um, I think today it is always about keeping, your, securing your business. And here's the big challenge. Of course, I don't want to see have my competitors look right into my supply chain. I told you it's very narrow and I focus very strongly on factories on developing it. So it's tough for me simply to put everything on my website. Mm H&M, -hmm. um, I think, is, is doing something like this, but of course they have uh, they are much bigger and even if let's say if something gets in, uh, disrupted by let's say some competition then uh, probably there's there's also a backup strategy um, so for me it's not because I'm very specialized with my with my product with, which is socks so um, but I think what we really need is uh, something where we can and also if my if I may interrupt you also said to me that uh, the compliance costs mean they do to some degree eat into your margin Yes, of course. <laughs> cost is cost. And so if, if, I, if I would not have to do that, actually, I, I, I also agree that, um, that we need to um, enable the factories to report in a manner that we would appreciate. Because what we're doing right now is the kind of auditing systematic, which is more, more or less everywhere, and we need this kind of third-party audit to verify our activities and also show that, it, that we really mean it. However, um, before an audit, the factory should perform in a certain way that we can that we can really measure within the audit, so that we would have a continuity. But this this definitely means we must give something to the factories that that they would like to do that. To we need an incentive to do that, and I think here um, definitely if we high, um, if we raise the stakes, we also must raise uh, the the prices. Uh, and we need to to finance the uh, uh, the extra mile definitely right and consumers for whatever reason um, what they want is compliance and they want everything not to be they don't want to pay that extra some do those with disposable income those with less disposable income may not feel comfortable um, so that's a challenge definitely I think but but here, I think also policymakers need to decide how how to do that. I wonder. Um, I think um, one of the models I'm thinking of is uh, uh, why not, for example, work with the VAT. Right. I think. Um, what, would, what would you do with VAT to give incentives to people yeah, like I, you? I, in Germany, we have uh, for textile, we have 16 percent. I'd say, okay, let's raise that to 20. And make 14 for to make it extreme numbers now, but uh, 14 for uh, for certain KPI-wise measured sustainability products, and for the common ones raise it because then we have a really incentive throughout the whole supply chain. And I think in retail prices this makes a big change. And then we also have some let's say some change also to promote something into supply chains. Okay, so we have another proposal on the floor. We've been hearing about um, backing up that social legislation. Now we're hearing about offering incentives through different tools for people who go through those uh, standards steps and really try to take that extra hurdle. Um, okay, we have not given Salma or Denise a lot of chances to say anything. Salma, how about you? Any comments on all of this? the questions you've been hearing and your perspective? Sorry. Um, 
I I think that the the the, the choosing the um, the kind of certification for a marty, um, we had to analyze the customers that were asking for it um, because we we have some customers who will write in and say what are your sustainable standard procedures and you know whether in US or in Europe or in Ghana. And you know the, we looked at the certification that they trusted uh, because you you are you are given a product and you have a target audience a target customers um, that are going for those products and if they are concerned about a type of certification with the trust um, you know that is what you need to choose trust. and um, that, that is what we did at Tamati um, we chose um, the organic certification because that was what our consumers across different territories we're looking for. But also um, to make a few points on the cost, um, I think that obviously you, once you get the organic certification, um, it comes with a cost. So obviously the price for the product um, will not be the same as the conventional um, uh, ponio that we Consumers have. Consumers so, bite the bullet, you've been hearing it. Yeah, that is true. And That's really um, what you're saying. So, Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. So um, when, when, when we sell it out, we realize that um, the premium that is paid on the organic ponio actually is you know, taking care of the investment we and our smallholder farmers are putting into this. So um, I, I think that the cost sharing in the value chain is also very important um, because the, the, the benefit is also going through the value chain. Everybody's benefiting as a result of the um, the, the additional, um, additional uh, implementation they have put into getting these uh, procedures and standards um, approved. So for me, I will also um, say that small businesses here should um, cash in into the sustainable standard certification because it's, it's, it's going to become a new normal very soon. And you know you need to be in it, and we need to find a way of reducing the challenges um, to make it very flexible for them to be able to um, get these certifications. If they are looking at doing global business, they cannot do that business um, without having this certification because that is me. You saw your products everywhere. Okay, uh, Denise, yes. what are your thoughts? Um, very quickly, I think there's two important components to this. One, regulations, and two, uh, disclosure standards. Uh, on regulations, uh, particularly in the climate space, we need some uh, coherence across regions. I mean, obviously, Europe, EU is uh, leading the way at the moment, but that is the biggest concern on coherence international growth at the regions. moment. Thank you for saying that. That's really important. Also, because your on bank has another study which says that multinationals want to move more into Asia, more into Africa, more into the Middle East, and we've got to have coherence. Um, among regions and also in mindset, which is something you've mentioned as well. Exactly. And the second component is disclosure standards. Obviously, Sarah mentioned it's the actual problem is the data. It's not about which certification or which audit process you go to. It's actually having access to that useful um, data that can help us make informed decisions. And that can Daniel only said, be... That's, it's not easy. Some of those things are really proprietary to a company. Uh, it will change though. I mean, like financial accounting, uh, there are developments in sustainability accounting, and there will be some mandatory disclosure requirements, uh, which the large companies at the moment are facing with. It's going to come down the um, um, uh, economic curve. Mm -hmm. Exactly, a chain. Uh, obviously, bearing in mind the competitiveness uh, of the businesses, but there's got to be some disclosure uh, standardization around sustainability metrics, especially around um, climate and human rights. Climate and human rights. Those are the big ones that you're pulling out. Okay, we only have a few minutes left. We have 11 to be precise. So I'll give you each one more round, about a minute. And tell us what are the most important things you would leave in mind, but for whom? Say, for a consumer, or for a national legislator, or for a trade promotion organization, a chamber of commerce, start with you. <laughs> and if also, I'm going, um, one, I'll give you a minute and a half. 
if there's anything you want to say because of the pandemic, because we haven't had a lot of time to explore that. And I know you've said that having that cut in travel means that there's been a change in building that mindset with your businesses and the relationships too. Mm -hmm. So pandemic and future actions for whom? I think uh, the one thing what, what we really need to get tackled and this, I, I think that touches on everyone is this coherence and collaboration, this kind of combination of things. I fully agree if I hear coherence that, that uh, right now we have still a lot of companies that are working their own way, even myself. I don't exclude myself. I don't want to say I'm better than the others. Uh, I need to tackle the challenge. The buyer calls me and gives me a challenge today, so now I need to tackle it. That's life of an SME. So that's it, and it will never change. But now I'm coming, why, why am I going so close to the factories? Because I say I have no other chance if I want to perform at 100%. So that means I have to go not only one extra mile, I have to go the marathon. And your message? To the home? message is, uh, so there's not one solution, but if you go for something, you need to have supplements, on, and you must understand it. You will never tackle, there's not one hammer. So you need a tool set of things that... And the tool set, standards this, is part of it, but it's not everything. And this counts not only for businesses, but for every decision maker. Okay. Uh, Salma? Um, I, I'll, I'll start with um, the, the, the regulations um, we have. I think that most of the regulations we have locally should um, imbibe in the... The, the international regulation standards for you know climate change for um, I mean all these sustainable um, you know standards to um, make sure there's the small businesses that are around. I'm talking so much on small businesses because I'm a small business. So, um, <laughs> so and I, I think that once the they learn in the big negotiations, of course. Of course. Um, I, I think that it will already make it easier for them to be able to, to follow through this um, sustainable standards. And I also think that the trade organization, especially the Ghana Export Promotion Authority, I know they are there, um, we will speak to the fact that if they become a big anchor um, in connecting these uh, businesses to the market, I think it will motivate other small businesses to embrace um, the, the sustainable standard you know, certifications or procedures in their businesses. You know, for all of us to um, um, have um, a green economy. Um, I want to say also that so the you're climate saying focus, change to encourage them to focus on the green economy and to embrace the use of sustainability standards. Yes, yes, and they, they, they will become a very big anchor in that if they actually facilitate the process of market access. I think it will be very important so that people can get the investment they put into these um, certifications standards and is a way you know, of the standards, mm -hmm. of course, yes, yes. So I, for me, I think that is, the, that is the way to go. Thank you so much. And Sarah? Um, I have two concluding remarks that I would like to share with you. Uh, first of all, I think it's very important that we remember that the garment industry is usually the first industry that can really develop uh, in terms of industrialization in a developing market. And it's the first industry that usually offers a formalized job to women. 85% of our workforce on average is made of women. And it's the first opportunity to have a formal jobs where their overtime is paid, where they are exposed to the factory environment. I'm not saying that it's an easy life. I'm saying this is a very harsh life, but I'm also saying that this is an opportunity to get out of a community environment that maybe has kept you uh, in a family context only for, for many years. So it is an important opportunity that we really must value and we must make it work in the very in the very best possible way. This is why the relationship with the governments is so key. Because sometimes the governments might be interested in having a dialogue with the brands where certain regulations and certain law are kept low so that more investments come in. But as we have said with the NIS and with the new regulations that are coming into place in the European Union, it will be the opposite. 
The stricter the law is, the more interested I will be in investing in that market because less investments I will have to make on my own due diligence. So it is time that we take this dialogue in a different way. Um, and I think this is the right moment to do so. A plea for the pandemic has, and to focus the pandemic on already, the textile sector. You're making a plea for the textile sector because it's very important to a uh, country's growth as one of the key uh, sectors. Yes, and the pandemic has shown us uh, how difficult it is, be. it is for the workers, for the countries, for the economic development, if all of the sudden the international brands are not placed in orders anymore. Uh, so we really need to make this work. And my second very quick remark is that I totally believe what Daniel hinted at uh, before, that we need to reward the extra mile. Absolutely. It's not easy to do good business in some of the countries where we produce or where our suppliers are producing for us. We must reward the extra mile. We must find mechanism where if the suppliers is bringing it to the next level, they get a contribution and financing from us in, in some way. We are already developing some tools, but I think that we really need to move this to the next level, especially when it comes to climate change. And also because this is so close to my heart when it comes to wages and to improve the wages of those women, we know how important they are for the whole community development. Those wages paid to those women. Absolutely. And you had a last point? No, this is my, okay, my, my, my last. We have just a few minutes for Denise to... We have just yeah, a few I'll, minutes. I'll be very brief and very complimentary to Sarah. Uh, my plea is better awareness, better collaboration and standardization uh, among corporations, suppliers and banks, which is an essential prerequisite uh, to encourage financing and investment to support sustainable ecosystems. And to really achieve this, to really create sustainable supply chains uh, that will facilitate future growth, uh, we need to look at the longer term to find the wider ecosystem, not the immediate contractual relationships or concerns in a day-to-day -day business. We need to build trusted ecosystems, trusted partnerships, and think for the long term. Great. As long as we have space for all of those uh, SMEs, for them to do that, because they're Absolutely. at the heart. Um, and we've got to balance that short and the long. Um, I think that we've come just about to the end of our session. I would like to warmly thank all of these panelists. You can see that there's so much to do, and this is a microcosm of it, that when you have small businesses, big businesses, banks together in the same room, and you have voices like yours that are listening here in the room and around the world, this is the beginning of the dialogue. And I thank my colleagues at ITC as well, who have helped to put together such a fabulous panel and leave us lots of food for thought. And with that, um, we're slowly going to transition to um, a new session. And before that, we're gonna show you a video from the United Nations Environmental Program. And they're going to be talking about, okay, how do we reach out to those consumers? How do we address issues? How do we get ready for all of that? Because we haven't talked a lot about the consumers. We've been talking about, um, I mean, it's there. That's always in the end, they're the ones who are buying, but that's what's coming forward next. So thanks again to all of our panelists. Uh, please do stay tuned for the video and for the next session. And I'm looking right at Matthew, who's going to be on board for it. You're probably used to this scene. There is your product and so many others. There are also so many factors which can make consumers choose one product instead of yours. The price, the ingredients, their personal taste, social norms, and how much they rely on one brand, among others. In the past few years, consumers are adding one more factor to this list, the sustainability attributes of products. Making sustainable consumption choices is an effective way to protect the planet, prevent climate change, and think collectively. 
products with sustainable attributes can really attract the attention of consumers and help them make a positive impact. But only if these attributes are properly communicated. Follow these five steps to effectively communicate how sustainable your product is. You can use the product packaging and even explore other tools, like your company website and social media. Be reliable. Communicate only the sustainability attributes that are consistent and accurate, and that reflect the concrete evidence you have. Better than using your own voice to announce them, have a label or a certification attesting an accepted methodology when it is possible. Make it relevant. Highlight what really makes a difference in terms of sustainability in your product category. Instead of saying your deodorant is CFC free, which is required by law, show that it goes beyond legal compliance by not being tested on animals. Be clear. Provide information in a direct and useful way. Don't focus on the brand's characteristics, but on the product's characteristics and help consumers to improve their behavior, showing, for example, how they can properly discard the product packaging at the end of its life. Be transparent. Satisfy consumers' appetite for information. Instead of hiding relevant data, make it clear how the highlighted attribute was assured and who provided the evidence. For example, if your product is certified on the basis of social, environmental, and economic fair trade standards, show its label and provide further information on your website. Make it accessible. Don't be shy. Consumers have to notice your information. Instead of hiding it or putting it small, make it visible with appropriate font size and graphic elements and complement with easy-to-use online information platform for consumers to better understand the positive impact of your product. These are the five fundamental principles to properly provide the sustainability information, the ones you should start with. But you can go further. Meet the five aspirational principles to communicate how sustainable your product is. Show the three dimensions of sustainability. Inform improvements of your product related to environmental, social, and economic dimensions. Ideally, use or combine labels that cover these three aspects. Invite consumers to act. Use information to engage and encourage consumers to actively adopt positive consumption behavior while buying, using, or discarding your products. Use social media, create campaigns, and build a long-term relationship with them. Be where consumers are. Use a combination of different approaches and diversify your channels. Raise consumers' attention through innovative messages. Put them on your website, social media, and marketing campaigns. And of course, you can always have a label attached to your product. Work with others. Involve different stakeholders Make partnerships to strengthen your sustainability efforts. This will improve your ability to properly communicate and increase credibility for the sustainability aspect of your product. Let consumers compare products. Help consumers choose between similar items using comparisons of products' characteristics. It's important to use an inclusive and an approved methodology which allows objective comparison. These 10 principles can be applied to all kinds of products and different types of communication. Supplying product sustainability information is a daily challenge, but it's an important way to attract the attention of consumers to the importance of making more sustainable choices. The principles are derived from the Guidelines for Providing Product Sustainability Information, a global guidance on making effective environmental, social, and economic claims to facilitate the empowerment of consumers by enabling better consumption choices. The publication is an output of the Consumer Information Program of the One Planet Network, developed by the United Nations Environment Program and the International Trade Center. It's available on the Product Sustainability Information Hub.
Welcome back, everybody. So if you've been following the conversations, we've been exploring the evolution of sustainability standards and how businesses around the world are dealing with the challenges and taking up the opportunities that come on, along with that. As you're listening, we want to remind you, you are invited to tweet, tagging at ITC News and using hashtag T4SD forum. Next, we have a fireside chat exploring sustainability in the context of the African continental free trade area. This is an agreement that is set to boost intra-African trade, create jobs, and improve business competitiveness. But can all of this be achieved in a sustainable way? For this conversation, we welcome Matthew Wilson, Chief of Special Projects here at ITC, who will moderate this session with Ms. Patina Gappa, Principal Legal Advisor at the Office of the Secretary General of the AFCFTA, which is based in Ghana. Matthew, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. And a good afternoon to our live audience and to the thousand plus people who are watching all over the world, including my mother. So welcome to our special fireside chat. I had asked the T4SD team for a real fire. That wasn't possible. I'd asked the T4SD team to make sure that Patina was here next to me, but because of flight connections and other issues, that wasn't possible either. But I want you to close your eyes and imagine I'm sitting next to a warm fire and this powerhouse of a lady, Dr. Patina Gappa, is seated next to me. Patina is a bit of a legend in international trade circles. From working in the Appellate Body Secretariat at the WTO to being one of the pioneers of the advisory center of WTO law, to now being the first principal legal advisor in the AFCFTA Secretariat. Dr. Patina Gappa, Zambian by birth, Zimbabwean by nationality, multilateralist by choice, is at the center of the historic launch and rollout of the continental free trade area. But she's not just a lawyer. Patina is an incredibly gifted writer of the highest order. And I actually have one of her books here that she signed for me about 10 years ago. Her writing achievements are too many to mention, but trust me, there are few writers that are as imaginative visual and visceral as Patina. In fact, she's also one of the judges of the International Booker Prize 2022. But today we're not discussing fiction. We're discussing facts, I hope, Patina. We're going to chat about the AFCFTA, specifically how Patina sees the connection between the agreement and the ongoing discussions on sustainability. Welcome, dear Patina. Uh, thank you so, so much. Thank you so much for that lovely, lovely welcome. I really wish I could be in Geneva, but unfortunately, it wouldn't have been very sustainable for me to <laughs> travel to Geneva for what would have effectively been one night because I also have to travel on this week to um, uh, uh, some two of our state parties here, here on the continent. So I'm really very sorry that I couldn't make it in the end, but thank you so much for this kind invitation and for that wonderful, wonderful description. You forgot to say that I am African by inclination. So Zambian by birth, Zimbabwean by nationality, African by inclination and multilateralist by choice. I love that, thank you. That's wonderful, that's wonderful, thank you. So Patina, as I mentioned, you wear many hats from being a trade law expert to being a celebrated writer. It's, it's really quite a fascinating journey when somebody looks at your, your career. Me personally, I don't see the connections between being <laughs> an international trade lawyer and being an author of fiction. Or maybe they are, I don't know. Um, am I missing something? Tell you us. You are definitely. <laughs> yeah, am I missing something? Okay, now tell us. If you were writing a nonfiction book about what the world has gone through over the last two years, what would you call it? Mm, mm. I've actually written the book. <laughs> uh, over lockdown, I wrote two books that in my mind are connected and in my mind they answer your question about the link between my fiction and my trade work. So the first book, uh, which is a nonfiction book, is called On Decolonization. And I was inspired by, you know, look at the Black Lives Movement to look at the decolonization conversation globally. So it looks at the decolonization debate from international law, trade, as well as issues of culture, returning artifacts. So it's, a, it's an essay collection on decolonization issues in international trade and in international law. 
And the second is actually about you guys. It's about all of you guys in Geneva. It's, um, it's a short story collection uh, about the anxieties of working in the golden cage. You know, I call Geneva the golden cage. It's very hard to leave. Um, and it's very hard to leave for many reasons. So um, my, my new collection is about what it means to work as part of the international civil service in a time, in the time of Corona, basically, with all the anxieties um, of lockdown, looking for meaning, looking for connection. So to me, there are no, there's no distinction between what, you know, my trade work and my, you know, my fiction work, because it's all about writing about connection, whether it's through trade or looking for meaning. That's amazing. So during lockdown, you wrote two books. During lockdown, I learned how to do avocado and toast. <laughs> there's, there's something wrong here, Fatina. Um, <laughs> now let's talk about the CFTA. Now we know, we know the promise of the CFTA. It could boost spending in the economy by almost $7 trillion by 2030, increase income gains by 7%, boost exports by about $600 billion, lift 30 million people out of poverty. But I want to talk about the CFTA and climate change and sustainability issues. Some have expressed concerns that the agreement may have missed the opportunity to really include more on these issues. So I know that phase one is ongoing, phase two is on the cards, and there are new phases being added, such as on e-commerce and on women and youth. So my question to you is, has the agreement missed the boat? Or is there mm -hmm. scope to include a specific protocol, you think, on the environment or on sustainability issues in the future? Look, um, I, I agree that it would have been great to see a, a more targeted mention of issues around climate change, adaptability, sustainability, and environment more broadly. So it does look like uh, a missed opportunity. Uh, but you have to remember, Matthew, that it was already a significant development just to get the AFCFTA going, just to get uh, a trade, a free trade um, agreement on a continental basis for the continent. So that in itself is just the beginning. It doesn't mean that everything else is foreclosed. So there's nothing to prevent uh, the negotiation of a specific protocol on issues of environment. But the, the preamble does include a very broad reference to the environment as a legitimate policy objective. So that is in the agreement. And certainly the issue of mitigating climate change, I mean, these are some of the issues at the center of economic policy discussions by our state parties. So just because something might not be specifically in the agreement doesn't mean that it's not of concern to, to state parties. Um, and I know that ANCTED is doing a lot of work on this area that will actually help support um, any future protocol that might be that that might be negotiated, negotiated. But Matthew, you also have to remember that the AFCFT agreement exists in a universe of other global agreements. Simply because uh, you know state parties have signed on to the AFCFT, it doesn't mean that they have abandoned all the other international commitments uh, in this area. So nothing prevents state parties from cooperating in you know, for instance, conservation or sustainable use of wildlife trade and so on. And as I said, this is just a start. So I actually foresee that in, in the future phase, there will be perhaps a specific protocol on trade and environment. Okay, we'll hold you to that. Huh? Now, you know, the, the, the discussions this morning have been really interesting because we've really seen how many of Africa's traditional partners like the EU and, and big suppliers and lead firms are, are moving forward with initiatives like the Green Deal and including mandatory due diligence and all of this is going to have, I imagine, huge impact on African firms having continued access and new access to the EU market in particular. Uh, so I'm really curious to know how, how you in Africa as a community, the CFTA Secretariat, and even organizations like ITC and UNCTAD and others, and partners like the EU can ensure that these new standards are not a barrier to entry, but instead would be an opportunity to support the MSMEs in Africa to recognize and meet these important voluntary and mandatory sustainability standards. What do you think about that? I think this is one of those questions that you have actually answered yourself because you're absolutely right that uh, the, the Green Deal, for instance, which is very interesting. Um, I, I remember when it was announced, there was a wonderful headline uh, comparing this to, this is Europe's moment of the man on the moon, right? It, it is that, um, you know, that futuristic and that, you know, uh, 
that that's significant as a as a deal and it really is one of those once in a generation sort of opportunities as by the way is the afcfta so i think that actually the green deal might not be a barrier to entry but it might actually present a real opportunity for african countries for african exporters you know, I worked for my government uh, just before I, I arrived in, in Accra. I worked for um, the Zimbabwe government on trade and, and investment. And one of the very interesting things I discovered is that um, there is just a huge amount, just I think about 60%, I think that's the figure of arable land in Zimbabwe has not been affected by chemical pesticides. Now, what that does is that it presents a great opportunity for sustainable farming of organic uh, products, right? And there's this boom right now in, 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 in organic produce. So already the fact that we might have been behind a little bit as a nation means that we can actually leapfrog and take advantage of the fact that we can now use um, green, um, green energies and so on to, 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 to farm rather than using um, things like chemical pesticides and using fossil fuels and so on. And another fossil fuels, while, I'm, while I mentioned them, that's another leapfrog opportunity that, that's available to leapfrog out of fossil fuels to renewable energy. So it can only benefit Africa. Um, we, as you know, Matthew, we're the continent with the lowest energy access. Right, so we could actually also become not only a user of green energy, but also an exporter of green energy, or of materials that can um, enable green energy, like you know uh, minerals like cobalt and lithium and so on, which are important for um, electromobility. So I actually see this as an opportunity that is very similar to uh, mobile telephony, how the mobile tele telephone revolutionized communications in Africa. So rather than go through the process of everybody getting a landline, we're able to leapfrog that and immediately go to, to mobile phones, right? So I see um, opportunities like the EU Green Deal as an opportunity for Africa to transition and leapfrog to green energy, actually. No, I, I agree completely. But, you know, it's really, you know, you're from Africa, I'm from the Caribbean. We have very similar economic structures. And I think one thing we've been grappling with in the Caribbean, and I think is the same thing on the continent, how do we convince the small businesses that this is something they should do when you know, they have other fundamental barriers to entry, like lack of access to capital, or you know, production systems which may not be the most efficient, or an inability to connect to lead firms? How do we now tell them, we want you to invest in green technology. We want you to invest in looking at sustainability standards. How do we, how do we tell the man and woman in the field that this is something that they should be interested in? Mm, mm. No, that's that's a tough one because, as you say, it does include um, adaptability and 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 investment. But I think the key really is to present it, as I said in, 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 in the previous uh, response, to present it as an opportunity, as a market access opportunity, right? If you want to gain a particular market advantage, this is how you will, you will have to adapt. And you present it as um, a, perhaps even a once-off um, uh, investment that, that will pay off in the future. And of course, there, there, there will be need to support, um, you know, through capacity building um, and, and to support through, um, you know, impactful, impact investment, I think it's called, where you, you target uh, small uh, to medium enterprises that are doing interesting things and using, uh, you know, new technology and uh, are able to innovate their way to, you know, to improve market access. I'm not actually a business development person. So this is just me answering this question off the top of my head, my head but I, I imagine that a lot of people in the audience um, would have um, the right answers for us, Matthew. So I'd also be interested to, to hear from them. But I I think it's really a question of uh, really persuading the SMEs that uh, green technologies, that's the future, that that's the future. And um, if you want to, to harness um, the market opportunities that, for instance, the, the EU Green Deal presents, that's really the, the, the only way you, you, you can achieve that. Yeah. I mean, green, green technology is very, very important. But what's equally important, especially if you want buy-in, I believe, is supporting homegrown innovation. Mm -hmm which I think is really critical. Now, how does an agreement like the CFTA um, help support persons in Africa to harness their already incredible innovation and innovative spirit 
and to develop homegrown responses to climate change and sustainability issues? Mm, mm. Well, I, I think one of the interesting features of the agreement is that in, in those areas where it was not possible to get firm commitments, uh, for instance, on non-tariff barriers, we took the approach of harmonization and mutual cooperation. Same thing with areas of customs, for instance. Um, and, and if you look at the TBT agreement, right, um, the distinction between voluntary standards and technical regulations is a very interesting one because standards that are voluntary can eventually become mandatory and, and then become technical regulations. But I think the, the essence of it is harmonization, right? Harmonization of uh, sustainability standards, mutual cooperation. And um, it, it, this is a very interesting conversation for me, Matthew, because it's linked to the imperative of industrialization in the free trade area, in the African free trade area. And I say it's linked to industrialization because we want to, we want to make Africa attractive as a market for Africans. I mean, we we're just talking about Africans exporting, right, to Europe and so on. But primarily we want to make Africa an attractive market for Africans, right? And that means that we have to accompany open trade with industrialization. And industrialization comes with, you know, all these standards, some voluntary, and then, you know, some becoming eventually uh, mandatory um, um, regulations. So I think the key really starts with uh, state parties harmonizing their standards as much as they can, as part of, um, you know, making their, their, their products attractive to other Africans in, in the free trade area. I think that's really important because you know, as you know, you know, one of the things that we saw during COVID is um, really how 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 narrow and short supply chains can be, and how in in Africa in particular, um, you know, there were so many shortages of of things that were necessary because uh, the level of capacity and the level of industrialization wasn't there in certain products and, and services. So I think it would be fantastic if Africa were a leader in terms of green technology and green green solutions. You know, Matthew, just, just on, on that point, you know, until, um, until the COVID pandemic, um, many African countries were having to import surgical masks, right? And gloves and, you know, the PPE equipment. And, and I think one of, the, one of the effects that the COVID pandemic has had, uh, because you need these in, in massive supplies and you need them quickly, is to force countries to, 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 to manufacture these products themselves, right? To force countries to for manufacture these products. Uh, you know, Zimbabwe, as, 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 as an example, we're now making hand sanitizers and as well as, you know, um, things like that. But the question is how to, to, to ensure that those products are being manufactured in a sustainable manner, right? In a way that, uh, you know, uh, doesn't contribute to further, um, you know, uh, climate change and so on. So it's how we then industrialize in a way that is environmentally uh, friendly and impactful. No, definitely. Now, today is World Tourism Day, I believe. Um, and, you know, I've been so impressed when I've seen um, a lot of um, programs and, 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 and profiles on what Africa is doing in terms of conservation in tourism, you know, in the, in the different parks, in the different hotels. Uh, and I believe tourism is, you know, a huge priority for all African countries moving forward. Now, how does the CFDA actually help to harness that potential? Mm, yeah, so <laughs> this is one of the, this is one of the, for me, one of the disappointing areas of African integration, the fact that our tourism is actually geared at outsiders, right? So we want people to come in from Europe, from the US, from China and so on. And so we are initiating conversations in the AFCFTA about how to make Africa attractive for Africans uh, themselves. And one of them, of course, is things like um, just air connectivity. I was saying to a friend the other day that uh, I had to get home uh, urgently uh, one, one week and the cheapest connection and the easiest connection was through Dubai. Right, that, that, that can't be, you can't be flying to the Middle East to, to access one uh, another African country. At the same time, of course, we are also concerned about the environmental impact of flights and the environmental impact that tourism has. So the shorter the distances that tourists can travel, right, the, the better it might actually be. Um, so there's a whole universe of, um, 
of questions to, to answer around tourism, but I think the most fundamental one for us would be how to ensure that African tourism is attractive to Africans and not just to, you know, to, to outsiders coming in. Make sure that African tourism is also attractive to the diaspora, please, because many of us in the Caribbean would like to get over there. So we're actually working on this issue of um, flights as well. No, absolutely, absolutely. We have to find a way of connecting um, the diaspora to the motherland because, you, again, you have to fly through, you have to fly through Europe, you know, uh, to, to 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 access Africa, and that shouldn't be that shouldn't be the case at all. And I don't know, Matthew, if you know much about the Ghanaian year of return which was meant to be 2019. But I hope they have another year of return because it was a really wonderful opportunity to see so many people coming from the Caribbean, coming back home, um, you know, separated by slavery, separated by history. And yet, you know, we are the same people. So we, we really must find a way of, of, of connecting the two, uh, the, the, the African diaspora and its, and its homeland together. Actually, now that you mention that, our executive director, um, Pamela Kut Hamilton, um, last year, when uh, we saw the Ghanaian uh, delegation here, she specifically asked, when am I getting my plot of land? So indeed, I mean, we recognize the, the economic, the cultural links between, between our, our regions and our countries. Good so, for her, good for yeah. her. <laughs> so I want to just move the conversation a little bit to what's happening here in Geneva. And I'm super interested to read that new book that you have coming out. I'm sure I'm going to find a lot in there that I'm going to agree with. Uh, we're both former WTO staff members, and I, you know, once you once you're at the WTO, you never really leave. You know, I think you have a deep affinity for for what the WTO is doing, what it's trying to do. Um, but what are your views on where you see the multilateral trading agenda going right now, especially with the new Director General? And how do you think we can strengthen the synergies between what's happening multilaterally and what's happening regionally with the uh, CFTA? You know, Matthew, in addition to writing two books and uh, two plays during lockdown, because there was nothing to do but write and read, right? I, I also had the pleasure of working or consulting rather on um, Ambassador Amina Mohammed's WTO campaign. And um, I'm very glad that, you know, I'm, I'm sad that we lost, but we lost to a wonderful, wonderful candidate who is um, really um, not only making history, but also making major contributions to to, to the agenda of the WTO. And what really struck me is that almost all the candidates saw the WTO in the same way. You know, they, they, they had more or less the same concerns about where the WTO is moving. And at the center of the concerns was restoring multilateralism. All right, restoring multilateralism. And the WTO in a way you could say has been a victim of its own success. Um, it's, it's been a victim of its own success because uh, I think we became a little complacent. We began to take a lot for granted. We thought, you know, it, it was done. You know, everybody understood why a multilateral institution like the WTO was important. But then entered, you know, um, some unilateralist elements. And what I would like to see is the WTO restored to its, I can't say exactly former glory because it cannot be the same organization it was when it was established in, in, in 1995, right? But I would like to see multilateralism return to the heart of what the WTO does. And especially I would like to see the dispute settlement system active again, and especially the appellate body restored. I'm very fond of the appellate body because it was my first job in, in, in the WTO, but beyond the sort of like personal affinity for the institution, I, I also really think that to have um, uh, the WTO as the apex you know, a tribunal of, of the WTO, I think it does matter to the rule of law. And to me, that would be one of the immediate priorities that I hope will be, will be taken care of. Here, here, let's put that out into the universe. So tell me, um, if you're looking ahead 10 years from now, where would you like to see the continent and the CFTA in terms of um, trade, especially trading amongst um, itself, and also in terms of addressing climate change issues? Mm. I said earlier that uh, the AFCFTA is one of those once in a generation projects, and, and it really is. So we are at the beginning of something quite extraordinary. The idea is that by 2063, we will be a customs union, right? And I won't be here in 2063 for sure. Um, 
but we have it, this is something that we're building for our children and our children's children. I, I said um, last week in a, in another event that I really admire those French sommeliers who who lay down wine um, that they know they are not going to drink. You know, and to me that's the spirit in which we are working. We are laying down fine wine for the future, and. What I would like to see um, is really the industrial agenda at the heart of the AFCFT. I would like to see that industrial agenda take off because we cannot be trading bananas with each other, right? We cannot be trading raw materials with each other. We have to industrialize, we, we add to, to add value, but that comes with an understanding that we are no longer in 1995, we're no longer in 1980. We have to add value and industrialize in ways that ensure that um, we are taking care of environmental concerns, adapting as much uh, to green energy as much as we can, mitigating climate change in the, way, in the, in the ways that we can. So I see the, the industrialization uh, agenda that is at the heart of the AFCFT as being inextricably entwined with environmental matters and, and concerns. What do you say to, to those stakeholders who say, well, listen, um, Africa or the Caribbean or the Pacific, we've contributed very little to global warming. Um, you know, we would like to have the same opportunities as the, the more advanced countries to be able to use certain materials to, to develop or industrialize. What's your kind of lay, 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 lay person's response to that kind of rhetoric? It's the kicking away the ladder argument, isn't it? That, you know, now that, you know, certain industrialized countries have reached the peak of industrialization, they are now kicking away the ladder for, uh, for, 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 for the rest of us. Look, uh, we, we are not an unconnected world, you know, my, my short story collection is called International People, you know, and I, 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 because it's really important that we understand, and I think the COVID pandemic has really taught, taught us this, and if we are missing that lesson, then uh, I, I don't know where else we're going to get it. We cannot afford to think about uh, climate change as a Western-only agenda, because it affects us as well. I mean, the, the brilliant example that everybody uses is what's happening to Kilimanjaro. Sure, we haven't contributed as much to climate change as the rest, you know, the, the industrialized uh, West, but it affects us just as badly. And in many ways, it affects us worse because then uh, we have, then have issues of drought and so on. Um, and, you know, food security becomes a problem. So we need to do what we can to mitigate uh, climate change, even though it is true that we haven't contributed as much as we can uh, as much as we, uh, as much as others have, to um, to to the environmental degradation that has resulted in climate change. Excellent. Now, one of the things that we heard in the previous panel actually was um, that many lead firms are moving to mandate that their suppliers ascribe to certain sustainability standards. Um, do you think there's a risk there that African firms and small suppliers could just fall off of the global supply chains? The risk, the risk is there, absolutely. But I, I, I'm an optimist, Matthew. You know, you know me as a as, <laughs> as a perennial optimist. So, I prefer to see this as as an opportunity rather than a, than, than, than a barrier. So, I think if there are any ways that um, organizations such as yours, such as Ancted and others, can actually help countries uh, you know, and companies to get onto, on, on, onto the supply chain um, in ways that meet the, the, you know, the, the needs of uh, their partners. I, I think that would, be, that, that would be the way that I would, I would approach it, yeah. Well, but again, I'd have, to, I'd have to think a little bit more about this because um, I, I haven't really you know, put, given my, my, my entire uh, sort of focus and attention on, on, on this matter, yeah. Well, I hope that we will be able to partner with you and the Secretariat on that, um, both through our One Trade Africa program and through our new Green to Compete strategy, which is all about you know, building the business case for, for small businesses to, to go green, um, to make sure that they can maintain and, and increase their access to, to traditional markets and new markets. So I really hope that we have the opportunity to collaborate there. So one last question before, before we go. Um, so you've done two books and two plays, and I feel even worse now about my confinement <laughs> period, my productivity well, or lack thereof. I don't know anything about avocados, so maybe you could teach me that too. So, <laughs> <laughs> so jump forward five years. 
and you're mm. writing about, about, about Africa mm. and the future of Africa. In five years, what would you call that book? Well, it's such a beautiful title, I'm afraid that somebody might steal it. But hey, you know, good ideas are meant to be stolen, right? Um, I would call it Flesh of Sun and Flesh of Sky, because that's a, that's a line from the AU national, the AU anthem. It's a very beautiful anthem. It's a beautiful poem. And I just love that, you know, we are the flesh of sun and the flesh of sky. And it would be a book about what we are doing right and what we can do better because they just isn't, sometimes I feel that there just isn't enough good news coming out of Africa. And I, if it makes me Pollyanna, I'm very happy to be the, the African Pollyanna and cheerleader because we hear so much about what has gone wrong, but I would like to write about what is, what we, what is going right and what we can do better. Well, consider us all Pollyannas and cheerleaders because um, a lot of what we do at ITC is to showcase the brilliant talent and results um, on the African continent. So Patina, we could have spoken for hours. Um, we are really delighted that you were with us today. Um, and like I said, I know that many of my ITC colleagues want to follow up on this, this discussion with you and your, your colleagues to see how we can better support the, um, the Secretariat in implementing the agreement. Um, it's clear from what you've said that sustainability issues will have to form a key part of the implementation and that standards will be one of the primary tools to do this. So Patina, thank you very, very much. And I look forward to your new publications as well. Thank you very much, Matthew. And thank you very much to Florence and Helen and the team and everybody behind the scenes. I wasn't able to see you all in Geneva this time, but I really hope that um, we meet each other very soon. And certainly we are definitely going to be working together going forward. There's a lot that we have um, you know, to, to discuss and share and learn from each other. Thank you very much. Excellent. So folks, we are now going to break for lunch. Um, if you're here in the room, we have a light meal for you outside. If you're in Ghana, enjoy some jollof rice. If you're in <laughs> Costa Rica, have a bit of cassado. If you're in Barbados, have some flying fish. If you're in Senegal, have some caldu. If you're in Vanuatu, have a bit of lap lap. See you back here at two o'clock. Thank you. Bye bye. Well, welcome back everybody and hope you had a really nice lunch break because we had a great start to the morning and now we're heading into our afternoon session. So the role of, the role of standards in sustainable trade policy moderated once again by our very own Natalie Domeisen. So do share your questions for speakers if you're, whether you're in the chat or using the app and we'll ask several of them during the panel. Natalie, over to you. Thank you very much, Susanna, and it's a pleasure to have you here on stage with me. That's great. Uh, I'd like to say good day to everyone here in the room and for all of you tuning in from around the world. Uh, we've been looking this morning at what sustainability means in light of a pandemic, in light of climate change, in light of shifting supply chains, and we've taken a deep dive into what business and investors think about what we can do with standards to make a difference to these issues. We're now turning from business to government, the public sector, and we're going to see what they can do to speed things up, because that's what people were talking about this morning, collaboration and speeding things up. Uh, we have with us uh, the from Indonesia, live, all four of them will be online in this session. And we have online from Jakarta, the Director General of uh, International Trade Negotiations from Indonesia, and that's Jamitko Bris Wijaksono. And he has been involved in signing an agreement with 
EFTA countries, that's Switzerland, Norway, Iceland, and Liechtenstein, to export sustainable palm oil. And he's going to be telling us how that plays out in Indonesia. We also have Cécile Millot of the European Commission, who's online with us from Brussels. And she has an extensive career in uh, trade and development there and is now leading the private sector trade and investment unit at the Directorate for International Partnerships. She's going to tell us what's coming down the pike regarding the EU's work to ensure due diligence in supply chains and how standards fit into the picture and how they're going to help suppliers around the world also to do the right things as they do good business. And we have with us also from Germany, Sebastian Herold, who hails from BMZ, which is the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. Um, and Sebastian is one amazing expert on textiles and clothing supply chains. And he's behind the green button that we heard about this morning, which is, has a set of 46 very stringent criteria. Um, and it helps the garment industry to address these issues. And he'll be telling us about that. And finally, because we are the International Trade Center, and that's what we do, bring business and government together, we do have that business voice right here in the panel. And that will be Devish Dukirad, who's going to be coming in from Mauritius. He is the CEO of the Mauritius Sugar Syndicate, and he knows about risk, risk management, customer service, and negotiations like nobody's business. He's helping Mauritian's sugar producers to get products to markets like Europe, and he's already working with Fair Trade and Bon Sucre labels. And he's going to tell us, um, we hope, what those uh, EU requirements mean for him and how his sugar producers can both comply and, as we were looking at this morning, comply and compete. So let's turn first to Indonesia. And we... Um, we would like to take that question for uh, Jamitko. You signed this trade agreement that has given you incentives to be sustainable, and that will reduce tariffs by 40% um, with Switzerland and using four standards to certify compliance. And you're already one of the biggest um, producers of certified palm oil with RSPO, which is probably the biggest producer for uh, palm oil certification. So is this agreement bringing a big change for your producers or, or not? Does it give them more access? Do they have to change? Over to you. Uh, thank you, Natalie, for uh, uh, giving me a floor uh, at the first uh, chance of this uh, very important occasions. Uh, as I said, uh, this is supposed to be, uh, you know, a moment that my minister can engage with all the speaker. But then, since he got a call from the palace, so I will speak on behalf of uh, him. Uh, let me start by uh, giving you uh, the overall outset of our bilateral comprehensive economic partnership between Indonesia and uh, EFTA, European Free Trade Association. So this uh, platform is the first bilateral platform we have with the European continent. And uh, how, how uh, uh, comprehensive uh, this agreement, uh, I think with the uh, element uh, being covered from trade in goods from, uh, to trade in services, investment areas, government procurement rules and origin, as well as the trade facilitations, PBT and SPS, trade remedies, intellectual property rights, trade and sustainable development, cooperation and capacity building, as well as the competition. This is one of the most uh, sophisticated and modern uh, economic partnership we have with our uh, major trade partners. And of course, it provides a lot of uh, a meaningful outcome, not only for Indonesia, but as well as for the 
ECTA members, including Switzerland, Norway, Iceland, and Liechtenstein. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then if we look into the uh, more detail, the, this covering also the market access, uh, facilitation aspect, as well as the cooperation. So those three pillar is the main uh, avenue for everyone who engage in this partnership to take the benefits. Addressing your uh, concern, your, your question about the specific uh, issue on the uh, sustainability uh, areas uh, with regard to certain uh, market access facilitation to Indonesian palm oil product. I think uh, from our uh, point of view, uh, the facilitate the, the the facilitation given by the this agreement is quite uh, tremendous yeah, for the Indonesian uh, business people, especially who dealing with the uh, palm oil industry. Even so though you're the, saying that the agreement gives market greater market facilitation. Yes, of course, of course, definitely yes. Not only from the aspect of you know providing a lower uh, tariff uh, rate for uh, certain Indonesian mm -hmm. palm oil items, but as well as to uh, give a more opportunity for both industry to collaborate, even with the government, both government, uh, government of Indonesia and government of AFTA countries, to uh, leveling up to engage further, uh, to develop a mutual uh, a sustainable uh, cooperation. From the perspective aspects, of the, sorry, from the perspective of the standards, do you find that much is, has changed since you're already, your producers are already certified a lot? Yeah, uh, I think for that question, basically what we've been doing with uh, improving the sustainability is, is, uh, uh, is on a place, right? Even before we uh, conclude the Indonesia EFTA uh, Comprehensive Economic Partnership. So let me give you just an example that we actually started the sustainability in this area is uh, back to 2011. So this is uh, you know, a few years before we uh, negotiate and concluded our uh, SEPA with EFTA. And then it's uh, like an evolutionary uh, process. Yeah, we enhance, uh, we comprehend the sustainability aspect in our uh, palm oil industry. And it, I think uh, it goes in parallel. Yeah, uh, even though perhaps it, we also have an Indonesian sustainable palm oil, uh, which is now is mandatory for all uh, most of the uh, uh, company who plan the uh, plantation of palm oil. If this is mandatory. It's a little bit different approach with the RSPO, which is voluntary and uh, uh, driven by the, the, the market, the players. But then we also the government, the government also have initiative to make sure that this area, this industry implement uh, as much as possible, the sustainability aspect. So I think uh, in general, even though probably the Indonesia EFTA uh, said part, uh, you know, uh, I'm not saying coming late, but of course this provide also uh, a merit, yeah? a positive tone yeah? to support the uh, development of sustainability in our palm oil industry. So that, that, that's for sure. Okay, so if I understand you properly, you've been taking increasing efforts and steps towards sustainability, particularly since 2011. Um, I'd certainly heard about your efforts at the national level to ensure that um, farmers and others have information that will help them to uh, get ready in terms of the standards. And it sounds like one of the big changes is scale because this is moving from these have been some people call these voluntary sustainability standards and by using these standards and connecting it to government the voluntary part is not so voluntary anymore i think that's part of the trend that we're seeing so you are helping to 
push the pace of compliance and bring greater trust to consumers that what they're buying from you uh, is fitting one of those standards. Is that, would that be a correct summary? Yes, I think the, the government really have commitments. Government of Indonesia really wants commitments to make sure that the palm oil industry in Indonesia uh, will be at the first opportunity uh, to comply with the sustainability aspect, right? I think this is this is not only the uh, matter of uh, our business player. This is a, a responsibility of the, all the stakeholders in Indonesia, including the governments. So that's why uh, this is one of approach that I, I don't know with others uh, producing country whether the government taken uh, you know a very proactive and strong. Uh, uh, efforts uh, support in order to make sure that the industry from time to time can comply with the sustainability uh, aspect for their uh, 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 for the good for the goodness of their industry. Thank you very much. Well, and yeah. that's important what's happening in Indonesia and that you're taking that step as a government because uh, the forests you protect and the communities that you help, we may see it may seem like we're all far away but somehow we are just ever more connected and i'd like to turn more to now to cecilia from the european commission um you're with you're with an organization that is a global leader in promote promoting a cleaner environment fighting climate change addressing labor standards uh looking at corporate governance and there is a new directive coming down the pike uh, on that due diligence in supply chains. Tell us um, the impact that you're expecting from this legislation, whether it's for companies in Europe or other companies in supply chain, big buyers. What do you think? Yes, hello. Good afternoon, everybody. And, and happy to be on this panel, too, especially with um, really people on the ground and speakers uh, from Indonesia and Mauritius and so on. Uh, here, as you say, we're coming, I'm coming from the EU, uh, where it's true we have a um, high level of ambition on, on the green, uh, but also on the sort of decent work agenda. Uh, we, there is some work going on. Uh, it's true, and it's not yet, uh, it's in the making yet for having a new proposal on due diligence uh, for environment and social standards and also governance. And this is something that is uh, really, uh, we believe it would have an impact also to look at the supply chain because of course this, the plan is to make um, due diligence mandatory. Uh, I mean, a lot of companies have already put that into place based on the guidance for OECD or UN and so on. But uh, we see that in the market, still many business operators have not uh, taken that on board. So I think there's a, there's a, at our level, there's a sort of understanding that we need to do more and make that process mandatory. That's, then now, what does it mean? Of course, it means that um, it's a mandatory for EU companies to do that, but also looking at their supply chain. So it will have an impact definitely on first of the supply chain and especially uh, for the sort of commodity or raw materials that are coming from a developing country. And uh, in this way, it can really contribute also to level up the sort of sustainability standard in our partner country. But that being said, uh, we do um, we do um, recognize that uh, it is not easy to implement that, and it is something that we need to also accompany our partner country to do it, uh, because of course there's plenty of standards. You were alluding to that, plenty of of uh, of uh, different mechanisms or, or, or things to to comply with, which can be seen as costly, which are not always easy to to capture i mean to understand what they need for for especially for a small business in a developing country so we will try on our side to really develop some uh, accompanying, accompanying measures some tools that that companies can also uh take on board, use to make sure that they are compliant and they are put this due diligence mechanism into place. And so that would be really a sort of um, our, 
from, from where I'm sitting here in DG International Partnership, uh, what would be our focus to really see that this uh, new ambition of EU, EU legislation, which is going to come now as a proposal and the time it comes into implementation will still last a couple of years, but we will prepare that uh, with our partner country to make sure they understand what is there and to make sure that they have the right to also to do it. So what we're seeing is that in Europe, at least, we're seeing this uh, effort for sustainability to really not be voluntary. It's what we were a little bit what we were hearing about in Indonesia. Now we're hearing about it from you. Um, give you a question that we discussed in the business panel this morning. Um, you don't have to name names, but would you say that some standards are more helpful than others? in managing, in assessing risk, in managing risk, and in addressing these challenges? Well, that's first um, would be a sort of very difficult to, uh, question to answer in a minute because the number of standards that exist and a number of, uh, according to different sector, different product, different um, sort of angle to it, if we look more at the labor side, if we look more environment and so on. So it's, it's a complex world, I would say. ITC has done a great job uh, into mapping the standards and I mean, we've been supporting, uh, we've found the work of ITC on that. Uh, the standards map, which is really giving already a basis of okay, which are the different standards that exist and 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 uh, whether they would uh, the contents sort of um, acknowledge or certified in a way that uh, they are made as as reliable, I would say. Uh, but there is there is still I think so, some work to be done, and especially if uh, we look at um, at. Uh, the, the ambition of our proposal uh, from the EU on due diligence, it's not a sectoral proposal. So this should apply. I mean, let's see when the proposal will come out, but the ambition is that it applies across sector. And this means a lot of different, more different standards that exist and so on. Uh, and I think on this one, and that's something that is still to be uh, to be reflected and discussed also internally. But uh, I, I worked uh, before in my career on uh, the conflict mineral regulation, which was one specific regulation in one sector to look at what we do is there for uh, ensuring that the raw material and it was uh, free tea and gold, gold were sourced uh, with certain uh, conventions, certain standard um, uh, compliance, basically. And, uh, and, and to do that, uh, I mean, the idea is not to sort of um, uh, sort of uh, eliminate or don't recognize the role of standard into that. On the opposite, it's to sort of base ourselves on the standard that exists that are serious enough that has been done by companies and, and involving civil society involving others and have been uh, done for a while and seeing how the existing also standards uh, comply with the sort of uh, obligation or objectives that we set in the legislation so there is a process for example for this um, this regulation to really look at the alignment that what we call of um, of existing standards to the objective and the criteria set in the legislation. So I, I don't know if this is going to be the outcome of this uh, proposal that will come soon, because of course it's it's many sectors. It's much more complex because here we are talking about free uh, free minerals for with gold. So you can be more targeted. But there is this work to to be done to try to see build on what has been done and see if what is in the market and the standards are uh, responding to at least. Uh, the criteria and, and, and the sort of uh, objectives that uh, we have uh, settled on in, in our legislation. Um, also to mention something, because I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's important to have some concrete and practical tool into that. We've been also working with UNSC and, and yourself, ITC, to put this uh, sort of transparency and uh, traceability system in the garment sector, where we look at exactly creating a tool where for all the actors, and this has been done with business actors all together, where they would know what they have to comply with in terms of labor standards and so on, and could also share the results of the audits together and use it to sort of a uh, common platform so that as a company, you're not doing it on your own corner, but you are part of a bigger system where you can share data, share information and make economy of scales and, and, and better consistency results um, across, across the line. So thank you very much. Um, so what I hear you're saying is that change is coming and everyone is going to have to hop on board. And for those who do, 
um, manage, there'll be winners. And uh, it's interesting, you've said that it goes across all sectors, but that the garment industry is um, once again coming up as a big sector where people are singling out initiatives. That came up uh, this morning as well. And um, let's just go a little further into the garment industry since we do have a textiles expert with us. And let's turn to Sebastian. Um, you have views on standards from the perspective of the garment industry. Um, you've reminded me, and it was mentioned this morning this, as well, that there are 75 million textile workers around the world, and it's an industry which has allowed countries to power up in terms of uh, development since the Industrial Revolution. So what do you see in terms of this trend um, in terms of moving towards this mandatory due diligence legislation, do you see this leading to more use of sustainability standards by companies? Um, good afternoon, first of all, and thanks for, for having me. Um, um, yes, certainly we, we see that uh, I think um, there will be more um, uh, an increase in sustainable standards. Um, We've seen it in Germany uh, in 2017, um, we implemented the, the law on non-financial reporting, the uh, CSR Richtlinien Umsetzungsgesetz, um, <laughs> um, a very long German title. And um, that led to an increased application um, of the guidelines of the global reporting initiative. So I, I think we will see the same uh, probably um, uh, in Germany now, because basically most of you probably will know that um, our parliament uh, adopted a due diligence um, act in uh, June this year. Um, so um, that will come into place in 2023 for companies, uh, first of all, with more than 3000 employees. And by 2024 for companies with uh, more than 1000 employees. Um, and I think that will foster the question of how could we fulfill these requirements by also looking at, um, at um, standards. Um, I think what I would like to say is, um, I think they are important, but they're not per se sufficient. Um, um, and I think we just need to be aware that um, um, companies uh, cannot delegate the due diligence um, compliance for human rights um, towards standards. Um, um, so they, they are still, I mean, that's, that's the core of due diligence and that's uh, the, the, I mean, what, what John Ruggie, who unfortunately just passed away 2011, just um, brought into the world um, of really saying what, how could we define responsibilities um, of, of companies um, on a more broader scale? Yes, and you've said that these ideas about defining responsibility are just... Um, they're just coming out there. It's still relatively new to think about that across societies. The fact that this comes through the United Nations perhaps has made a difference because that does help make it more global. Um, and it's interesting also that you say sustainable standards, necessary but not sufficient condition. Um, we have Daniel, who you know, who's in the room with us. And this morning he was saying definitely um, it's not just about audits, you have to go out there and forge uh, relationships with people and build this sense of shared responsibility. Are you seeing that from more people like uh, Daniel and do you feel like the, um, the laws that you're putting out there are helping to spur this? Particularly in textiles, let's say, because that's your area. Well, it's probably too early to say, I mean, like, but I think there are signals uh, kind of showing in this direction. And one of the signals we saw that um, throughout the pandemic, uh, the li like the last two years, um, a lot of the companies that have a very strong relationship between, with, with their suppliers just got better through the crisis. Um, so there is something in the connection between uh, the company and the suppliers um, that also can help help crisis situation and basically um, uh, due diligence is uh, is about risk management um, from both sides. Um, Did you so say it I, got better? That relationships got better during the pandemic with suppliers? No, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't say that the the relationship got better. But I think there's like we saw that companies that have had a really long term and stable relationship uh, with their suppliers got better through the time of pandemics. That's what I wanted to say. So relationships matter, is yeah. what you're saying. Obviously, like in so many things in life. Um, 
Let's talk a moment about this Green Button Initiative. Great name, of course, for starters, which matters. And um, it's a government-run textile label designed to inspire trust in consumers. It's got 46 uh, very stringent criteria to fulfill that address issues from wastewater to forced labor. And um, would you see other countries who might be listening in, particularly other governments, of course, every country has a different context, but would you see that as a model that other people could use? Well, but let me maybe first explain a little bit more about what the Green Button really is, um, because it's a, it's a national initiative and most of you being uh, from abroad wouldn't know Green Button. We're just about to kind of get a little more known in, within Europe at least. Um, um, I think the history is that it's it's something for the consumers to give orientation, um, um, and I mean I had a look at, at your great public uh, publication from ITC showing the rise uh, of numbers in in um, uh, uh, sustainable standards in the, within the last twenty years, and that's what we see in the textile market in Germany as well. We've got over forty um, different standards with very different um, uh, histories and very different um, uh, focus. Um, and um, it really lacked orientation for consumers. Often within our ministry, we've got a lot of visitors and we do talk about things that, um, that matter in partner countries because I'm talking from the perspective of the development um, cooperation ministry. And they ask, what can I do in, in the textile sector? And um, we came up with something in cooperation with the ITC standards map, which is called Siegel Klarheit or Label Clarity. Um, it's, a, it's a comparison tool, but we saw that it, like that it was nice it was good click rates but it was it stayed something for uh, consumers that are already quite well informed and um, so in 2019 two years ago we came up with this green button initiative um, as we knew that there's lots of good um, quality um, uh, um, sustainable standards out there in the textile market um, we choose a meta label approach saying um, basically as a, as the government or as the state we say we do the sorting process for the consumers and um, uh, we have certain criteria for the product um, um, uh, line of the, of, the, of the product and all the uh, standards that fulfill this criteria um, are kind of uh, accepted by us. But I think the, the achievement or I, I think the, um, is more that we have due diligence criteria. I think that's where we see the future. I mean, that's what basically is uh, the implemented law um, in Germany It's about um, so we've got 20 um, due diligence criteria that need to be uh, fulfilled by the companies first, just to be sure that it's not only one product line going through being green, but that the whole company somehow has a setting where we say, okay, they do care along their supply chain for, for what human, um, human rights and uh, environment is about. Um, and only after they fulfill this, um, then they, the company can, can kind of um, certi certified and can do business with Green Button. Mm -hmm. And I think this is certainly a model where I think um, to integrate more due diligence in, in, uh, in uh, standards, um, that's going to be the future. I mean, that's what we're seeing already. And I think to do it from the state side is also paying off as we see in the race of numbers of uh, companies that actually kind of have uh, the Green Button certification. So for people around the world who are looking for um, thinking about these kind of things, you can see we have an expert here who could maybe tell you a little bit more. But I think you would say that, and maybe you've already said, it's part of a smart mix, but it's not the whole, the whole thing. What else do you see in the smart mix that's going to get us to where we want to be to raise the bar in terms of environmental and social issues in what we uh, produce and consume? Well, I, I think it's always, I mean, like, I mean, this is how politics work. You come up with something uh, new and then you criticize because people fear that you kind of would take something else away because you put something new in. Um, and we never, as a ministry, as BM said, we never said so. Um, we always talked about a smart mix, that you need a smart mix of voluntary and mandatory um, measurements um, to kind of really make achievements. And so we have, we started in the textile market um, with the um, uh, textile um, partnership uh, initiative in 2014, just with the, the, the uh, catastrophic images from Rana Plaza, which is um, 
the, this partnership is like basically a, a multi-stakeholder initiative to to commonly raise or talk about um, raising the standards. Um, and then we have the green button, and now we've got the law as well. So this is like what we think um, as a as a smart mix, at least um, for Germany, it just uh, does make a lot of sense to so combine structured those structured forums for business government dialogue, and then the specific. Um, really thought through initiative, uh, which is the green button, and then the broader due diligence things. Are you saying that's pretty yeah. much the trio? Yeah. I'm learning along with all of you. Thank you so much. And um, let's hear from uh, Devish now, who is um, managing the work of many producers in Mauritius. Uh, through the Mauritius Sugar Syndicate. And uh, what's your business reaction? Um, what's the impact of what you see uh, developing here? What's it going to be for your sugar suppliers? Oh, you're on mute, I think. Is that okay? Tally? Now we hear you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, ITC, for organizing this forum and for invitation of an opportunity given to us to share our views. Well, actually, in, uh, with respect to the sugar industry, so the Mauritius sugar industry, we have a commercial arm of the sugar industry in Mauritius. We sell all sugar produced locally, which is more an export-oriented industry. 90% uh, of our production is geared, being geared toward export. And um, just briefly to give you a background, so we are currently selling sugar to some 50 countries worldwide. Uh, half of our production going to Europe, where traditionally Europe used to be the main export destination for our sugars. And uh, so indeed, uh, coming to your question, uh, there is an increasing demand for sustainability standards, for complying with sustainability standards. But I should say that uh, the advantage we've had in Mauritius, uh, first of all, the, being an island, and be an island which is very much geared towards the tourist industry. A lot of tourists coming to Mauritius for the for the for the scenery, for the blue lagoons. So you said storage. Uh, no, no. I, what I'm saying, being an island, an island mm -hmm. with uh, being geared towards uh, the tourist industry, uh, mm -hmm. people coming to visiting Mauritius for the lagoons, the blue lagoons, the, the green scenery. So obviously. We have always been very, uh, very. Um, we we have always been very respectful of the environment. So we respect with respect to the environment. I think even before these standards came into play, we have uh, always been uh, putting a lot of emphasis with respect to uh, preserving the environment. And even when it comes to to labor standards, Mauritius has always been compliant with uh, the standards, uh, international standards no child labor, no forced labor, et cetera, et cetera. So even before the standards came into force, I would say in the sugar industry over the last five to 10 years, I think Mauritius, the industry was already perceived as being a sustainable origin. And I can safely say that we have many buyers who have been working with us for many decades now. And uh, through the brand, they could easily comfort their buyers, their own buyers in their respective countries, that the sugars were being produced from a from an origin which was which is sustainable, right? So, but do you think the changes are going to? Um, there, it's not going to be hard in terms of the feeling and the brand. Your there's sustainability. Yeah. You're saying is anchored there, but there's still an awful lot of work to do. There's paperwork. There's relationships for. Um, even if you have those relationships with suppliers, will that be changing? Will it get tougher? Yes, it will. What will change is that uh, we need to abide by certain standards, independent standards, which might not might be costly at some point of time, costly and confusing as well for our producers. So, just to repeat myself, we have been perceived as being a sustainable origin, but with these different standards, what makes things complicated? First of all, there are certain certain standards being imposed which are not necessarily practical. They, they increase the cost of production. And as you know, very often these standards, they don't come with a, with a, with a financial benefit. And the fact that sugar in particular, it's a, a very political uh, 
uh, environment in which we operate, bearing in mind that many, many producers, they give uh, subsidies, they give support to their producers. So we have a global price of sugar, which is highly distorted. So there's already a challenge of sugar producers getting revenue, which they will, will allow them to cover their, their operational costs. Now with these new standards coming up, with the cost associated, first of all, to adapt to these standards and the cost of certification itself, obviously it makes things more complicated. And where things get also complicated, we have different standards. Well, in the case of sugar, for instance, we are already uh, certified fair trade. You mentioned it in your introduction. We also we also certified bond sucrose. But you have on and off other buyers coming up with different standards. And obviously, it's the question of we have to assess whether it makes sense to abide or not. But I think what what would be important is to have an alignment of these different standards, just to make things simpler. I think it's. It, it's okay to abide by this standard, but it's necessary to have an alignment and to ensure that the, uh, you know, each country has its own uh, specificities to ensure that we can, uh, we can easily live with these standards without putting too much burden on the production side. So um, you are saying that some standards are more practical than others. That magic word alignment uh, keeps coming up today. It sounds like a lot more dialogue is needed and that the standards are not standards. Again, they can't manage everything. We've been hearing that throughout the day. If you have, um, if you have to manage risk related to price, that's not something that um, the standards can easily um, help you with. So it, again, um, I would say from here, if you see those kind of things potentially um, needing some kind of alignment, what would you ask um, the European Union, since we have a representative here who's with us in the panel, what, is there something that they can do to help your suppliers uh, prepare a little bit more? Well, certainly, I think Cecil mentioned about the accompanying measures, which would be most welcome, and in technically and probably financially as well. And uh, just to reiterate that uh, sugar prices, even in Europe, very often are below production cost levels, but we have seen over the last few years after the liberalization of production quotas. So certainly we need to, to, uh, to, to motivate, to encourage the producers to get on board. And I can tell you, it's been a challenge. Uh, well, when we start, started with the certification in Mauritius for sugar, we started with fair trade. It doesn't have years ago. With fair trade. <laughs> Fair trade. The good thing about fair trade, at least there's a premium, a premium of $60 per ton of sugar, which is paid, which is like a, like an incentive right, to get the smaller growers to get involved on it. But the paradox is that um, the fact that sugar prices themselves are very often below production cost level. So you could be having this, that premium of $60, but it doesn't suffice to ensure the economic sustainability of the producers. So what we have seen over time, people are interested, but nevertheless, when we look at what the price they are obtaining for their sugar, in addition to the $60 premium, we just think, feel that uh, it, there's no sense in pursuing. Maybe, well, that's the case, I believe, not only in Mauritius, in other countries, uh, what we call- And other issue. sectors. Uh, other Coffee, sectors, well, let's talk perhaps. more about, about sugar itself, but other countries which have had preferential access to the European market, for instance, uh, countries in the Caribbean, uh, Fiji, other countries like that. But, well, we had a comfort zone, I should admit, at that time during the sugar protocol when we had guaranteed prices. But then when uh, we became exposed to the world market price volatility, things have been very challenging. So if I just give you some figures in Mauritius, the, the, the production, the area under, under cane over the last 10 years has decreased by 25%. So people are abandoning sugarcane cultivation because it is just not viable economically. So what I want to say is you have these standards, obviously it will not assure the economic viability of industry. But on the other hand, where I believe we need to reflect more is Talking about sustainability to ensure an industry remains sustainable with respect to environment, labor standards, et cetera. It's a good thing, but we should also think about the economic sustainability. Right. Going back to those basics, we've been pushing a lot on environmental and social because we need it, but it does have to be in context with economic. 
Uh, I think with this, we could turn to Susanna, who has been uh, collecting questions from the audience, I believe. And we have a little time left, not a lot. So please uh, tell us your questions. And for the panelists, try to be on point with your answers. We have 18 minutes. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, thank you, Natalie. Can you hear me? Can all of you hear, you hear me? Okay. Yes. So the first okay. question is for Cecilia and Sebastian, please. And the question is, do you think because of the need to comply with new due diligence procedures, companies would end up preferring to work with big suppliers rather than small ones? Um, how about Devish first? It was for Devish and this was for Cecilia and Sebastian. Oh, sorry, Sebastian. Okay, let's go to Cecilia first. Sorry. Yeah, I can try briefly. Uh, no, that, that's a good question. Um, I guess also the idea there is if you have a bigger company, they may comp or bigger suppliers, they may comply better uh, with the standards. Uh, but hopefully that's what we, we don't want that to happen, uh, clearly not. Uh, that's why it's very important to have the right tools for SMEs so that they can also know how to comply with the legislation and make it life as part of, of the organization and for the suppliers. So that's a very good risk and a very good point, a risk indeed, but something that we, we, we do not want to, that to happen. And the importance of having really traceability tools uh, in different sectors. I talked before about the, the rules that has been done for the textile, textile industry. And now what we are looking at is seeing as this work which has been done uh, to benefit all businesses. So basically any textile, textile supplier can have access to this tool and can see what it means for him, for, for its business to sort of comply with the standards and also get the results of audits from other company and get these resources uh, to him in an easy way. Uh, but we are looking into looking at other sectors. So we are currently doing a sort of an assessment of saying in which other sector there is appetite to do this work and to have some common tools and easy tool for all, all to use, uh, especially the smallest business. And we would, uh, it's clear from our perspective, from Digi Impact perspective, support more this, uh, the smaller one, uh, which needs more assistance maybe uh, than, than the bigger one. So we'll pay specific attention to it. Okay. Sebastian, uh, this, the German case. Yeah. <laughs> I think what I can add is some experience from the uh, two years of Green Button um, certification, because basically we are credit, credit, crediting um, and auditing due diligence um, through the supply chain. And um, we are not doing that only for bigger companies, but also for smaller companies and see that it's possible. Um, so um, I, I think um, the Green Button Initiative serves for us. It also is like a, a piloting um, exercise to see um, kind of who's able and who, who needs what in order to kind of uh, fulfill the criteria. Um, and certainly we see the risks that, that in the end, um, uh, bigger companies um, might be have like more resources to just um, uh, um, deal with it. But um, um, certainly we have different initiatives also on the ground where we um, hope that they do have uh, um, um, they're supporting um, small and medium sized um, companies. Uh, one is, for example, just to mention one is the Alliance for Product Quality in Africa, uh, which we just established um, in order to, to help there. Okay, next question, Susanna. Thank you both for those answers. The next question is, what can be done to change sustainability standards so that com companies can better comply with them in light of these gr growing due diligence regulations? Who would like to take that question? I can give it a go, Natalie. Please, Devish. Yeah. Well, I think first of all, it's a question of a need having a needs assessment to better understand the industry, the way they are operating. Um, probably I could share an experience. Eh? What we have realized is increasingly uh, having that close relation with the buyers in the destination market. Uh, so we, we better understand what are the, the requirements of, of the producers in the developing countries, and whereby accordingly we, we can uh, we can we, we can uh, cater for the needs of these companies to become sustainable. For instance, uh, we had a project over the last five years 
with uh, the sugar buyer, well, the producer of uh, sugar containing goods, Ferrero. Um, I'm sure most of you have, word, have heard of a name. So Ferrero, but they, they buy something like 500,000 tons of sugar yearly. So they came up with a project, a sustainable development project with a group of producers in Mauritius. And uh, they appointed project managers here on site to understand what is the need of, their, of these buyers and accordingly to cater to the needs of these producers, of the farmers. So every year we came up with, um, with, uh, with plants, with different projects, how to assist these producers, these planters to become sustainable. So, so I think- That assessment very, sounds very important on the ground. Again, going back to building, building those relationships between the suppliers and the buyers, you're saying. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. Susanna? Yes, next question. Uh, kind of going back to the beginning of our conversation, is the example of the EFTA agreement with Indonesia, specifically on imports of sustainably certified products at a reduced tariff rate, something that is replicable in the EU? So that's for our Indonesian uh, expert. Okay, yes, uh, I think uh, what we really expect by having this uh, Indonesia as the uh, partnership platform, including how we can work together to develop a mutual uh, cooperative enabling sustainability between uh, the two sides, something that we, of course, we really would like to see from uh, other uh, direct partner, including our uh, negotiating partner, uh, probably EU is one of the uh, uh, one of uh, the biggest our trading partner. I just would like to touch upon on uh, what what is the, the the state right now after we having the signing and uh, and ratifying uh, this agreement. So, uh, for instance, with the Switzerland government, now we are trying to develop uh, ordinance, right? And this instrument uh, substantially will be, uh, you know, uh, a foundation for, for, uh, for both countries, for both sides to uh, cooperate uh, more intensively to enhance the uh, mutual recognition of the existing uh, sustainability scheme. So we have the initial sustainable palm oil and then Switzerland also uh, uh, setting and implementing certain uh, and accepting certain uh, sustainable palm oil, including the RSPO. So by having this ordinance, uh, those side, uh, both sides, of course, will uh, <coughs> try to, how to say, to, to harmonize Mm -hmm. to harmonize everything that we have. So in order to facilitate further and uh, give a more uh, further opportunity for innocent palm oil that already been you know, certified as sustainable palm oil, uh, either from ISPO or ISPO, so they can uh, get uh, more access into the uh, Switzerland market. So I think this is a very good uh, example. Uh, we certainly, uh, this is something that we still continue to enhance with our uh, partners, uh, uh, whether partners that already been, you know, uh, have a uh, agreement, a platform, even with partners like in EU or other, uh, our negotiation partner. So this is uh, my, my uh, perspective. So if I understand correctly, um, this mutual recognition that you have going on and the understanding based on this agreement, um, in a way it's, it's a precursor for what could possibly be extended from EFTA countries to the EU or perhaps others. Cecile, do you have a, any thoughts on that? Uh, or is that maybe a little far away because, I don't know, because it's sustainable palm oil and the agreements with EFTA. Do you think that what the work that's going on there is something that could be extended in terms of partnerships with the EU? Mm -hmm. 
Well, that's I, essentially I, the question that we have coming from the audience. Exactly. No, 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 exactly. No, that's, that's a good point. Uh, to be honest, I didn't know. I, I learned about this uh, partnership uh, being done by the, between uh, in the FTA, Switzerland and Indonesia. I, I was not aware myself, but I'm not, I'm no longer, I used to work in DigiTrade uh, before and I'm now working in DigiInpa. So this is things we follow a little bit less, sort of what are the trade negotiation, having that uh, incorporate. But I, 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 I was... I was really pleased to hear that from, from the colleagues and to hear that they have put something in there in in uh, in, um, in, uh, in the trade agreement. I know we are also the EU uh, negotiating with Indonesia or at least uh, uh, looking into the perspective of negotiating for an FTA. So I don't know exactly. I cannot really answer. The question is whether this is discussed. Maybe maybe uh, my colleague from Indonesia would know we more. Don't know. But I mean, yeah. this is something that is an interesting concept. I need to see. How, how it can be implemented because it's, it's very nice to have it of course in a trade agreement then it's it's a sort of how you implement that and make it happen yes and it's all very new of course voila uh, and how you you do that especially what we have in the eu of course it's like to, how do you control that at the border how your customs are, are making sure that uh, they can recognize and they have the right tool to know what would be the sustainable by home or not but uh, all this question i think is 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 is, is complex uh, quite technical but complex but worth worth looking because i think this is at least um, a very good uh, uh, I mean, interesting model, interesting idea to, to see uh, what, what we can uh, learn from it. Okay, thank you. Um, Susanna, I think we have time for another, one or two more questions. Okay, let's go with, we have one more left, I think. Um, so we've seen governmental due diligence regulation kind of making a stronger case for VSS, for voluntary sustainability standards, making them almost involuntary at this point, as we discussed. But is there anything being considered on the governmental front to regulate these schemes and to unify them and establish them under you know, one umbrella? Oh, gosh. OK. That seems like it's more for our panelists who are coming from Europe. Um, Sebastian, we'll let you go first. Uh, um, I, Not another difficult question coming from yeah. the audience. Thanks. I, I, I think um, certainly we see the profit proliferation um, there, um, and I talked about it. And um, there's like this uh, kind of one answer from our side um, with the meta label approach. Um, um, I, I think um, certainly that can't be the only answer. And um, I, I mean, like probably CC can talk about um, the green claims, claims initiative that they have in, on the European scale. So I think um, Europe is aware of, um, that um, we somehow need further uh, requirements because um, it's just too much out there. Um, but it's not an easy task. And I think um, I don't know about any initiative that um, that kind of goes beyond, um, um, like from, from the German perspective at least, um, that goes beyond what we're doing with uh, the media label approach. Cecile? Yeah, I, I think this is a key question. So how you, you just get uh, this standard into something maybe more harmonized, if I understand where is the question. Uh, this is difficult because I think also uh, the fact that you have standards and they are done by businesses uh, together with some stakeholders and so on, it's also nice because it means that you uh, you have a sort of emulsion that people wanted to, to define what it means for them and try to make it um, implementable and try to, to to use that. Then, of course, there's a risk of of this uh, being diverse and divergent in content, or like difficult to 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 have your way through. So that's why I was talking earlier about the sort of alignment uh, sort of model, which we have used in, at least in one of the regulation. So to try not to kill too much the energy of of the industry and other player to sort of create standards that could just be useful for for business and operator and suppliers to to uh, to um, to use, but at the same time guaranteeing a certain level of uh, yeah of um, 
compliance or seriousness about what what they should be so that's that's the trick and that's the sort of mechanism that needs to be put in place uh, and and something that we'll certainly look into uh, when now we're going to implement this new proposal when the new proposal will come out and how we're going to implement it to make it pragmatic and to also uh, build on what exists already but with a certain uh, i would say spin so I think what we're hearing is that magic word alignment coming back over and over again. How it's done is the challenge. Um, we really only have about three minutes left, two, three minutes left. And if you had to have one message around alignment, if we say that's it, uh, or shaking things out, streamlining them, what would it be? Uh, let's start with Cecile. Um, it's not easy. I would say definitely this alignment of this sort of things needs to be done together. So it needs to be done also with partnership, uh, with a pinch, pinch of realism, and with a very easy, easy to um, easy way for for businesses and suppliers to find their way into it. Okay, uh, Jamitko, how about you? Yes, in terms of alignment. Yeah, I think a lot of things actually can be done. But if I may to say a couple of things, probably uh, uh, to understand the pragmatic uh, situations, to create a balance, equitable, meaningful for both sides, will be very uh, helpful to develop, to enhance the cooperation to develop the you know the harmonized sustainability uh, among the you know uh, multi uh, stakeholder uh, on on many areas. Okay. Thank you, uh, Sebastian. Well, I think aligning um, uh, due diligence criteria um, uh, into uh, incorporating more into this uh, standards aspects is something that I think could make a difference um, as an overarching um, uh, guidance. Um. Alignment on due diligence. And Devish, over to you. Yeah. I think uh, the sustainability standards are already regrouped in the platform called uh, ISEAL, uh, which could be the right platform. Yeah, I shall, to ensure an harmonization of its different standards. But on the other hand, I would like to emphasize that very often when we talk about sustainability, the whole focus is on producers. And I think we need to look at the whole supply chain. And I think, uh, as Cecile just concluded, I think I would reiterate on that, it's important to have a very close working relation between the producer in the developing countries and the buyers. Uh, along the ensure, supply chain. Along, all along the supply chain. Thank you very much. And with that, uh, a heartfelt thank you to each of you for sharing your views today in what is a really fast-changing field. And uh, I'm sure the audience thanks you as well. Uh, and now I turn it to Susanna. Okay. Thank you very much, Natalie. And thank you to our speakers for kind of bringing home and making practical the idea of aligning sustainability standards with trade policy. So we appreciate your time. Thank you so much. And now we welcome a special keynote statement by His Excellency Kirk D. M. Humphrey, who is the Minister of Maritime Affairs and the Blue Economy from Barbados. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to address the International Trade Center's Trade for Sustainable Development Forum on behalf of the government and people of Barbados. This forum is very critical in helping countries find solutions to the unprecedented economic, health, and environmental challenges being faced globally. The two issues of immediate concern being climate change and, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic. These twin crises call for urgent and extraordinary responses to ensure the prosperity of our countries and people for future generations. I address you this morning not simply as a representative of the government of Barbados, but as a person from the perspective of a citizen of a small island developing state. States are constrained by the inherent characteristics of small open economies, high indebtedness, reliance on imports, 
and limited diversification and fiscal space. If left unchecked, the additional effects of climate change and the COVID-19 pandemic will be crippling to our economies. The Caribbean region's largest resource base is its coastal and marine assets. The World Bank has estimated that the oceans contributed over $400 billion to the Caribbean's blue economy. This is why Barbados took the innovative decision to establish a specific Ministry of Maritime Affairs and the Blue Economy, for which I now have the privilege to be the minister. This highlights how critical the blue economy is to Barbados and how fundamental it is for the region to address head-on issues of sustainability, linkages with the green economy, and how to leverage our ocean resources for economic gain in a manner that respects our biodiversity and implements a regime of good governance of Barbados's maritime space and marine resources. This is in an effort to ensure sustainability and resilience, and a reduction in the vulnerability to which environmental threats now plague the Caribbean region and expose all of us on our development path, whether it be economic or social. Barbados, like its neighbours, has maintained a strong relationship with the sea, with many making their livelihoods from this vast expanse of water in fisheries, water sports, beach tourism, and others. Furthermore, more than half of our population reside within two kilometers of the coast, and much of our critical infrastructure, including water, electricity, natural gas and telecommunications, transportation nodes, commercial health, education, and government facilities, can also be found in our very near coast. This is a delicate balance that we must sustain, and any change can upset that balance. The advent of climate change has clearly demonstrated that this is our reality. Caribbean nations have found themselves struggling economically as a result of rising sea levels, declining fish catches, reef damage, more regular and intense storms, the influx of sargassum seaweed that threatens to destroy our beaches, its fish, our tourism industry. All of these things have adversely affected our traditional productive sectors. Meanwhile, COVID-19's direct impact on our largest sector, tourism, has led to disruption in transport services, significant loss of earnings, and business closures. In fact, it has led to almost the total decimation of a significant amount of resources and the people who require the success of tourism to be able to earn a livelihood in this country. It is, however, not enough to catalogue the negative impact that climate change and COVID-19 has wrought on our economies. We must also adapt. We must seek opportunities. We must be innovative and we must discover the yet untapped potential in our native ecology so that our economies may thrive without depleting or wasting our very limited resources. A sustainable ocean economy has the potential to transform the lives of all of our communities. In my ministry, we have been doing our part to rise to this challenge by implementing, among others, measures to protect our marine environment and strategies to strengthen our fisheries sector. Recently, Barbados launched its Integrated Coastal Zone Management Plan, which not only aims to protect the environment, but ensures that the environment continues to be resilient, sustainable, and viable. We also feel the urgency for small island developing states such as ours to move toward more sustainable trade to preserve the economy. One such sector that can benefit from such a move, we believe, is the fishery sector. The fishery sector is traditionally an area of significant economic growth and job creation, with several types of small businesses involved, including harvesting, processing, retailing, and wholesaling. Distribution as well, fish export, we're looking at boat building as well as repair. My ministry is in the process of looking at strategies to sustainably develop this sector. Most of the trade conducted thus far is domestic, with tuna being the main export. We need now to take this to the next level by ensuring that we develop this economic activity and increase trade with existing and prospective partners. And when we do so, we have to ensure that it is done sustainably 
and in line with existing sustainability standards. We have embarked on a program of legislative reform and upgrade of our plant and operations to ensure that food products are processed and sold in accordance with international food and safety requirements and standards set by bodies such as the European Union, the World Trade Organization and the FDA Food and Safety Modernization Act. We have also invested significantly in technology that would expand the opportunities available to the fishing community, such as the deployment of fish aggregating devices known as FADs and the application of intelligent oceanographic solutions for efficient and sustainable fishing. It is also hoped that we can expand the boat building industry eventually, growing it into a major export industry and expand into aquaculture as well as mariculture. ITC set a strategy, work and export potential mapping will be very useful to us as we go forward. If we want to develop product, strengthen market access, improve environmental sustainability and enhance investment opportunities, we must ensure the fisheries value chain is sustainable. As small economies, we recognize that voluntary sustainability standards, VSS, are a key tool for sustainable trade and assessing new markets. But there are legitimate concerns that micro, small and medium enterprises may experience severe challenges in identifying and participating in the adoption of VSS as a result of the high cost of participation and implementation. The lack of technical capacity is also a challenge in this matter. And while I recognize that the Caribbean regional body, CARICOM, is strengthening its trade-related quality infrastructure and developing trade capacity to enable sustainability standards, individual governments must play a critical role in building their capacity and regulatory structures. This can be a very challenging and expensive task. And this is where I strongly believe that partnerships with organizations such as the ITC are so important in helping us to identify implement and monitor these standards. However, like all developing countries, the major challenge facing Barbados is financing. This has become even more critical as we sought to effectively battle the COVID-19 pandemic. The cost of providing vaccines as well as additional medical resources seemingly on a daily basis has been, as you would appreciate, astronomical. This is not just our story. This is the story, really, of the world. But the effects of this, combined with climate change, has been extremely challenging. Our region has experienced an increase in destructive hurricanes for the season. And there is a sobering report of the IPPC, which makes it very clear what the effects of rising sea levels will be on island states such as ours. So this is not just theory, my friends. This has now become our lived reality. We need global recognition of our vulnerabilities and solutions that allow us to access concessional finance from global financial institutions. We can no longer be assessed only by our GDP per capita. There is a need to understand, and we make this point strongly every time we speak, that there is a need to understand vulnerability beyond just that one simple GDP index. Barbados will continue to make its voice heard on issues of sustainability, climate change, and resilience. And we will continue to harness the benefits of our blue economy and our marine resources in a sustainable manner. But we need the global community to accompany us on this journey and jointly develop or adapt existing financing and capacity building models so that smaller states may benefit from the necessary financial and or technical assistance that would put us on the road to sustainability. So these, my friends, are the opportunities. These, my friends, are the challenges. And I hope I've been able to offer some fodder for you to feed on that would allow us to solve some of these very complex challenges. I thank you for your time and I wish you all the best in your deliberations. Thank you very much.
Well, uh, welcome back uh, to the Tiferesi Forum this afternoon session, uh, sitting between you and the coffee break. Uh, we'll make it entertaining. We have uh, an exciting title, Looking into the Crystal Ball. Looking into the Crystal Ball is kind of a, a fancy concept. And when I, when I try to look into a crystal ball, and I'd like all of you to try to do the same, feature the ball in front of you. And there are a few things a little bit blurry within the bowl, um, telling you about the future, your future, the future of the planet, future of the society. What I can see from this virtual crystal ball in front of us is primarily something with three floating ideas. First one being the pandemic and the post-COVID world in which we will be entering soon. And by post-COVID, I don't mean a world without COVID, a world with COVID and we work with it. But there is something here that the crystal ball will have to address. How do we enter this new world, this new post-COVID world? And sustainability standards, what is the role they may have to play in this new world? So the crystal ball and this first little cloud let's say a certain color here with the post-COVID question mark. A second one would be about the new regulations, legislations coming in. We heard from the previous panels, all of these new legislations coming up, the due diligence, human rights, things like, okay, governments are really come and push the bar in a certain direction. And so again, the same question mark appears above the crystal ball. What does that really mean for sustainability standards and global value chains actors? So that is very much an issue that is, that is there floating around the crystal ball. As a third point, um, there would be this kind of a sense of panic, a sense of emergency, a sense of headless chicken trying to tackle the climate change issue. When we look back in the first editions of the T4SD Forum, or even before 10, 20 years, sustainability was kind of a nice and soon to become buzzword, but it would be, okay, fine for the next generations. Maybe not for right now. But today, 2021, we are there. The issue is here. The pandemic is there. And the sustainability crisis and climate change in particular is really something that is happening right now. So this crystal ball has to answer some critical questions about all of these points. And so I'm extremely dis delighted to have on the panel with me today those experts that know so much about the history of the movement of sustainability and standards uh, in particular. So we have Patrick Mallet from ICL Alliance. Patrick, welcome to the panel. Thank you for being with us. Um, Patrick founded ICL Alliance a few years back, but now you come up with 20 years of experience in advising leading sustainability standards, advising them in innovating every day in terms of handling sustainability and achieving their impacts. Thanks, Patrick, for being with us. Um, also, we have Rigid from the CRB in India. Rigid, thank you for bringing uh, to this panel your experience in working in developing countries, uh, discussion, advocacy, policy, and seeing where linkages might be between sustainability private standards and the policy world and regulation. So looking forward to hearing your, your views on this. On the panel as well, welcome Richard. Richard is calling in from Kenya. Uh, he's representing uh, the KFC and floriculture standards. You have the voice of SMEs. You know what is working in Africa. And the big question about accessing standards, accessing markets, and dealing with those sustainability challenges is very much at the core of your experience. So again, here, very much looking forward to hearing you about how the future could look like for those SMEs in Africa and in Kenya in particular, dealing with standards. Um, Jane, thanks also for being with us on the panel. Jane Duncan, uh, Director of Operations from Sci Platform. Um, Sci Platform will soon complete 20 years of experience. There is a lot of learnings and experience in this industry platform where big competitors and brands are meeting and yet working together to achieve some sustainability meta goals. So thanks 
all of you for being uh, with us today. I will first turn to you, uh, Patrick, the, the floor, and give you the floor, and ask you in terms of your position as Director of Innovations at IC, you certainly have witnessed innovations, and innovations that are actually paving the road towards the future. So we'd love to hear your views about this and how the future looks like for sustainability standards that dare to innovate. Thanks, Mathieu, and uh, it's nice to see everyone and to have this opportunity. Um, it, you know, it, it seems like on the panel we have a lot of, a lot of us thinking and working with standards. Twenty years of uh, in different initiatives. It is really twenty years in which the movement grew up. It's, uh, uh, you know, to think back to the the origins of ICL and and think about how when sustainability standards first came together, it was very much about. Um, legitimacy and acceptance were these even a thing and and over those first 10 years you know building up the the recognition and awareness and legitimacy really felt like uh okay these these systems have arrived these are tools that can actually start to deliver on some of those critical global challenges that you talked about Matthew. and uh and it's been in these last 10 years where we have really started to see such innovation you know there Sustainability standards are no longer just standards and certification. Um, I think that's the one critical point I would make is that uh, these are primarily mission-driven organizations. These are organizations that fundamentally are about trying to shift the needle to, to transform sectors to sustainability. And in doing so, certification has served a useful role. It's been a tool that, uh, that recognizes good performers, that provides market incentives for others to uh, improve their practices, uh, but it hasn't been sufficient. It's certainly no silver bullet. Um, and many sustainability standards are recognizing this and, and stepping back from just seeing their role as implementing certification to uh, looking at different strategies that are applicable in different contexts to, to really try to drive transformational change, whether that be at a sector level or in a geography or um, with different stakeholders. And, uh, and so what we start to see over the last five to eight years is, um, is the introduction of new strategies of thinking about uh, how can sustainability standards as conveners play a, a significant role in bringing stakeholders together to, to motivate collective action. Um, we see them working as, uh, as capacity building organizations, as having that, that uh, extensive network of contacts and, and experts uh, across the, uh, the sourcing regions and, and really looking at how can they build the capacity of local stakeholders and, and local technical experts. And we see them engaging with government. And you, you mentioned this. I, I think, you know, it's, it's funny to see this come back around where um, over the 20 years, initially, uh, sustainability standards were very much seen as a, a tool to fill a regulatory gap to, to say, well, um, if government isn't going to address this sustainability question, I guess we need to. And, and now seeing governments coming back into the fray and, and taking sustainability as seriously as, as many other stakeholders, it's really great to see that uh, voluntary standards and, um, and regulatory instruments working together, whether that's through a due diligence framework or other kind of smart mix approaches. Um, so, you know, that's been significant. And in terms of innovations of the tools themselves, this is, you can imagine that many sustainability standards were about what are the practices you need to have in place? And let's recognize when you've met a bar. But it's not just about the practices. It's about the impacts that those tools deliver. So there's a real emphasis on strengthening the tools themselves through uh, better monitoring, better uh, focus of the standards on performance outcomes, and looking at how to measure the actual results achieved from the systems. Um, and then how can those systems uh, be part of a larger solution. So does that mean that they're applied at a landscape or jurisdictional scale, or that they work with other initiatives that operate at the scales that are necessary to address some of these critical challenges like deforestation or loss of biodiversity? Um, and 
within the tools, we really do see a, an emphasis on how can we use all the really useful information, the data that comes, that is collected by these systems, and how can that data help us not only to improve the effectiveness of our systems through risk-based analyses, but how can it improve the, uh, the livelihoods of the producers and enterprises that these systems are working with? How can we create value rather than just extract value? Um, and what does that look like in practice? So it's a it's the beginning of a long evolution, but it's one where I think we've got uh, a lot of potential for significant impact going forward. Very good. Thank you so much, Patrick. Indeed, a tremendous uh, potential for impact. Uh, I've heard very much what you were saying in terms of the transformation of the tools themselves and how they actually embrace new horizons for as MSMEs and for tackling those uh, sustainability issues. So being outside of Tick the box exercise so that certifications are not just certifications but very much empowering tools for companies that embrace them. So I'd like to turn to, to Rigid now and ask him from your experience in India, how does that work and how do you see companies embracing uh, sustainability standards, using them to the full extent of the potential that they can bring to the companies and also to the sustainability uh, per se? And then if you could just connect this company reality with also the policy work that you have seen emerging and changing over the last few years, that would be fantastic. Rigid, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Matthew, and, and thanks uh, to ITC for giving us this opportunity. Uh, uh, Joe Petra, uh, thanks, uh, thanks a lot. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about the, uh, you know, I'm going to stick to the, the theme of the session, which is basically and build on to what uh, I think a couple of points that Patrick mentioned about the future of sustainability. I think he's talked about how the sustainability standards have evolved from the last 20 years till now. And I'm probably going to talk about from our experience, how do we see the next 10 years or 20 years going forward? What are the key <clears throat> issues? Uh, going forward and, and sort of mostly aligned with the uh, the theme of this uh, conference, which is about the post-COVID-19 uh, recovery. So from a developing country, Matthew, as you mentioned, uh, perspective, whether it is India or um, I think the same applies to the other developing emerging uh, economies, <clears throat> the, the, the focus of, of, of uh, the recovery will be on nurturing the economy and creating decent jobs and, and sustainable livelihoods and, and really building uh, an overall uh, societal resilience. I mean, that's going to be the, uh, the priority for, uh, for post-COVID-19 uh, recovery for India and, and, and other developing countries. So I just want to put that uh, in the background as, uh, as I share my thoughts on uh, on the on on some of the the elements uh, that the sustainability standards uh, should be focusing on, building on what Matthews on what Patrick said uh, for the next uh, 10, 20 years going forward. So, <clears throat> from our experience, I think there are three broad issues and interconnected issues really uh, that are critical for stand, for sustainability standards going forward. The first is about uh, really addressing the perception that sustainability standards uh, do not create exclusivity, but, but really try to create and be inclusive. Uh, so really addressing this perception of, of being exclusive to being inclusive. So that's uh, the first point, and I'm going to talk about it uh, in a few minutes. The second is we've seen, uh, as far as uh, a number of sustainability standards are concerned with which we work on, uh, the focus has really been on the, the, the environmental and the social components of sustainability. The economic uh, component of sustainability seem not to be given that level of priority, which is critical. Uh, it is a complex three-legged walk like the the three-legged chair that you have in front of the uh, UN office in Geneva, uh, but uh, it's a walk uh, which is Im important uh, for sustainability standards and organizations working on sustainability to do, and it is critical to achieve that balance. So uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna talk about that second point in a little, uh, 
uh, in, in some details. And the third really is about governance and, and to talk about and focus on what are some of those critical good governance indicators if, uh, if that balance has to be achieved and if that perception has to be addressed from being exclusive to inclusive. In terms of the first point, which is, you know, in terms of being uh, inclusive, what we've seen uh, for a long time uh, is that often standards are driven by the top, uh, as far, from the top, as far as buyers and brands are con uh, concerned. So there is some level of skewedness we see in the whole uh, system. And in certain cases, it is actually uh, led to creating some level of market concentration as well, while they are not uniformly accepted across the value chain. So while the, the buyers and the brands are able to accept and, and sort of uh, engage uh, on sustainability and sustainability standards, <clears throat> when it comes to the producers or the suppliers, which is the stakeholders that we all we work with primarily, there seems to be not that level of uh, that, that level of engagement, uh, which is happening to a certain extent now, but that's a, that remains a priority. And, and it, it is a priority because there are, uh, in our mind, there are about four, we call them the four Cs, which are critical as far as uh, the absorption of sustainability standards are concerned. Costs, um, complexities, clarity, and capacity. And these pose real challenges to the producers and the suppliers as far as the adoption of sustainability standards are concerned. So what in terms of, so, so standards really have to make an extra effort. And I think Patrick already mentioned that there are some developments happening there uh, where they need to try, they, they have to prioritize uh, uh, building the capacity of producers and suppliers, especially in the global network of production where most of the sustainability challenges uh, exist. And also create uh, incentives uh, by working also on the sustainable marketplace, you know, creating that, uh, that pull in the market. While a lot of focus seems to be on the su supply side, the demand side really seems to be uh, uh, not that much. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that for standards to be, to, to be more effective going forward, they have to be more inclusive, create opportunities for producers and suppliers and, and invest in that process. The second point I was talking about was in terms of the balancing act. Now, I think it is the, the emphasis on, on, on workers and families, the social sustainability part, the emphasis on, 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 uh, on the environment, nature and climate part are absolutely critical. I mean, there is no doubt about that. But there is some level of thinking that standards need to do when it comes to the, the economic part, which is really to highlight you know, the business case for, for the impacts on producers and suppliers. That if, you're adopt, you, if you adopt a voluntary sustainability standard, you will be able to create new and niche customers, you will be able to access finance and also better integration into global value chains. I think those components of the, the, the E part, you know, uh, yes. the, of the economy uh, is, is where there are some uh, weaknesses. And the last uh, point that I wanted to quickly mention about, you know, in terms of governance. So if you, if you look at governance broadly, and you mentioned this, Matthew, in terms of accountability. So if we take, uh, take the three classical indicators of, of governance, accountability, inclusivity, transparency. When we talk about accountability, so who are standards accountable to? Are they account do they have to be just accountable to the brands? Can they be accountable to communities and beneficiaries? And could they also engage with governments and develop that level of accountability and credibility? So that's one area I think you also mentioned in terms of the policy. Inclusivity. One quick uh, sort of exercise that we did was if you look at the, the board and the governing council of, of many of these standards, uh, the ones which drive these standards, we looked at four, the six of the most popular visible VSS organizations working in India. In their board, we have found that there are 15 to 30% representation from the developing South. 
from the global network of, of production. Uh, only one had 50%. So you can see that even the governance structure in terms of inclusivity and, and representation of the South is, is lacking. And finally, when we talk about transparency, what transparency are we is critical? Are we just about, uh, is it transparency in the, in, the, in, the, in the conventional way? Or can we also talk about some level of transparency on costs, for example? I mean, these are difficult Which, questions, yes. but they will have to be answered. So and I'll, this I'll, brings, I'll stop there. Thank you. Very thank you very much, Rigid, because this brings very much these types of concepts where innovation can play a role. I mean, the conventional way has already proven to work in some areas, but it has certainly proven as well not to work in certain areas. And when it comes to inclusiveness, transparency and governance, there are many models that would be interesting to follow, especially for some standards and newcomers on the market. So this is, this is a very interesting expertise and ex experience that you're sharing with us here. I would like now to turn to Richard um, as Sustainability Director at uh, Flamengo uh, Floriculture in Kenya. And your experience in this floriculture sector, also your experience in benchmarking sustainability standards and in particular, the impact this may have for small and medium-sized enterprises. I would like to hear from you, where is the future of the standards? And can we expect at least that some of the small actors and the small companies would have a better access to the standards, a better coaching? Uh, Rigid mentioned about the training and the, the an enabling environment around the companies. Is there hope there? And how do you see the future of those companies using sustainability standards um, in the years to come? Richard, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, and uh, interesting uh, contribution so far. I think the, uh, the uh, looking at the question about what's going to happen post-COVID, I think uh, we're, we haven't forgotten the drive towards sustainable business. And I'm taking a very much a commercial perspective here. Um, customers still want to make sure that the products they are off offered on the shelves and of supermarkets are sustainably produced, and that covers, you know, social and environmental sustainability. We also talked there, but about uh, economic sustainability. You know, business has to be financially viable to be able to to operate and create employment. So, the link between financial stroke economic and uh, social and environmental sustainability is, is very important. Um, so I, I don't think we were, we're going to lose the mission of sustainability uh, post-COVID. I think it's going to continue and it has evolved. And I think from an inter industry perspective, you know, standards relating to the way businesses operate uh, have, have, have evolved into, if you like, sustainability standards. And 10, 15 years ago, the industry was pretty reactive you know, when there was a problem, we started to look at the way we did things. But I think we've gone from reactive to proactive in the way that we look at sustainability. And I think sustainability is now effectively, if, if you've embraced it correctly, it's built into the DNA of your business strategy. It's, it's, it's not just a department sitting on the side to make sure things are done. It's, it's the way that businesses are thinking about doing their business and uh, evolving their business. So, um, and I think one of the interesting things about uh, COVID, um, obviously it, it revealed the vulnerability of some of the supply chains and ours in particular, which relied specifically on air freight. Air freight disappeared uh, uh, because the market dropped it for flowers in Europe. And um, then all of a sudden freight operators found that they could move uh, PPE for COVID around much more profitably than they could move flowers around. So there was an opportunity there and the industry actually got together and started to look at opportunities for sea freight. Uh, so this is where business got together because ultimately uh, if you can find an alternative to air freight, which is, not, which is very carbon inefficient, you move into sea freight then not only do you improve the or reduce the vulnerability of your supply chain, but you also make your carbon footprint substantially less. So an opportunity is actually in terms of improving sustainability has, has come out of the COVID crisis. I think the other thing that we're all suddenly realized is everybody's been working at home over this process period. And uh, we have been through Kenya Flower Council, we've been conducting uh, um, 
audits um, remotely. And I think we are starting to realize that there is a role for online auditing that can be combined with maybe direct on uh, direct auditing as well. So I think an opportunity is developed there of how we can make the the standards or the if you like the auditing or the certification process more more practical and efficient. Uh, so I think th those are really some of the the key points really to get across is that and for small and uh, micro, small and medium sized enterprises, if those businesses have got to look at the markets they want to supply into. Uh, and, you know, there tends to be a focus on looking at export markets, but in Africa, there is a massive local markets as well. And one of the spin-offs of a lot of the better standards that we've been adopting for export is now starting to permeate into local production. Uh, and, and in terms of uh, accessibility to information on standards, we, we have over 3,000 small-scale farmers who are producing products to us to the standards that are demanded of our uh, of our customers that requires input from ourselves but we see it as part of the way of developing local industry and gradually those those suppliers are also supplying into the local market and those standards uh, are also available to the local market so it's a process of evolution i'd say uh, so it's very much small and medium enterprises may have to piggyback on the back of larger businesses to 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 get into this more uh, sustainable environment but i think sustainability is well understood within uh, within the small businesses certainly that we are are dealing with looking after land preserving water uh, and using uh, pesticides and fertilizers in, in in the best way possible thank you very much uh, richard so sustainability well taken on board by by businesses at least uh, we can hear from small uh, cooperatives that this is something totally feasible. Um, I would like to learn a bit from the experience of uh, Jane and Sci Platform in particular, working with a, a group, a massive group of multinationals. Um, you, you bring together in the Sci Platform companies as different and competing as Pepsi and Coca-Cola, Unilever, Nestle, Danone. And, and this is very interesting because um, this pre-competitive nature of the Sci Platform Platform enables some other types of innovation coming from a common ground or a common definition on sustainability and then bringing it to the actual uh, members, suppliers and farmers. So with almost 20 years, I mean next year will be your 20th anniversary, with almost 20 years of experience, I mean can you tell us a little bit what were some of the lessons learned or things that you see will be key ingredients in shaping the future of your members but also of the sustainability uh, movement in agriculture, food and drinks? I think you're still on mute, yes. Sorry about that. Thank no, you, Matthew, yes. and good afternoon, everybody. Um, yes, I mean, Side Platform is an unusual organization in that it was set up 20 years ago by three companies, namely Danone, Nestle, and Unilever, who would have been more akin to competing with each other than collaborating with each other. But they realized back then that there were some serious changes coming down the track that were going to have an impact on how they source agricultural commodities. And that these changes and challenges could, would go way beyond the type of CSR issues that organizations had started to address in the 80s and 90s. And they realized that there was a need for the alignment of a shared vision for the role of the private sector in sustainable development. So Side Platform was set up as in 2002 as a pre-competitive collaborative space for the food and drink industry. And the goal was to find common solutions to the challenges that the entire industry faced and make agriculture more sustainable. So I think the first step they actually had to undertake was to define what sustainable agriculture actually was. There still isn't a common definition for it. Um, but, you know, the basic, the basic definition that they were working towards was the efficient production of safe, um, high quality agricultural products in a way that protected and improved the natural environment, social and economic conditions of farmers, their employees and local communities, 
and to safeguard the health and welfare of all farm species. So that was the, that was the, ba the basic premise. Jumping ahead, we're now an organisation with 150 members, quite a diverse group from large FMCGs to small cooperatives. Um, we have covered a lot of ground in 20 years, and it has been a journey based on continuous improvement. Um, and first of all, we had to understand, apart from defining what sustainable agriculture actually was, we had to understand what implementing sustainable agriculture meant for business and what best practice would look like. And today, I think the value that we bring as an organization is providing industry solutions, such as the FSA, which is the Farm Sustain Sustainability Assessment. Um, we have created a pre-competitive space for collaboration and also a space for knowledge sharing and networking. Um, our industry solutions are important for, are important for the industry. And if I just describe briefly what the FSA is, it's a tool that enables food and drink businesses to assess, improve and validate on-farm sustainability for their supply chains. It's used for crops mainly, um, and it's built around a question, um, a question, a set of questions for farmers. And this, I have to say, was developed, uh, developed in conjunction with ITC, who've been an enormous help to us over the years. So thank you very much for that, Matthew. One of the major features of the FSA is the fact that it is benchmarked against 100, uh, 100 plus sustainability schemes. And this prevents duplication because I'm sure you've heard you know, so many times about companies are fed up, suppliers are fed up having to comply with various different schemes. Whereas the benchmarking feature of the FSA is very useful in eliminating that. It's currently used by 100 plus farming groups, not farms, but farming groups. So there could be 20, 50, 80 um, farming, uh, farmers in a farming group. Um, in 40, over 40 countries with FSA verified producers, and it is used for 70 plus agricultural crops. So it's, it's been quite far reaching. I mean, that started off, that has been quite a journey to, to get to there, but I think it's, it demonstrates the need for having tangible tools within the industry that our organizations can use. In dairy, we also have the Sustainable Dairy Partnership, which provides a consistent and global approach to, the dairy, to dairy sustainability and commercial relationships between dairy buyers and processors. So the burden of buyer specific programs and audits is reduced and it restores the focus on what really matters and that's continuous improvement on dairy farms. And then we have the ERBS as well, which is focused on European beef sustainability from farm to fork. Um, and it's aligned to the principle of the global round table for sustainable beef. So all of those are roadmaps providing clear guidance to, to users throughout the supply chain. It's easy to set high level goals, but it's much more difficult to get there if you do not have, you know, have the how to guide and that, that's what that's what they're for. So we've worked hard, we've worked hard on these solutions with our members. We've done a lot, but there's always going to be a lot to do as the environment will continuously evolve and change. Um, and I think one of the key things that we have learned over the 20 years, one is that we would not have got to where we are if the whole industry hadn't come together and worked together. Also, what some of what most of you have said is at the moment, doing not, or in the current environment, doing nothing is not an option. Um, and the urgent urgency to act uh, has notably accelerated in the last two years. And really, sustainability in the broad sense is now licensed to, to operate. And that goes back to what Richard was saying. Sustainability is part of the DNA of most organizations uh, nowadays. Thank you so much, Jane. Uh, sustainability part of our DNA, or at least part of the DNA of the future, I guess this is something that we all must feel to a certain extent. And for us at ITC, that also has, I guess, uh, multiple implications for T4SD, the standards map, and the programs that are around it. So I'd like to ask you, Joe, for some reflections on uh, what the speakers have expressed, and probably also what that would mean for, for us at the ITC. Thanks very much, Matthew, and uh, good afternoon. So yeah, just listening to, to our esteemed speakers online this afternoon, I, I was just thinking in terms of how this 
kind of, yeah, how's, as Matthew said, how, did this, how, how this resonates with our work. And I thought back, actually, to the last time we were gathered here in this room at the T4SD Forum, which was in 2019. So this is before, before the world, as we know today, existed. And uh, I remember in those days, uh, we did have, we spoke a lot about climate. I mean, it was, the, it was the year that Greta took the boat across the Atlantic to New York. And uh, we, had the, we had the Prime Minister of Barbados here to open the T4SD Forum. And the year before, 2018, she was invited, but she couldn't make it because they had just witnessed a hurricane uh, in, in the Caribbean, which prevented her from obviously, obviously traveling to Geneva. And we had a climate activist from Paris here on the stage in 2019 as well. So I agree t totally with Richard's comment in that sustainability has, was well understood. Uh, but I think that the difference, hopefully, is that the COVID pandemic is really a inflection point between past and the future. Because I, I don't know where I read this or heard this in a podcast or somewhere, but uh, I mean, all of us from our various national backgrounds, we have all faced uh, tragedies and crises in our own country context. But COVID is something that has affected all of us. It is really the first, I would say, since probably the, you know, the, 19, uh, the, the wars of the past uh, 50, 60 years, uh, be it before, it's the first really global event that, is, that, has, that has really affected our society. And I think that is a difference. And that makes a, it, it takes the understanding and moving from and understanding to action. Uh, and so that I think would be the high level, let's say, uh, reflection that I'd like to make this afternoon. When we kind of go down a bit more micro to the issue of voluntary standards and, and, and our work at ITC, uh, I do think that, that some of the comments that Patrick made and also Rigid made as well in terms of that certification, the standards will also need to, to adapt, uh, to become more inclusive, to move beyond just certification. Uh, I think that's spot on. I think that's correct. Uh, I do think that uh, the, the certification standards have been very, very, let's say, good at providing these frameworks as we've, been, as we've discussed throughout the day today. But now with, with the emerging policy context that we've also discussed, there will be a need to move into more, let's say, ways to, and not to overuse this word, scale the solution. Uh, and, and Jane's comments in terms of how the private sector, these pre-competitive platforms, whether it's in agriculture or textiles and garments, or down the road, we heard from Cecile in the panel before, emerging sectors, who knows, like mining uh, and, and other types of electronics and other types of sectors, how can uh, we move beyond, if you will, the certification, uh, let's say, uh, Th that, that mindset, and I think that will be that will be needed. I mean, just to just to look in terms of you know actual data, just one point that I'll I'll leave you with before I, I give the floor back to Matthew and the and the Q and A, is that we have been for the past several years with with cooperation with Seiko, the Swiss government, uh, and Feeble, the Swiss uh, Organic Agriculture Institute. We've been mark we've been looking at the market data on voluntary sustainability standards. So. Today, as we, as we publish also our, our, our book uh, on, on, the, on the looking forward on standards, we're also at the same time publishing an e-publication on this VSS data. And one thing we've noticed since 2016, 2017, is there is a plateauing of growth in some of these, in some of these commodities that are certified under VSS. I'm not going to say which ones right now, because I'll leave you to actually go online and look at that publication. But is that an indication that in certain sectors, we're seeing plateaus because other initiatives such as pre-competitive platforms are taking over. It's a question. It's the crystal ball, as, as Matthew said. So uh, these, are, these are some areas to ponder in terms of how do we move in this inflection point? How do we pivot to, let's say, deal with the, the, the issues we have on our plates today when it comes to environmental and social responsibility? But also, how do we create the right enabling environment for our core beneficiaries at the ITC, notably the micro and small and medium-sized enterprises, to effectively deal with these, uh, with these issues and to, to, to mainstream them in their own domestic economies. So with that, I'll uh, turn it back to you, Matthew. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Joe. Um, we've had many very good questions from the online audience. Um, so I'd like to combine two questions and ask you, Patrick, your views about it. I mean, the, this first combo of the question is about um, looking at impacts of the standards, but also looking at the very much concept of certification. So when we enter this new world where people say we want to go beyond certification, then what is certification 
all about? How will be the new face of certification? And when it's about measuring impact and ensuring that whatever sustainability initiative does have an impact on the ground, I mean, what are the new models that you have seen and that could be inspiring to either other standards or companies that are uh, listening to us? Thanks, Mathieu. And, and I, I, Joe, I appreciate your comments. I want to pick up on those as, as well. I think they, they tie nicely with the questions. I, I mean, I think, you know, even within ISIL, we've stepped back from sustainability standards as a terminology to talk about sustainability systems. And it's really a recognition of this diversity of approaches, uh, the, the shift from just focused on standards and certification to all of the other functions, including the pre-competitive platforms. I think fundamentally, um, the way that systems are going to have impact in the future is through collaborative efforts, through whether that's, again, at an issue base or a sector base or in specific geographies. If we're going to transform production systems, this is about everyone coming together and playing their role. And, and that's nice pie in the sky language, but practically, it's about how can we understand the realities of the production regions and engage local stakeholders and find ways that these tools and the efforts can be beneficial to everyone engaged. And a significant part of that is financing. You know, this, this I think one of the failures of certification over the last 20 years has been to shift the dynamic of uh, market-based supply chains that really this has primarily what we've seen is still a um, seeing producers not benefit from the global production system. And, and so this highlighting of the economic question, I think is absolutely critical. And this is about figuring out how to em empower supply chain actors to better support the, the ends of the supply chain, the, the origins. Um, so that for me is a fundamental question that we have to face. In terms of the impact, um, the, what we're seeing that gives me hope is that certification is not about, uh, I mentioned this in the first set of comments, is not about how can we uh, assess whether you pass or fail, whether you meet a certain standard, but really it's about gathering multiple sources of information and data some about the production systems themselves, some about the risks with inherent in the, the location or the context and getting a better understanding of where the, the risks are and where we need to focus our efforts so that it's, it is a much more data-driven risk-based system, but not just for compliance, primarily for capacity building and improvement. This is about how can we collectively add value to make this an economic imperative for producers and producing enterprises to improve their practices. So it's about financing, it's about adding value, and it's about really changing the dynamic of, of how we think about how change comes about. Thank you very much, uh, Patrick, for, for this uh, very, very good uh, feedback. Um, we have 15 minutes left for, for the Q&A, so um, Rigid, I'd, I'd like to ask you a question, but then we'll try to keep the responses as short as possible and to the point. I mean, the question that's raised here for, for you is about the, the sustainability standards and their linkages with the policy world, especially in this context of due diligence and the new regulations coming into play. So will standards have to adapt to the due diligence or will due diligence be actually required or helped to work with the VSS? Which will be the driving force and how do you see that coming in the next few years? The connections between the VSS and the regulatory world, um, due diligence in particular. Thank yeah, you for I that mean, Oh, well, sorry, go on. Was it me or Richard? Uh, Richard first and then Richard. Ah, okay. Thank you. Go, Richard, first. I, well, let me try and quickly respond uh, in the interest of time. Um, so I think there is an, an interesting element here, which is uh, which which needs to be uh, uh, which needs to be looked at, and I'm, I'm I'm going to be very provocative when it uh, in terms of you know my response, uh, which is that I think we are um, we are probably making the same mistake of of, of designing systems which are which are top down, uh, especially when it comes to a, a 
a global value chain perspective. I mean, international trade and commerce is extremely integrated. So um, if you are going to, it seems that the, uh, the, the governance of sustainability is oscillating between the private and the public. Uh, public regulations didn't work. So there was a, a focus on the private regulation and it seems private regulation is not working. So we are going back to the public again by legislating, uh, you know, top down institutional. Well, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at it as, as something which is designed, say, for example, the EU, uh, you know, the mandatory legislation that you're talking about. And it's not just the EU uh, for a country, which is for a country like India, which is dealing with Netherlands, uh, for example, we have to deal with two sets of regulations, one uh, set by Netherlands and the other, which is set by the EU. So there are two layers of complexity when it comes to international trade. I think what in terms of the in the in, in terms of the silver lining, uh, what I what we see is that there are uh, there are processes which are developing in countries like, for example, in India, we have a, a national disclosure framework on sustainability. So for, perhaps the way forward would be how some of these national frameworks are going to help integrate with the international processes and, and, and uh, legislations that are evolving. Does the national framework help companies in India which are exporting to Netherlands to be able to align with the requirement of the due diligence, does that prepare them, uh, you know, to to apply with the uh, with the new uh, the uh, the new rules of the game? So Very I think well. that's where uh, probably the the future lies. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Rigid and and Richard. Back to you. I mean, from the from your experience in Kenya, how do you see this alignment, and how do you see the voice of the private sector really being heard uh, from the policymakers in designing their new regulations and recognizing the efforts on sustainability which have been taking place uh, in the already with some of your um, companies in the country? How do you see that connection playing a role? I think this, uh, this we talked about this pre-competitive arena, and um, uh, you'll be well aware of the Floricultural Sustainability Initiative, where we have benchmark standards, uh, country standards, so that it's easier to come with a common understanding of what each standard meant. And this has a big impact on costing. It's one of the challenges the industry has faced with having multiple audits, and you referred to that already, and therefore, uh, or multiple standards, so should I say. But we not we now see is through something like the floricultural sustainability initiative we're now moving into um building tools for for the industry to for example on carbon footprinting which is going to be something which uh, the eu and probably other countries outside the eu will start to become mandatory on packaging for example so i, I see the the industry continuing to work together uh and uh, working with government, because obviously the government has an overarching agenda about climate change, and obviously sustainable practices are a big part of um, mitigating the impacts of, of climate change. So I think industry will work together with governments, but industry, I think, is working together with itself to, to come up with some uh, tools that enable us to, to... And these tools can also then be cascaded down to smaller micro enterprises. It's, it's, it's a matter of scale. And you know, obviously, some of the things are going to be difficult for these small industries to do. But it's a matter of keeping in perspective and not um, uh, ignoring the important things uh, in terms of sustainable practices. Absolutely. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. You, you mentioned about those tools that are used by the industry. And I would like, I mean, again, hear from the questions from the audience, uh, refer back to you, Jane, for uh, one last question. You mentioned about the tools that are developed within the site platform context. You mentioned FSA, SDP, or ERBS. So farmer sustainability assessment, the dairy uh, tool as well. The, the question is, of course, these tools need to be somehow connected to what already exists on the market. So you, you mentioned also the word benchmarking, which came from Richard and Rigid as well in their responses. So can you elaborate just a little bit more about this journey 
of making FSA and the other tools of the side platform very much connected to other tools that exist, embracing as well the very much concept that sustainability is a journey. It's never a tick the box exercise, it's never finished. So how does FSA fulfill with that and connects with the other tools that companies may be using? Okay, well, I think certainly for FSA, the fact that it's benchmarked against 100, uh, more than 100 other schemes is the key way of doing that. So you are creating some alignment, you're avoiding duplication. And that is, that's really necessary, as I say, particularly at a producer level, because farmers are fed up of, you know, they may be selling to two or three customers and having to do separate audits for audits for all of them. So I think by using, if you can get industry to align on the, on the tools that they're using, that is a major step forward. And I think that's what we're seeing with FSA, with SDP and with the, with the ERBS. And I think bringing that, going forward with that, um, we are going to see a lot more pressure now on outpack on outputs and impact. Measurement is increasingly important. Companies are under pressure to meet their commitments on carbon neutrality, for example. So I think that going forward, that is the thing that needs to be addressed in not only side platforms, uh, industry solutions, but in all others as well. You know, credibility, transparency. And I think what's going to, what's needed there also, and it is happening, is better data and more aligned uh, baselines. Um, that are common to that are common to the various industries. Um, it hasn't. It's been difficult up to now, but I think as as we mature, as people are more conscious of um, sustainability measures, working with different schemes and so on, we will end up in a situation where the data and the baselines are are um, are con are converging. Um, I also think that I agree with all the comments that have been made. I mean, we see 2010 to 2020 as the decade of compliance schemes, you know, which was often seen as a tick box exercise. It was a great start, as you said, Patrick, you have to start some, you know, you have to start somewhere. But I think now the pendulum is swinging back more from compliance to continuous improvement, you know, and any of these any of the measures that we take, any of the tools that we develop and so on, they really are only, they're only going to be as good as, as, as the users. And I think that's, that's an important realization as well. Um, and they are going to have to take into account as well, more equity in cost sharing throughout the system because it, it has been a top-down approach to now. And that just isn't sustainable from a producer's perspective. Very well, thank you so much, uh, Jane. We are coming almost to an end, and I have one last question for all of you. We still have this crystal ball in the room, and I would like to ask every one of you to think about what the crystal ball is telling you vis-a-vis -vis your organization in five to 10 years. So in just one minute per person, tell us where you think your organization will be in five to 10 years. Any change in the mission, the mandate, or the type of work that you're doing, Please, um, starting with you, Patrick, the floor is yours. Excellent, one minute. Um, <laughs> so I already mentioned that ICL has expanded our mandate from sustainability standards to sustainability systems. I see that ICL plays an important fundamental role in ensuring the credibility of different types of tools that are driving sustainable action. And that's a really important role and I think that will continue. Um, I think that 2030 for, for me personally, you know, that's, that's my 30 years in this, uh, in this space. And I need to see fundamental shifts in the delivery of real action on some of these critical sustainability issues. So I can see that ICL is gonna be much more issue focused. It's gonna be driving practical concrete changes on deforestation, on livelihoods, on human rights, on biodiversity. Those are the things that we need to collectively solve and figuring out what ICL's role is in that collective is going to be a critical piece of that because I, I do think that it's only by bringing organizations together that we're going to achieve some real impact. Fantastic. Thank you, Patrick. What about you, Rigid, at the CRB? Where will you be in five to ten years? 
I'll try and combine the two aspirations that I uh, that we have uh, in the organization. So one is to see how uh, sustainability can be can be everybody's business, um, and we are uh, you know and we are we are talking essentially about the the smallholders, the the small and medium enterprises, the collectives. Uh, if we can, how we better demonstrate the business case and and make them champions. Um, uh, and turn turn the table a little and create some balance between the producers and the and the suppliers with the buyers and the brands um, in the global value chain. So that's one. And in doing so, uh, the aspiration also for CRB is to become uh, some sort of a mouthpiece of the global south and bring some of these experiences into the international platform, uh, which still is driven by the West when it comes to developing legislations on, on global value chains as far as sustainability is concerned. I think I Thank did you. it within a minute. Thanks. Thank you very much, Richard. Richard, with uh, Flamengo uh, Floriculture, Horticulture Limited, where do you see uh, your company will be in five to ten years? Um, I think we will be continuing on the sustainability journey. Our, our business is already carbon neutral, but we, we can look into our business and find areas where we can reduce our carbon footprint and therefore in, 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 you know, reduce the amount of offsets we have to look at. I think we're going to continue to cooperate with other members of the industry. I think we've got to look at the benchmarking is important, but I think this is, there's all a lot of investment in doing this. And I think the, the consumer also has to recognize that there is a great deal of investment in doing what they want. And therefore, I think the consumer has to look at the price they pay for the products that we produce. Excellent. Thank you, Richard. And Jane, uh, just before you celebrate 20 years of Sci Platform, how do you think it will look like with 30 years of experience? I think we'll be continuing along the journey that we're on, focusing on industry alignment uh, and, and collaboration to build on, build on what we already have. Um, I think there's going to be a lot more pressure, as I said before, on equity in who carries the cost of, of, uh, of having more, a more sustainable agricultural sector. And I think because a lot of our members are, you know, they, they are at the coal face with, with consumers, there's going to be real pressure to, have, to, sh to show what's been done. And it's not just lip service, it's actually showing concrete results and measurement. And also focusing on, we probably have been in a situation where the focus has been on doing no harm and it's going to pivot to do more good. So. Fantastic, thank you very much, Jane. Uh, on our side at ITC, certainly we will be there still in 10 years and hoping to continue being good partners and working with a standard smile version, whatever. So very happy uh, to, to, uh, to close this panel. A super big thank you to all the panelists. Uh, it's, been, it's been great talking to you, uh, Patrick, Rigid, Richard, uh, Jane. It's been fantastic. Thank you, Joe, for the remarks. Um, we will close now this session. There will be a very short video video about uh, testimonials from partners of the ITC and the Standards Map in particular, again, uh, in the spirit of celebration of this 10 years anniversary of our flagship tool, the Standards Map. Again, a very big thank you to all the panelists, the speakers, the audience, and the questions. Thanks again, and back in the room very soon. Thank you. Ghanaian SME stands to benefit hugely in the future in the area of uh, sustainability standards. We're looking at the Ghanaian enterprise access and strategic niche markets, uh, the SME being able to provide decent jobs for the team in unemployed, uh, would also assist them to preserve the environment for future generations and would also help them to access green financing to be able to expand their businesses going forward.
The growing number and extended scope of business conduct regulations, as well as the rising demand from consumers for more sustainable products, do a crucial role for voluntary sustainable standards, such as ICS, to first continuous improvement of one supply chain's working conditions, second, mutualization of robust data collection, third, transparent collaboration between factories, suppliers, brand standards, and institutions to reduce the fatigue and increase common leverages. Thanks to our long-standing collaborations with ITC, the initiative for compliance and sustainability is fully engaged to promote ITC platform to suppliers and their factories, accompanying them daily along the intense journey to transparency and traceability. I'm a strong believer of voluntary sustainability standards. While global politics have been involved in lengthy discussions, BSS have put in action a market-driven approach that works and where continuous learning is happening. However, VSS must adapt to future trends and emerging requirements. More than ever, VSS need to demonstrate that they're fit for purpose in terms of relevance, efficiency and impact. In any case, I'm convinced that VSS offer an enormous wealth of experiences and solutions waiting to be scaled by decision makers and practitioners around the world. Voluntary sustainability standards will have to strive for continuous improvement. This is the only way they can ensure to stay relevant in future. The increase in mandatory due diligence regulation that we start to see will lead to actors increasingly demanding a very clear value added of standards in future. In Fairtrade, we believe that credible voluntary standard systems will play an ever greater role in bringing market partners together. Since supply chains are increasingly getting vulnerable, um, this is a need that will increase in the future. Supply chains will even cease to exist because farmers will drop out or will get more uh, unstable because of uh, climatic um, threatening or market conditions becoming more erratic or because uh, there is a threat to compliance because of uh, increasing regulations and codes kicking in. So voluntary standard systems can stabilize supply chains and help market partners to, to stay in contact and in dialogue. However, to play that role, voluntary standard systems need to innovate, they need to partner with other organizations while keeping their focus on demonstrating their value through long-lasting monitored impacts. Welcome back everybody, hope you had a good break. And you're just in time for one of the most fun sessions of the day. We are a bit biased, but we're very excited to bring you our next segment called A Fresh Take on Sustainability. Our guest is an award-winning chef known for bringing West African cuisine to the global stage. His name is Pierre Thiam and he is chef of Taranga Restaurant in New York. He's also a social entrepreneur and founder of Yolele Foods. Welcome chef. Thank you so Hi, much everyone. for joining us today. Do you see thank him you, here in you. his kitchen? I, I am in my kitchen. <laughs> early morning here. Good morning, everyone. It's early morning. Allow me to have a coffee. Of course. I mean, it's early for you. I well, am we... in California at the moment, yes. What so time is uh, it there? It's uh, 7, uh, 726, exactly. Okay, so 720. You're going to be not making a breakfast dish, but from our time zone here in Geneva, Switzerland, it's a good dish. Can you tell us what you're preparing today? I'm making a fonio and mango salad. But that sounds a, delicious. With a, with a few more ingredients in it. It's like a, it's a fresh salad that's inspired by 
well, here, you know, in California, we have a beautiful farmer's market. And I went there and I found some fresh herbs. So there's going to be lots of mint in it, lots of parsley, lots of uh, acidity from the lemon dressing. And, and it's fun. And mango is going to bring some sweetness to it as well. And for you, you'll know all about it throughout the, the event today, I guess. Absolutely. It's a 5,000-year-old West African miracle grain that you'll be cooking in five minutes. Is that right? This is the challenge mm -hmm. for you today. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It cook, uh, cooks, cooks very fast. That's the great thing about this grain. It cooks in five minutes. It's very versatile. That's why I chose to do a salad today. You can do so many different things with Sonio. You can go all the way from desserts to like savory. It's come from West Africa. So back there, we do porridges with it. There's so many ways to to adjust Fonio. Actually, my last cookbook was dedicated to Fonio. So you can find all sorts of recipes from the whole journey of Fonio, pretty much. Yes, and you're playing a big role in kind of giving quinoa a run for the competition, right? Because Fonio is now kind of gaining ground with those who are conscious consumers. So congratulations on this. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I, I, like to, I like to not think about it as a competition, even though people, this, the system we live in and people think that everything should be competing. I think they complement each other and, and we, we need to include more and more of these grains mm -hmm. into our diet, you know. The global diet is so limited. We're all eating rice and wheat and corn and soy. You know, there's other grains that are great for us, you know, because we need to diversify our diet, but it's also great for the planet. We don't, we need to stay away from this food system that's imposing monoculture upon us. So quinoa is great, fonio is great, amaranth is great, sorghum is great, millet is great. There's hundreds of other crops that are great for us and we need to include them into our diet. Otherwise they disappear. So. So it's to say biodiversity as well. Absolutely, biodiversity and just including everything. This is, this is kind of what we're here for when we talk about sustainability. So chef, if you're ready, you're kind of on the clock here, but we'll be asking you questions while you're preparing this mango awesome. fonio salad. So for the first question, if you're ready, you can go yep. ahead and start preparing. Uh, I'm starting at... preparing as, yes. you, as, you, as, you, uh, as you ask the question. That's so what right. I'll do is I'll, I'll go toward the stove right now. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll move the camera so you can see what I'm doing to show you that it really cooks in five minutes. Actually, it takes even less than five minutes. Okay. You got to see what's, what's going on here with the, the phone. I'm turning my, my fire okay. to a boil. And you ask your question. Okay. While yeah. this is boiling, you don't have to wait for the boil. And okay. in, the, in the meanwhile, I'm just going to go on my prep table here while um, you ask the question. The prep table here is showing you all the ingredients that, that we're using good. today. Wow, look at that. All the but, fresh ingredients you're talking about. Chef, you're actually doing three ingredients. jobs. You're doing the camera work, cooking, and answering <laughs> questions. So I'll get started on the first question. Uh, Go look, ahead. Yes. Looking at your career, you've really embraced opposites, whether it's running a five-star restaurant and a fast food chain or fusing different cultures into one dish, right? You make mm -hmm. kimchi fried rice, but it's kimchi fried fonio. So can you tell us a bit <laughs> about your story and how whatever you've been doing, how sustainability has been at the heart of it all? Well, sustainability to me, it's, it was always very important. As a chef, I feel like we are responsible. People trust us in terms of when it comes to food and we are feeding lots of people. Mm. Myself, like you said, I went from uh, five stars to fast casual. I like to, to, to correct it. It's not a fast food. It's a fast casual. So it's different, you know, a different approach. It's good quality ingredients. It's just prepared for people who are in a hurry. You know, this, the system we live in, people just don't want to wait for five different, six different courses all the time. So they should be able to also have good quality food that's prepared. They come and they get it and they have their lunch in within an hour and they're gone. So that's what the fast casual is. And so the idea of like scaling as well, you can scale easier than a five-star restaurant. Five-star restaurants are important for our artistry as chefs. You know, that's really what, uh, what I'm focusing on when I'm in a five-star restaurant, when I'm in, at NOC in Lagos, when I'm at, Ter at Teranga Pullman in Dakar. But at Teranga in New York City, it's more like a fast casual. But it's very important also for the fact that, like I was mentioning earlier in the introduction, we, are, we have a limited diet. And chefs, we can introduce new crops to a wider uh, group of people. And this is what I wanted to do with fonio. Fonio is a grain that grows in poor soil. 
you know, and that's really, really sustainable. That's resilient. Like I said, it's been around for 5,000 years. So the fact that Fonio is not known, is not a world-class crop, it mm. tells a lot about our food system. And this was my challenge. I was like, you know, you know what? I, I'm a chef based in New York. I'm from Senegal. There's something I can do about this. You know, I can do about this grain. I can introduce it to my clientele in New York and eventually it's going to grow into a wider audience. And this is what we did. I created Yolele to introduce Fonio and other crops. And we started in 2017 in one supermarket, one Whole Foods in Harlem, next to my restaurant. And today our Fonio is distributed across the US in all the Whole Foods in America, in addition to a couple thousand other supermarkets. And this is just, for me, for me, it's a model of development. We can find other crops like this and work with small farming communities in West yeah. Africa, because those communities are among the poorest ones in the world. And just uh, the fact that those communities have these amazing grains, but they don't have access to market. So this is where we come to play. Companies like Yolele can come and we introduce these, these crops to the market. So You're you... Right, I so just introduced the point. Yes, yeah, so you're actually bringing about a um, demand that maybe people didn't even know that they had by introducing this new grain, which I think is a wonderful thing that you're doing with what you're cooking. So while you're, I, we see that the water is starting to boil, maybe, and now the you're water was chopping boiling, the and onions. I added the pollo, yes. Yes. Uh, so while you're doing that, can you tell us how this dish in particular that you're preparing, how is this sustainable? Mm -hmm. And how are the products you're using supporting smallholder farmers? You kind of touched upon it, saying that this is a grain that farmers in West Africa are growing, but you're using it also for you know, food security, but also to uh, have diversity of products that people can choose from when it comes to grains. That's correct, all, all correct. That means you know, uh, just the fact that it's a grain, um, we can call it um, a regenerative type of grain because Ponyo has deep roots that not only enriches the soil mm. because the deep roots add nutrients to the soil but that's that's also the fact that fonio is drought resistant mm. you know it requires very little water to grow and that's also one of the fastest maturing grains. fonio can mature within two to three months so that's that's for all those reasons fonio is a, is a sustainable, sustainable grain it's like it's a grain that farmers can rely on upon you know when the first rain comes all the farmers have to do is to throw the seeds and they know Fonio is going to grow. They don't even need to till the soil. It's a grain that's, that's easy to grow. They, they have a nickname for Fonio. They call it the lazy farmer's crop for that reason. Because the it's so easy to grow. Okay. Lazy farmer's crop. And the lazy cook crop. Look at this. I mean, the water <laughs> has evaporated and the Fonio is ready. Wow, that was it. Yeah, that's it, you know. So this is it. You can... I'm going to give you a close up here yes, so you please. can see all, all you can all you need to do now is to fluff it and it's perfectly fluffy just like couscous mm -hmm. and I'm going to pour it into a bowl to cool it down for the rest of my salad. Okay, I do feel like you're going to win this competition here against me with my questions <laughs> and you with the, your dish. Um, actually, you, you, you go ahead. I'll be, I'll be listening. <laughs> okay. Um, my next question is, your product line, which you mentioned, is Yolele Fonio, and that supports uh -huh. farmers in the Sahel, and it's actually available in stores and online for customers in the U.S. So you mentioned a few years ago when you started this line, you've seen how consumers Ooh. were starting to buy your products. Have you seen a change in how consumers have been responding uh, to your products? To Fonio? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Like I said earlier, Fonio... Um, we introduced it to the U.S. market in 2017 in one supermarket, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, we were doing, I was doing myself, I was doing cooking demos in the supermarket. Every time I was doing cooking demo, the Fonio was fly off the shelf. Mm -hmm. And Whole Foods noticed that Fonio was pretty much a champion in this category in the supermarket. So we started to add more supermarkets on that chain. If you will know, Whole Foods is the largest natural supermarket. Yeah, right, so there we go. So they right. added... More, more, more products, more lines, more, more supermarkets, sorry. Mm -hmm. And eventually, we were distributed in all the Whole Foods in, in the U.S. And That's in addition amazing. to that, all the supermarkets came and joined in. So that means the demand was there to answer your question. People mm -hmm. were interested in, 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 in this product, in what we were offering to them. Mm -hmm. And they started to, and to pay attention. And as they were paying attention, 
you know, we got lots of media attention, you know, we got uh, coverage from you know, all the mainstream media, the New York Times, um, you know, Bloomberg, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, you name it, CNN did a special, a couple of specials. So that was really what boosted us, you know, so the demand is growing. Mm -hmm. As, as I'm talking to you, I'm chopping some cucumbers. Just I want to add some we crunchiness. See all of it. Yeah, you see all so, of it. Yeah, I want I want right? to add some flavor in that salad. We really so, wish you were here in Geneva uh, cooking this. That would that would have been great. Um, but that would have been awesome. <laughs> yes, next time, next time. But chef, you're talking Indeed. about how people have started to pick up on Fonio and starting to buy it. But do you see that as more of uh, people who want to be green or people who want to be healthy, or is it just other people who are curious, like what kind of people do you find uh, are interested in trying Fonio? Oh, all, all kinds of people, really. Yes, people conscious. It starts with the conscious people who are looking for grains that are great for the planet, grains that are also sourced ethically, which is important because mm -hmm. we buy it from small farming farmers who are the small, the poorest one, like I mentioned, and and we buy it at fair trade price. You know, we guarantee not only we guarantee to buy it, but we assist farmers. We work with NGOs that assist them and train them in better agricultural practices. So all of it to increase the yield. At the moment, we are working even with operators to partner in building a mill that will even make it more efficient in the processing. Because the processing is tedious. Onion is a tiny grain, as you could see in the. In the in the pic in the picture, I mean, I don't know if you, I was able to show it to you, but I'll show it mm -hmm. to you right here. Yes, the way please. Ponyo looks, Ponyo looks like a grain that really, you know, it looks like sand. It's a mm. tiny grain. So imagine each each single seed is covered with a skin that needs to be removed. So that yeah. process is like tedious, and traditionally it was done with a mortar and pestle, which was taking forever. You know, for one hour. Kilo of ponyo, it would take two hours of manual labor. So wow. now, with yeah, now there's mechanization, but there's still some manual labor involved. So there's a lot of waste, almost 50% of waste. So that's why we came up with a collaboration with lo local operators. We will build, a, we design with Bueller uh, and, uh, the, the top uh, uh, milling equipment in the world. We designed a, a mill that will process Fonio in a more efficient way at three tons per hour without the waste. So even just for that equipment, we double the yield of Fonio because the waste right. is, 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 is eliminated. So in addition to that, it's also cleaner. So it reduces the price of Fonio, makes it more accessible for the local communities in addition to having a better quality Fonio. So all of those are the reasons of what we're doing. And I'm, I guess I'm not even sure if I'm answering your question. I'm just giving you the state of what we're doing with Fonio at the moment. And this is that's where we're heading. Um, was that your question? Sorry? Yeah, it was about uh, the conscious consumer or what kind of people are um, oh, trying yes. Fonio. But you touched upon it. If people care about where their food comes from and the farmers yeah, and, who are and, working and, on it, you know, they get more, paid more or they double the, the profits because that's, they that's, that's, that's right. So those, so, so coming back to that question, so those consumers are satisfied, but you also have the consumers who are more and more growing or who are looking for, for flavors from different horizons, from different uh, parts of the world. And Africa is like the last frontier when it comes mm. to food and people are just excited about what's coming up from the continent. So we have those consumers as well. And, and lastly, you have the people who just love good food. Fonio yeah. is a grain that's so delicious, you know, it's delicate. And you notice it. As a matter of fact, the, pe the places where we grow Fonio, in, 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 most of the time, they call it the grain for royalty because that's a grain that they offer to, their, to honor their guests. Mm. You know, when I arrive in Kedugu in the south of Senegal, they offer me a plate of Fonio to, to tell me how they want to honor me. And this is, this is a, because the grain is a delicate grain. It's really a, a tasty, delicious and delicate grain. Not only is it easy to grow, it's easy to cook, but it's really the most tasting of grains. As a matter of fact, the legend has it actually legend. It's not even legend, it's a, it's a fact. Archaeologists have found Fonio in pyramids. Ancient, pyramids. Egyptians would, ancient Egyptians would take Fonio to the afterlife. So that's like, that's, that's grain that goes way, way back. And why would they take it to the afterlife? It tells you about it's that how good. delicious the grain is. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> I'd like to take some Fonio with me when I go. Right. So here, uh, <laughs> go ahead. 
For those of us who haven't had the pleasure yet of trying fonio, can you describe uh, compared to, let's say, couscous or rice? It, it's I've heard it's a bit nuttier than couscous. A bit yes, earthier? it's uh, mm -hmm. it it is earthier, nuttier. All those words are right, and you know it also has a neutral flavor. When you taste fonio like this, you know, just like plain, mm, it's neutral. It has not a particularly strong taste. Mm. So that's that's the strength of ponyo that makes it more adaptable. Ponyo can go to so many different types of cuisine. You know, you can like you mentioned I mentioned kimchi. You mentioned kimchi earlier. Right. It takes the kimchi flavor, it absorbs the flavor that you bring to it. And it's just the, the, the magic of ponyo and that's his, that's why it makes it a versatile grain. Mm. It's neutral but slightly nutty and it looks like couscous. It tastes like couscous in a sense, but it doesn't have gluten. It's gluten free, and it's mm. also not couscous. It's a grain. Couscous is actually a pasta because couscous is wheat that's been turned into right. flour and then transformed into pasta. So it's it's a diff this big difference here. So it looks like couscous, but it's a gluten free couscous, and it's also a whole grain. So it's that's very that's versatile. the right. Even in very just very. In yeah, even in just the nicknames that this grain has, right? The lazy farmer's grain to the royalty <laughs> grain to the miracle grain to the, yep. you know, afterlife, take it with you kind of grain. It's it's really versatile, even in, in just the I no, I have another name for you. In, yes. in the, Dogon, the Dogon people, they call it Po. And Po? Po, mm -hmm. P -O, yeah, Po. Mm -hmm. And it's the name of, also the name of... Um, the brightest star in the universe, in the in, in the cosmogony, is called is Sirius. The name for Sirius, and what what um, why they call it Po, because in their mythology, Ponyo is the seed of the universe. Hmm. So so the, so that's another name. I, I love that name actually, the seed of the universe. And and because you know it's a it's an ancient name. It tells you about the past of Ponyo, how important it was. But I think it also tells you about the future. You know, looking at the past, you can know where the future is. And I, I think Ponyo is a grain of the future as well. The grain that is going to be, it's very important that we make it the grain of the future because we're going to be 10 billion people on this planet. Yeah. And we need to feed ourselves. And we cannot keep feeding ourselves with the way we've been doing for the past 50 years, you know, right. with monoculture, with putting chemicals on the ground, with trying to get feed, our, feed ourselves with four crops or five crops you know there's the, there's so much variety of products out there that we need to introduce into our diet for the sake of the planet and for this, our own sake for the sake of our health because if we don't diversify our diet and if we stop putting um, chemicals into the the food that we grow if we don't stop putting chemicals into the food that we grow we had see the consequences, you know, much, many of our diseases and the problems that we have with our health are directly connected with the way we feed ourselves. So it's sure. important that we start introducing crops that are not only wholesome and nutritious. Ponyo is a nutrition powerhouse, you know, not mm -hmm. only is gluten free, but it's like, it's rich in fiber, it's rich in amino acids. You know, there's so much to be said about Ponyo. Not, so, so that's like, you know, it checks all the boxes, great for the environment, great for yourself, and, and great for the farming community. If we support Ponyo in turning it into a world-class crop, the farming community become more prosperous. And, you know, as they become more prosperous, you realize that the region where Ponyo grows is the Sahel region, a region that's troubled right now for different reasons. You have a big immigration, lots of youth are leaving because right. they don't have opportunities. They don't have opportunities and what they do, some of them take dugout boats to try to make it to Europe. Others mm -hmm. try to cross the Sahara Desert. Others go to join terrorist activities. But all of those are just direct consequences of not having opportunities where they're from. And they have great products like Fonio that can bring economic opportunities that will have people stay home, give them no reason to try to go to Europe. That or try to. Upon it. Right, it's job opportunities as well as uh, the better health. So, Chef, we're getting down to the final two and there a half we go. minutes. I was, I was waiting for you. So here we have okay. the ponyo has cooled down. You're I'm giving me a chance to, add to my catch tomatoes. up. Exactly. Okay. Some, some red, some red onion to give it a little kick. My cucumber. Yes. And of course the mango. Wow. And. Quickly, I'm going to roughly 
crush up some mint. Some mint, okay. Mint and some parsley. Okay. Chef, while you do this, we're gonna have one last rapid fire round of questions in which you have one minute to answer six questions while you're finishing wow. up this dish. <laughs> okay, let's do The pressure is it. on. Okay, if you're ready, first question. Uh -huh. You've cooked for some big names, such as the King of Morocco, President Macron, and former mm -hmm. UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. Who else would you mm -hmm. like to cook for? Oh, wow. Okay, big names. The Pope. The Pope. Or, okay. Or the, or, the, or the Dalai Lama, for that matter. Or the Dalai Lama. I, I, I think You're going I for the top. Okay, yeah. fantastic. <laughs> Describe Fonio with one word. Fonio, the seed of the universe. I guess it's three words, right? Fonio That's is a long future. word, but okay, we'll, we'll go with that. The, the future, the future. The future, future is very good. Besides Fonio, what's your favorite grain to cook with? Besides Fonio, I like to cook with grains that are sustainable, that are underutilized. I love sorghum, for instance. I love pop sorghum because it has a nutty, it has almost like risotto, it's, it's hardy. I love mm. sorghum. It cooks much faster than, much, much longer than Fonio, though. But it it's great. Next time we'll try that. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you rather create recipes for a high end or fast food restaurant? Um, I like both. I think food, good food should be accessible to everyone. So, so high end for the people who have the means, absolutely, because that allows me to be more creative. Mm -hmm. And fast casual, not fast, fast casual. Food. That's I right. Th I think food fast should casual. be slow food, you know, slow food. I take the time to cook it. You know, that's the way we cook in Africa. But casual because it's not, you know, it's not complicated. There's no tablecloth. There's no all this dining and uh, but I like cooking both. I like cooking for both. Sorry, I'm disappointing okay. with my answer. That's longer. okay. We have <laughs> just a few seconds left, two questions left. Where mm -hmm. would you like to open your next restaurant? Which city? Okay, I, I did Lagos, I did Dakar, I did New York, maybe Europe now. How about uh, Geneva? Geneva? Okay, Geneva. we agree with you on this. Last I'm question. Coming. Yes, please mm -hmm. do come, we'll invite you. Last question is, which country makes the best jollof? You know, this is kind of a controversial <laughs> thing. Yeah, it's controversial when you're not from Senegal. Because um, oh, when okay. you're from Senegal and, and you know that Jollof is the word for Senegal, it's where it was created in Senegal. And so by far, you know, the original Jollof is from Senegal. Well, there we no, have it. I the answer, say, you I said it. I didn't say the best. I said the original, OK? OK, <laughs> but, the original. Uh, but, you know, I, I, yeah, I had great jollof in Ghana. I had great jollof in Nigeria. It's just different, you know. It's mm. not even always the same dish. Each of them have their particularities. But the original jollof is from, from Senegal. Senegal. Okay, we'll yes. take that as an answer. Thank you so much, Chef, um, especially for that last question, for daring to answer that. And before we let you go, can we have a final look at this dish, just in five seconds? Absolutely, Absolutely. in five yes. seconds. Look, uh, there it is. Wow, so fantastic. I've finished the fonio and mango salad. I should have played it for you. Would you like me to play it five seconds? We don't have really much time, but that looks um, great. So there, so there it is, you know. So um, fonio and mango salad with lots of mint and parsley and cucumber and red onion and an olive and lime dressing. So very good. That looks fantastic. Uh, oh, thank you. Mm, all the, all the in person audience just kind of went, oh because we wanted that too. Well, thank you so much, Chef, for joining us and uh, for sharing your fresh perspectives on sustainability and also how you're helping farmers while you're creating better, healthier food. Even when it's fast food, it's like quickly done, it's still slow food. So we love that. And we look forward to following your work and to your new restaurant in Geneva. Yes, amen <laughs> to that. Okay, thank you so Pleasure. much, Chef. We'll be in touch, care, thank you. Great. Well, once again, thanks to our chef for just really bringing a lot of life and uh, joy for us this afternoon. Um, and we're actually getting to the close of this day one of our forum. So for the closing keynote address, we would now like to welcome Dr. Maria Flaxbarth, who's the Parliamentary State Secretary of BMZ, to deliver her remarks. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, faced with dwindling resources and a growing world population, how must we adapt our consumption habits? 
This is one of the key questions for our future, and the COVID-19 pandemic has made it even more urgent. The only answer can be to consume in a socially and ecologically sustainable way. I am pleased that T4SD has become one of the most important international players in this respect. Since my ministry, the BMZ, played a major part in its creation. But how exactly is the BMZ contributing to SDG 12? I can tell you through a smart mix of voluntary and binding measures and through a combination of different players at different levels. Let me give you a few examples. I'll start with the area that affects us all, private consumption. Our shared aim must be to use our enormous collective market power and to work towards sustainable private consumption. The German government has set up a platform called Siegelklarheit to help with this. The name means label clarity and the aim is to help consumers find out what all the different labels they might find on their products mean. What labels show fair trade products what ones are for environmentally friendly products and which are nothing more than greenwashing. The platform accesses all the different labels, provides information to consumers and lets them know what labels they can trust. So before they decide what to go out and buy, lots of people use the platform to compare the standards used by different providers and producers. In addition to this, we have also established the green button. This is a government-run label which consumers can spot on products while they are actually out shopping and which tells them quite clearly this piece of clothing has been produced by a company that fulfills particularly strict social and environmental standards. Also, public procurement must be made more sustainable. Germany's federal government, states and local authorities make procurements each year for the value of 500 billion euros. This gives them massive leverage to make supply chains sustainable. The BMZ has put together a special guide on public procurement by textiles aimed at large state institutions like hospitals or local authorities. We hope it will help us achieve our aim of making 50% of publicly procured textiles sustainable. The signs are looking pretty good. In Germany, the trend is towards procuring more and more fair trade products, whether it is the fire brigade's uniform or the fair trade coffee available in the canteen. And one month ago, Deutsche Bahn, the Germany Railways decided to have all the official clothing it provides to its employees certified with a government-run green button label. So in future, 43,000 Deutsche Bahn employees, from the ticket collector to the people on the sales desks, will be wearing sustainably produced uniforms. National legislation is the next point and the German government has brought in the act on due diligence in supply chains. It sets binding standards that all companies must meet as of 2023. The law covers the entire supply chains in all sectors and provides for close checks and, where necessary, strict sanctions. We hope that in this way we can improve working and living conditions in our partner countries. And last not least, this brings me to the final level, international trade. The most important and the most obvious test for Germany is to use the EU trade agreements to boost ecological and social sustainability. And so we are helping the EU Commission to ensure that the sustainability chapters of these agreements are precisely formulated and effectively implemented. Ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, a lot of good progress has been made. And there's also a lot more to be done. So we look forward to keeping on working with you.
Thank you. Our thanks to Dr. Flaxbart for those closing remarks. And thank you to all of you, our participants who are here in person and also joining us online for a great day of discussions on how we can move forward to make supply chains and trade in general more sustainable. Uh, this wraps it up for day one, but the discussions do not end here. Join us tomorrow for a panel at the WTO Public Forum for a session called From Competition to Collaboration, Collective Action in Sustainability Standards. This session will start at 3 p.m. Central European time. We'll leave you now with a video celebrating the 10th anniversary of Standards Map, which we've referenced several times throughout the day. It's the 4.0 version, easier to use for even small businesses. So check out this video. It's featuring our beneficiaries and partners. And thank you for joining us again for this event. Let me congratulate the entire T4SD team of the International Trade Center for the outstanding work done over the past 10 years. For me, T4SD and its front end has always been a key reference point in this dynamic and often a bit blurry world of sustainability standards. The neutrality and transparency of T4SD has been serving as a guidepost and mirror for my own engagement in the promotion of sustainable global value chains. Sustainable map helped my company to identify sustainable standards that are applicable to my business and required by potential international buyers. Uh, it also helped to review social and environmental criteria of the standards as well as audit processes. In fair trade, we enjoyed from day one engaging with ITC on the standard map. And we valued ITC to base its standard map on ICL's credibility principles. Thus, today we appreciate the objective and unbiased analysis of any uh, voluntary standard systems of relevance. And in fair trade, uh, we have now been able to learn uh, how other voluntary standard systems are evolving and how they are innovating, we're able to identify potential partners that fit to our own values. And we believe that the standard map is actually a great tool for any stakeholder, whether private or public, to bring facts to own decisions about how to best achieve sustainability goals. The ITC standards map has been an incredibly useful source of information for my research. It is a very extensive database that doesn't only cover a large amount of different standards, but even does so to a great level of detail. La herramienta de mapas de estándares de la ITC ha permitido a Sierra y Cel Exportadora desarrollar los lineamientos básicos del cacao sostenible en Perú. Esta es una herramienta que brinda la oportunidad a pequeños productores y sus cooperativas la oportunidad de priorizar prácticas de producción sostenible, eh, autoevaluar su desempeño y hacer visibles sus esfuerzos para eh, el mercado y ante potenciales compradores.